I just bought myself a Lamborghini Murcielago with a problem that nobody's been able to fix for around seven years. And for that reason, I thought that this was a bargain, but you're about to find out why that might not necessarily be the case. So you probably saw the video where I got invited down to Everyman Racing because they had two Murcielagos which have sat there for seven years. And here we have a Lamborghini Murcielago. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe everything happens for a reason. So when I've got the opportunity to potentially buy a cheap Murcielago, which needs a little amount of work, I jumped to the opportunity. I've always dreamt of owning a Murcielago. It's just been that poster car since I could ever remember. Seeing the car in so many films and hearing that V12 roar <laughs> is something that just built up my desire more and more. I've just never been in the position to buy one. And to be honest, I'm still not now, which is why it makes this decision even more riskier. Oh, is that it? Right. We arrived at Everyman Racing. To the left hand side of the screen is Dave from DTB Motorsport and behind the camera is Hannah. Both of them have came with me to keep my head level because it's easy to get overexcited about these things and pull the trigger on the Murcielago just because I want it. What are you thinking Matt? Do you still like it? It's great. It's everything I ever dreamed of. <laughs> and out comes the engine. Now, if you did watch the previous video, you're probably really confused right now because I had the choice of two Murcielagos. And as you can see, I've gone for the one which was in the worst condition. But I'll explain later why I did this. For now, it's time to load the car up. As the Murcielago has no engine and no gearbox in it, we had to do a team effort and push it onto the trailer. And if you know these Lamborghinis, then you know they're a lot wider at the back. So we had to improvise with this by using a trolley jack just to lift up the rear of the car to get it on. Well, this is not the way I expected to buy a Murcielago, but either way, I bought one. Like that seven years worth of dust on that that's the easy part though and now with the mercy loaded onto the trailer we could take it from the unit where it sat for seven years back home okay now i know a lot of you probably think i've completely lost the plot in fact you already know i lost the plot but sometimes you buy cars with your heart and not with your head because this is most definitely the biggest project that we've ever taken on and i know i say that every single time but each one tops the last one there is a whole lot of room for a big v12 in here with the manual gearbox but unfortunately it's not here just yet but don't worry i'll explain everything in a minute but for now i think we need to get the mercer logo off the trailer and we're off where do we even start with this thing? I guess we can start off by going through the good things about this car. Don't worry, this won't take long. First off, it's a Murcielago. Which means it comes with the signature Lamborghini doors. That also means it comes with the signature bat wing intakes. I for once bought a car where all the body panels seem all intact. It comes with a V12 engine. Well, well this one doesn't, but they normally do and it's a gated manual or it was it is a 2002 model Murcielago which means it's the pre-LP Murcielago if I'm right but I thought that was a solely Lamborghini car nothing to do with Germany in it at all but it doesn't take much to start finding Audi logos on there and pretty much well that's about it But honestly, what a car this is. The feeling of just putting a door down like that, it, it's absolutely mental. As bad as a condition this car may be, and as green as the interior may be, this has been my dream since 
God knows how long and to finally get my hands on one, I, it, it was meant to be. I, I believe it was meant to be. Are you going to be the first to drive the Mercia Largo? <gasps> first of seven years. First person of seven years. To, well, you're not going far. I'm pushing. Let's I'm get it in the unit. Don't you? <laughs> then I think we need to explain to everyone the issues with this, which are fairly obvious to the point, but also why I bought this one over the other one that you might have seen, but we'll get onto that. So first off, welcome to the new unit. We've got ramps and we've got lights, and now we have a broken Merchilaco. If you remember, this was the home of the E24 BMW, but you'll find out what's going on with that in the second channel. But for now, let me show you what's wrong with this Mercer Largo and how it's ended up like it. So first off, quite obviously, nothing is there and it's covered in dust because nothing has been there for seven years. But on the good side of things, we have it here, but it's not quite complete. All of this stuff is in boxes, there's bolts everywhere. Some stuff I'm not even sure has came from this car. This is gonna be an absolute nightmare to try and work out what goes where and what parts are actually missing. And unfortunately, that's just the start of it. I mentioned that the bodywork was okay, but the thing is, this car is wrapped and it's wrapped green, but the actual color of the car is supposed to be green. So on the door shuts and inside the door, it's this really nice sort of like pearlescent green. But when you start actually peeling back the wrap, we can see, well, it's far from green. These are the original 18 inch Lamborghini Murcielago alloys that comes with the car, but I don't know what's happened to them because they are all cracked up. I think they've been rattle canned and the heat's got to them and well, they look pretty bad. And that's not all. You haven't seen the inside yet. And then moving inside the car, it absolutely stinks in here and there's a lot of missing parts. For some reason, there's no instrument cluster, which is kind of worrying. And then there's little bits missing like the interior light and a few little trims and bits and bobs all over the place. So this most definitely is the next money pit. But other than that, she seems to be a good car. But now that leaves the question of how did hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of car end up like this? So the Mercer Largo is came from Everyman Racing and Everyman Racing is a track experience company where people pay money to experience a track in a supercar like the Mercer Largo. So it was taken off the road or track because of a chain rattle when you guys may have heard it on some of your cars you own yourself. When a chain needs servicing on an engine, you may hear it on cold starts. When you start it up, you might get that little rattle kind of noise. And that's exactly what was going on with the Mercer Largo. And the chain on an engine is what keeps everything all in time. And if that becomes too loose, then it could knock the timing out, which could cause misfires and well, severe engine damage. Now parts of this I may get wrong because I don't know Mercer Largo engines, but I'm willing to learn. In fact, I'm gonna have to learn. To stop the chain going loose like this and causing that noise, you have chain tensioners and these are tightened up through here and they push these guides into the chain, making it nice and tight. This is what a tensioner looks like and this is the old one that's came off the engine. This is really worn and that's why the chain was probably making that noise. So the mechanic who no longer works at Everyman Racing attempted to fix this chain. To do this, you need to replace the chain, the tensioners, and all the chain guides. And whilst you're there, you might as well do the head gasket and a lot of seals. But when he put this engine back together and then turned it over by hand, it went tight along with some other components he took apart as well. You only have to go as far as looking at the oil pump, which I think has been rebuilt because when you turn this, it's nice and smooth, and then it hits a point and gets tight, which, yeah, definitely shouldn't be like that. So with him spending already hours rebuilding this engine, just for it to turn tight when he's built it all back together, the boss told him to just leave it there and get on with something else. He later left the company, leaving the Mercer Largo abandoned. But all of this doesn't explain why we're missing the instrument cluster 
inside the car because that's got nothing to do with taking the engine out or doing anything with the timing chain. We do have an instrument cluster here and when I bought the Mercial Argo, the deal was I would pay the asking price for the car on the basis that everything is there. And we're already finding things which are, well, not there. The chap at Everyman seems to think that the instrument cluster was removed out of the green one because either the green one or the yellow one, which we'll get onto in a minute, had an issue with them. And that issue was caused by one of the mechanics or someone that works at Everyman jumping the car with the terminals the wrong way round, therefore shorting out the car. And the only thing that he thought was broke were the instrument cluster. But whether that was on the green one or the yellow one, we don't know. And well, we're about to find out whether we get any power to this, because if it's been shorted out on this car, there could be loads of other things that are wrong with it. A second-hand instrument cluster, two and a half thousand pounds. And that's not even the correct one for the car. Right now, my dad is taping up all the electrical terminals in the engine bay to make sure nothing shorts out when we connect the battery. Then I'm inside the car connecting up the instrument cluster. Then all we've got to do to see if this works is connect a jump pack to the battery. To do this, the wheel has to come off and look at the size of that tire. It's huge. But with the wheel off, I can take the arch running out to now access the battery, which is weirdly behind it. So let's connect it up. Jumper pack. Don't know how they managed to jump this the wrong way, but we'll soon find out whether it has or not. And I've just got to find the key. Key found. Let's do it. Let's see if we've got any power whatsoever here. Oh, it smells so bad. Absolutely nothing. No lights, no buttons, no... no. Turns out there was a little thing amongst all the boxes, which was a kill switch. Right, that's on. Oh, fuel pump's on. We've got power. Okay, let me go again. Relay's doing everything, we're beeping. Oh, the radio's on, but yet no clocks. No. There's relays flipping, flying all over the shop. <laughs> Windows just about work. Yeah, we definitely have no clocks. Oh no. With the battery pack connected and everything else working in the car, the next thing to turn to was the fuses. Don't damage the interior. <laughs> <laughs> My dad removed the seats and then we could access all of them behind it. But let me just speak to you about the choice I made between the two Mercial Argos. So for those that watched the last video, you would have seen there was two Mercial Argos, one yellow one and one green one. The yellow one was inside a trailer and we couldn't really get a full look of it, but the car was complete. It had an engine in, it had a gearbox in, and it didn't look in that bad of condition. So the reason I chose the green one over the yellow one was mainly the price. But moving back on the inside, we checked all the fuses and none had blown. So next thing we're gonna do is check we got power going to the clocks. And we did. Which means the problem lies with the instrument cluster. And the only way to find this out is to start stripping it apart. But moving the conversation back to the choice of the Mercial Argos, quite obviously the yellow Mercial Argo was a fair amount more expensive than the green Mercial Argo. And the green one was still at the top of my budget. And I still definitely think I've probably paid over the odds for this car. And I'm pretty confident any normal person would definitely have not paid the price for this that I did. But the difference is between me and a normal person is that we've got 500,000 of us which can all chip away and try and help rebuild this thing. So I'm hoping all of us together as a collective can help me get this back on the road because I'm going to need that help. There's got to be something broke on here. I'm pretty sure it's going to be cheaper to repair this than to buy new clocks or even second hand clocks for two and a half thousand pounds. And what do you know? My dad has actually found something and it just goes to show how good my eyes actually are. Just here you can see a bunch of resistors which are all burnt out and those resistors to replace are probably going to be a couple of quid or so, maybe not even that. And if it is only that, we could be onto a winner. Hi. 
But that is just going to be one of many problems with this Merge Largo. As soon as the car and the engine was back into the unit, we didn't waste any time. Me and Dave from DTB Motorsport started cracking away, trying to work out why this engine wasn't turning over. Take your guesses now. So at the bottom of the engine, there's a crankshaft. It has two gears on it, one of which drives the oil pump. This isn't timed, so we don't need to worry about that. But it also has another gear on it, which drives a chain, which goes up the engine and drives two more gears, which drives the camshafts on each cylinder head. And of course, these are timed. So if one of these are a tooth out, the engine will not turn over and it won't run. We noticed on the left side of the engine, we was missing a chain guide, which is causing the chain on the left side to be really slack. So we decided to remove one of the camshafts on the left hand side so we could take the chain off. That way we could just see if we could time up the right hand side of the engine first. So we're taking the chain off this side and now we're moving on to this side because this side's got all the guides, all the tensions on and the chain on. But these notches here um, are supposed to be in line. Uh, these are the factory notches and they are slightly out of line. So Dave's attacking it loosening off the cam variator and <laughs> turning the camshaft so it's bang on and then we're going to see whether it turns over because at the minute this side locks out when we try and turn it over so. but despite us getting the right hand side of the engine properly timed up it still felt tight to turn over but then we found an issue we found one issue five six cam cap seven cam cap eight cam cap and then we go to 10. One problem found, how many others are there in this engine? <laughs> now it is so vital that the numbered cam caps go back in the correct position. That is because it's cast aluminium. So if they're in the wrong position, they won't sit flat against the head of the engine and it'd be squashing the camshaft in such a way that if the car started, it would cause some serious damage. But now we have them all in the right order and the right side of the engine timed up. Let's see if it turns over. Turning. Beautiful, man. Bloody hell. That that's turning over much better. Well, it didn't turn over before, did it? No, no. Wow. So these were incorrect, and this side was timed up wrong, but this side works. But would all of you be risking it in timing up the other side, then just rebuilding the engine from there, or do I need to strip it all apart? The head casket's already been done, but knowing that this person can't count who rebuilt it before doesn't fill me with much confidence that he rebuilt the rest of the engine bang on in line there bang on in line there and we're roughly at around tdc there which should match up there and then it's just getting that side which we're missing a chain guide for it might not be as bad as we first thought maybe with one side of the engine turning over, me and Dave decided to put both camshafts back in the left hand side and put in a makeshift chain guide to keep the chain fairly tight. After that, we timed up the left hand side of the engine with hopes it would now turn over smoothly. Down again. It's turning. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, we can work. Bloody hell. So it's all timed up and it turns over now. The gamble is now, do we put it all back together or do we just strip it all apart? Stripping it all apart to do everything is going to be more expensive, which might not be necessary. But putting it all back together is going to be a risk because we don't know if anything else is wrong. But it does turn over, so let us know in the comment section. With a big decision to make, I called in someone who might know a thing or two about Mercia Largos. So, Freddie and Scott are here to assess the damages because <laughs> the guys who know. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's an engine missing, right? <laughs> this is Freddie, or better known as Tavarish. He bought the actual Mercia Largo from the film 
Fast and Furious and rebuilt it on his YouTube channel. So he definitely knows a thing or two about them. These are gonna be your life. Uh, this, so everything on this car is put together with shims. Sometimes there's yeah. four, sometimes there's five. There's differences on either side. You're just gonna have to figure it out. Yeah. That's how they did it in Italy and it's good enough for you. So both Freddie and Scott, AKA Ratarossa, were both really helpful in telling me what most of the nuts and bolts that I had in random boxes were for. Um, if you're working on uh, this car, take these off. Right. Take these off during the, the entire, the entire yeah. Why? Because I'm just going to smack into them. Or... You are? How much <laughs> is if, that? If you, if you do this, they're broken. So, if you feel that and spin that round, um, spin it. it goes tight yeah. and then loose and then tight. Ooh, yeah, that's so, something is not quite right in there. Ooh. If you don't know Scott, aka Ratarossa, then he's a Ferrari expert. And with the Lamborghini being Italian, both of their help is priceless. I, mean, I know you, someone with an engine. Do you? Yeah, you no. have. No, but I have this engine. I don't have the 640 engine. Is it for sale? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, you know. Freddie might want to sell this engine to me. <laughs> but after about half an hour more of me trying to convince Tavares to sell his engine that he has for a Merchelago, I gave up which only really left me with one option. And that is just to strip this thing apart, take the heads off and just start from scratch. Which is exactly what we're about to do. So, well, let's get going. Have I ever stripped apart an engine before? No, but am I willing to learn? Well, I'm gonna have to be because this is a V12 Merchelago engine and every part to it is vital. And that's why I've got my dad here helping me strip it apart so we can find out what else is wrong with this thing. If there is anything else wrong with it. My dad has experience in building engines, not quite Merchelago ones, so he's definitely going to be a big help with this build. You can see Hannah at the back doing an equally as important job by labelling up all the parts that we take off so we know exactly where everything goes back together. That's if they're put right in the first place. And I'm now about to take off the final camshaft so we can access the bolts for the head, which are in a really difficult place to get to. And I remember Scott saying something about these. If it's anything it's like Ferrari, there's a special angled toe. And he wasn't wrong. We managed to get hold of a workshop manual. And of course, Lamborghini being Lamborghini have made a special tool to get to those head bolts. Problem is, that tool is $554. And then we realised we didn't need it at all. I tell you what, it is a good job we're doing this because they're loose. The head bolts are right in there. Me and my dad were just trying to figure out how we were going to get to them because we thought there was going to be a hole here. There's no hole in here or anywhere to get to them. But if you could just see, they're literally finger tight. <laughs> the head bolts are finger tight. So what on earth? Why? What? <laughs> Why are they finger tight? I don't know, but it's definitely a good job we didn't bolt this all back together and put it in because, yeah. I actually bought this special... Well, these crow foot um, parts to get in there, which would go down, you put an extension on them, and these would get the head bolts off. But we probably aren't gonna need them now because we could probably do them out without using this because they're all, they're all finger tight. Yeah, well, we're about to find out why that's, why they are finger tight because it's probably gonna be hiding something underneath. So on we go with undoing the finger tight head bolts which is bizarre to say the least. So it's definitely a good job we didn't start this thing up like that. With all the bolts undone, it's time to lift the heads off the block of the engine. Which revealed more strange things about this thing. Okay, update. Both of the heads are off. They've definitely had new head gasket um, here. So that's, that's kind of a positive. And then we found something weird with the pistons. So here we have all of the pistons. On this side, he has marked them out. Whoever's took this apart, you can see some lines in there for one, two, three, four, five, six, and then five, four, three, two, one, all the way down there. But what we have noticed is at the top of the sleeves here, you can see a little sort of oil mark there and that is the same on every 
sleeve apart from this one and this piston down there is really clean so we think that one has been out this one has been out and potentially been re-ringed right we're gonna flip the engine up and then have a look from the underneath and see if anything else becomes obvious of why this was broke or not put back together properly now we are on the home straight of fully stripping this engine apart and getting literally to the bottom of it. All I'm doing now is taking the crank casing off. Then we can access the crankshaft, which will allow us to undo the bottom of the comrods to pull the pistons out. And again, it wasn't long until we found something else which was a bit bizarre. The caps which house the big end bearings in the bottom of the comrods are all matched up to the top of the comrods. And this is fairly obvious because they're numbered. The thing is, when we took the piston out, we could see the numbers were all jumbled up. 2516 matched up to 2399. It's safe to say the person who built this engine could not count. There's good news and bad news. The good news is that this engine has had a rebuild and everything in here is pretty new. So this Comrod looks like it's upgraded, um, it's new. We've got new big end bearings, new bolts, all new bearings in the bottom here as well, new thrust washers. The problem is it's been put back together incorrectly, which has caused a little bit of damage. Here were piston rings. Uh, these piston rings obviously go round the top of the piston. All of these are new, but these ones are snapped and these ones look like they've been snapped when he's knocked them into the engine and you would have never have known that until you started the engine. And of course, the engine would have failed anyway because all of these Comrod caps were all incorrect, which would mean that this circle here was not a full circle, causing loads of friction. And you can even see, I don't know if you can see on that bearing there, the wear already can you see that and that's just from turning it over by hand so this engine if it was started up with loose head bolts cam caps the wrong way and conrod caps the wrong way round, would have had a catastrophic failure costing well let me show you how much it would have cost 28,615 pound plus postage and that engine is for an lp640 which is the newer mercer logo which wouldn't work in this mercer logo because this one is the earlier model but that's not the only thing we notice when taking apart the engine we notice this so this is the gudgeon pin and this goes through the top of the conrod and holds the piston to the conrod and we think this has got wear on it and if that goes back in, it may cause a sort of knock on the engine. You may hear it slightly knocking, so it's probably worth us replacing that. But for this piece of metal from Lamborghini, you won't believe the price. It is £235.41p, and that's for one. We need 12 of them. But a gudgeon pin doesn't look like the most technical thing to engineer. So maybe one of you guys may be able to help us out with that. But for now, I wanted to take a look at the oil pump and find out why it was spinning tight sometimes and then loose the others. And I think I found the issue. So after all that, it could have literally just been carelessness. There was a tiny bit of debris or bit of muck in between these two gears and i've put it all together now i'm not bolted it all back up back up yet because it needs sealer in there but it spins nice and smooth whoa nice and smooth now so that oil pump definitely could be saved but now the real question lies and i know a lot of you want to know how much i paid for this broken Mercialago. And I know I've overpaid. But it made me feel a little bit better when I spoke to Tavares that a car like this in the States would sell for around $400,000. But the UK market hasn't quite got to that point just yet, which is why it's gonna make a lot of you guys cringe when I tell you that I bought this Mercialago for 100 
thousand pounds. I take risks. It's my dream car. Come on. And just to add to that, I actually tried to contact the guy who rebuilt this engine at Everyman. Turns out he's in prison for armed robbery. I'm surprised you could get them so quick. Yeah, like all the parts. Oh, so if you can get quite quickly, they've got it to start then. Yeah. It's quick, it's quick. Not a bit, is it not came from Italy then? The, oh, yeah. so, oh, it has. So. Yeah. Oh, so that it's, quick? It's yeah. So quick. Something tells me, me and Evan from Lamborghini are going to be best of friends. Because we're going to be seeing each other quite a lot. But the only thing we're getting for free here are the chocolates on the reception desk. And as we're left with the parts, what are the chances of seeing another Merchelago there? The guys let me have a look around it to see what one in good condition looks like. Before heading back to the unit to work on mine. Before we get on to what I bought and how much, do you remember this? This was the circuit board removed from the back of my instrument cluster, which didn't work due to apparently somebody jump starting the car with the battery terminals the wrong way around. When we took it apart, we found a bunch of resistors which looked burnt out. Turns out Liam's mom works with a lot of circuit boards, so she found the correct resistors to go in those gaps and soldered in some new ones. Now we've just got to see whether it works. So if this works, essentially, Liam's mum has fixed two and a half thousand pounds worth of instrument cluster you can't even buy for free. She didn't charge us, so we're gonna have to do a massive shout out for Liam's mum. If it doesn't, thanks Liam's mum anyway. We're looking for some sign of life. Yep. Yeah. Oh, the immobilizer works. Because the new battery. <laughs> the, new, the new immobilizer works. Here we go. Oh no. Oh, no, it doesn't look good. <laughs> no. There must be some, there needs to be something else which needs to be tested on this board, I think. I've not got one single light on. Well, it was worth a try. It's not the start we was hoping for, but the news doesn't end there. Whilst my dad was honing the cylinders out, he found something else which could have caused catastrophic engine failure. We're at the bottom of the engine right now, and these are oil galleries. Uh, so these send oil up to the top of the engine, and my dad actually just removed one of these, and he's told me to remove this and have a look what's inside. And bearing in mind that the oil goes directly through that little hole, and look, what is actually in that hole. <laughs> I think that is sealant or sealer. It's turning out it was a really good job for us to check everything on this engine. So another thing my dad wanted to check were the valves. Here are the collets that hold the valve springs in place and with the springs removed, which look new, we could pull the valve out. And my dad thinks that these have already been ground out, meaning the valves sit nice and flush against the head of the engine and won't cause any leaks. It also looks like the head of the engine has been skimmed as well. And what's looking even more positive, if we look at the valve seals, they look brand new, which is good. So despite the many negatives with the Mercer Largo, there is actually some positives. And one positive is that we could actually begin to start rebuilding the engine on this thing. Right here are some vital parts of the engine that it just wouldn't work without. All of these parts in here are little tiny things like chain guides and journals and that sort of stuff. But the one thing that did shock us is one piston ring was 218 pounds. But luckily, we only needed two because it looks like he's already replaced the others, but those two snapped off when he replaced them in. So all of these should be okay to go back in when we'll get onto the Gudgeon pin situation later. Now this is the point where things are gonna get a little technical, but I'm gonna try my best to explain it because I'm still learning as well. So now that the valves have been ground in on this side, they're gonna sit prouder on this side. So they're gonna sit higher up, which means when the camshaft is on the top, the lobes are gonna be way closer to the valves there and they should be a certain 
millimeter gap or if you're my dad thou gap because he measures in inches and is making it confusing <laughs> or to explain it better here's the camshaft and below is the valve lifter we're measuring the gap in between the two with a feeler gauge so the gap on the intake side should be 0 0.35 millimeters on the exhaust side it should be 0 0.5 millimeters and the only way to adjust this gap is using these shims here which come in different sizes these sit on top of the valve lifters just like this so we've got random shims going in place at the minute because we have no idea whether it's going to work or not but then we can make a calculation from that random shim whether we need a smaller shim or a bigger shim to make the clearance 0.5 0 millimeters on the exhaust side. <laughs> on each head of the engine, there is two camshafts. One camshaft opens and closes the inlet valves, and the other camshaft opens and closes the exhaust valves. There's two inlet valves for every cylinder, and two exhaust valves for every cylinder. Hopefully you're still with me. At the moment, we're just working on the exhaust cam, and we put the cam caps this time in the right order and torques them all down. To measure the gap in between the cam and the lifter, the cam lobes have to be pointing upwards and then my dad can wedge the feeler gauge in between the two. And whilst my dad is doing this, I begin to write down the calculation board. Here's a chart for the exhaust side. So we have 12 gaps to measure here. The top half of the graph is where I'm going to be writing the gap that it is at the moment. And the bottom half is going to be the size of the shim that's in there at the moment as well. So I'm going backwards and forwards writing all the measurements down until it's starting to look like a mad scientist board. Welcome to Matt Armstrong's math lesson. So as you can see, the desired figure we need to get is 0 0.5 millimeters. That's the gap between the cam and the valve. At the minute, these are the gaps we have at the moment. As you can see, neither of which are 0 0.5 millimeters. These are the shims that are in there at the minute we need to get the correction in there to make this gap equal this. Hopefully that makes sense. And if we don't get these gaps right, it can cause the engine to misfire, it can run rough, it can sound rough, and it just won't be right. So it's pretty vital. Right here, I'm trying to write down a formula which makes it simple for me and explain it to you guys as well. But even I ended up getting this wrong and messing it up and Hannah had to rub it out and redo it so many times over. So if you're still with us, I have done the calculations. At the bottom, these are the shims we need to get the gap between the cam and the valve to 0.5 mil. This is where the issue concurs because at the minute we're just using the shims that were already in the engine. So my dad is working out what shims we've got and putting them in the correct places. But it looks as if we may need to order some and this is where Lamborghini is very very cheeky it looks as if we have these shims here the ones with the ticks on the rest of the shims that we need a 375 shim 375 shim 380 375 385 and 375 it's safe to say a 3.75 and a 3.8 mil shim is a fairly common shim that we need and guess which one are the most expensive shims to order from lamborghini you guessed it a 3.75 which is 31 pound 34p plus that and a 3.80 which is again 31 pound and 34p but if i wanted to order a 3.25 shim it would only cost me six pound 31 and it's less of a shim than that one is and isn't it just a coincidence that this has to be done every 24,000 miles on this and the shims which you most likely need are more expensive so shout out to lamborghini oh, you just the, it is it is what it is isn't it after that my dad and i started doing the inlet side which is a completely different measurement of 0 0.35 mil but that's when something came up so we've got to do a massive shout out to scott because we have just hacked the system scott ratarossa has just found us that the valve shims are the same in these than they are in some Ferraris. And what do you know, Ferrari is actually cheaper than Lamborghini. We found the exact same valve, valve shims here for £5.95p. In your face, Lamborghini. <laughs> Another vital saving when rebuilding this engine. And look at that, Ferrari charged the same price no matter what shim. 
moving from the head of the engine now to the bottom of the engine. Here's a cylinder sleeve which we put new seal on from Lamborghini and we can start knocking that into the bottom of the engine with our special Lamborghini tools of course. <laughs> and then I can carry on building the pistons up onto the conrods which are held together with a gudgeon pin, which if you remember in the last video we thought had wear on it. There's 12 pistons, which means there's 12 gudgeon pins. And from Lamborghini, they're £250 each. But we managed to outsource them from another company. Only issue was they were one mil wider than what we needed. So they had to be machined down. So unfortunately, we can't name this company who sorted us out with the pins because they're not guaranteeing them because they are technically modified. We've found something else now. Um, I wish we'd got this on camera when we find it, but my dad was just checking that. So, right, okay, how are we going to explain this? The uh, piston rings are meant to go in a certain order, and you can see on the bottom oil ring, it sort of chamfers off at the bottom, um, and then also it looks like that at the top. Now, this one, that piston ring at the bottom does not chamfer the way that that does meaning that he's put the pistons in the wrong way round so we changed the piston rings but put them in the wrong way round <laughs> so it's a good job we checked this as well would you believe it so we've got to check all the piston rings now what, what my dad is doing at the moment that they are the right way round and then we can put the piston rings in before cleaning the pistons in and putting them back where this should go, but it's a good job we're checking everything on this. It was on that way. And the over. best thing about it, where is it, where does it say? It says top on it, so not only couldn't he count, he couldn't read either. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I hope he's not watching these videos. <laughs> Hey, no one's perfect, but at least when rebuilding an engine, you've got to make sure you do the little things right. So now me and my dad are checking every single piston ring before putting on the two new ones onto the piston which had two snap piston rings. Once we were confident that that was right, we can then begin to knock in the pistons into the cylinders. You use a special tool to do this to squash the piston rings into the piston and then carefully knock it down into the cylinder. And we're being extra careful because remember, each piston ring is around £218 each. And there's three on each piston. The red stuff you can see around the piston is assembly lube and it works as a sort of lubricant to push everything in. And before you know it, 12 pistons are in the bottom of the block and we can turn this thing over ready to put the crankshaft on. So we've now got the bottom end of the engine upside down with all the pistons in ready for the crankshaft to go on. And they get it, maybe we're not doing things on how somebody else would do it or how the professionals would do it. Neither one of us have rebuilt a Mercer Largo engine ever before. And yes, we could just drop the engine off at somebody who has rebuilt a million and one of them and be 100% certain that this thing is gonna start up at the end. But where would the fun in that be? Although it doesn't look like much, this is my dream car and it would mean so much more to me if we can turn the key for the first time to hear the V12 roar, knowing that all of us rebuilt this ourselves. I don't know about you, but I am so curious to find out what is underneath this wrap and why this part is grey. Well, the story just gets better and better. Oh, it's looking green, it's, <laughs> it's looking green. Oh, it actually looks all right. I wonder why they put that on there. Why would they put that on? There's gotta be something. It's not but I suppose like back in the day, you know, for like 2008, 2009, I remember my mate's dad, he had a, a Supra and that. What, uh, and this was cool? It had a carbon wrap on the bonnet, yeah. People used to do that. <laughs> people still do that, I think. <laughs> no, Is that, it sanded? That's, that's, it's either sanded or it's vinyl. Nah, it's sanded. It is sanded. There's definitely something oh, going on there. Oh, there's some repair under this. Yeah, isn't there? definitely. Okay. Let's get it inside and we'll get this thing absolutely cooking. Then we can move on to probably more surprises and getting this bottom end built up. Now's the time to place your bets on what you think is underneath that wrap. Well, here it goes. Let's take the wrap off the whole thing. We started off with the carbon fibre wrap on the bonnet and it looks as if a lot of the car has been wet sanded, which 
Wasn't too bad, I guess that means we could just repaint it. But then we got to the passenger side. Oh, it actually looks all right. How was I wrong? This car was far from all right. I have no idea what exactly has happened to it underneath this wrap, but it certainly isn't how it should be. And it just got better. The gift that just keeps on giving. I can't even be shocked anymore. I should just <laughs> expect it from this car. But I'm beginning to think 100 grand was a little too steep for this car. What on earth has happened to this car? I, I, I just can't, I just feel sorry for it at this point. The driver's side is a little better, but it's still nowhere near what it should be. Well, I can see the car used to be green, but it looks like the whole thing has been wet sanded, like it's almost been prepped for paint. And then it comes to all these little bits like here, which at first I thought was filler and then primer, but it looks like it's just been wet sanded down. All of these panels are fiberglass, remember, so they're going to look a little bit different when you sand them down compared to metal. The only explanation I could think to all these weird marks and everything is that the car was probably wrapped before, they peeled it off and it peeled a lot of lacquer off, which is why they've had to sand down loads of random parts of the car, but then they've still wet sanded the whole the whole car as well. <laughs> I just don't know. On the passenger side though, there's no denying that there's been some sort of repair to this side, whether it's gone into a wall or another car's hit it. But this, I don't know how much of this is going to be filler. I guess we'll find out when we probably take a door card off and we can see whether the door's all caved in. I don't know, but it sounds normal, but you can see there's definitely been a masking line along the top of the door. So the Mercia Largo just gets better and better. And in perfect timing, my dad just turned up. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he spoke the truth. Whilst I was doing this, I received a Facebook message from somebody who used to work at Everyman Racing. And he seems to think if it's the same car he's thinking of, then somebody had to adjust the gear linkage on it years ago. And instead of dropping the gearbox down to try and do it, they just cut a hole in the transmission tunnel. <laughs> it just gets better. But I have actually had a look. I can't see anything just yet, but... We'll investigate that later. For now, we need to get back onto the engine. We'll, uh, we'll come back to this. So let's pick up where we left off from. On the second head of the engine, we were adjusting the gaps between the camshaft lobes and the valves by putting in these shims here, which are all different sizes. You put the camshaft in, torque it all down, and then measure the gap between the two with a feeler gauge. We had to calculate what size shim we needed based on the gap that was already there. And turns out we needed to order some more shims from Lamborghini. If it was going to order one of these, it was £30.95p each, plus that, we found them from Ferrari at £5.95p each. Now we've just got to see whether they actually work. And so far, so good. The Ferrari shims seem to sit in place as good as the Lamborghini ones. All we've got to do now is pop the camshafts in, put the cam caps back in the correct order as they wasn't before, and then measure the gap and make sure it's perfect. We are looking all good on both heads of the engine now, so we can take this off. But now we're back on to the bottom end of the engine where the crankshaft is just about ready to go in until we found something else. As you know by now, the chap who rebuilt this engine before replaced a lot of the stuff you would normally replace when rebuilding an engine, like these big end bearings in the bottom of the comrades. But there is something that he didn't replace. And that was these main shell bearings here, which the crankshaft sits on. You can see they've got a little oil stain in the middle and they just look a little worn compared to the rest of the shell bearings that he's put in. Now, the only reason we could think of why he's not replaced these is because each of them are 141 pound and 96 P and there's five on the bottom and there's five on the top. Unfortunately, we can't find these anywhere. They're specially made for this Mercer Largo engine and I think they're the same in the Diablo engine. So, well, we had to buy them. The only good part about this is that, well, they're easy to install. We just got to remove the old shells, clean up the surface and then put the new shells in with some assembly lube. And we could just about lift the crankshaft in place. 
Now there's also a measurement that we need to check between the big end bearing and the crankshaft, but this is way too small for a feeler gauge. So we put that little red strip in called a plasti gauge, taught the comrod caps up to spec, which will then squash the plasti gauge. And the measurement we're looking for is anywhere between 0.024 mil and 0.067 mil. Then what we've got to do is loosen the conrod caps off and we can see where the plastic gauge has been squashed. And the width of this will tell us how big or small the gap is between the bearings. And it's looking like the gap is 0 0.050, which is nicely between 0 0.024 and 0 0.067. So we know everything is all good with the crankshaft and the big end bearings. Once we've checked the gaps on all of them, we can begin to fit the conrod caps connecting the comrods to the crankshaft and as we know this is not coming off now we can add loctite to the conrod cap bolts as well as it mentions in the manual we can then lift the rest of the crank housing onto the bottom end of the engine but before we do this we have to make sure the mating surface is nice and clean and in the manual it states we should be using loctite 518 on the mating surface and this loctite 574 now identifies as 518 <laughs> But no, in all seriousness, my dad says that he's used this Loctite before and he's had no issues with it at all. It is a really thin Loctite. It's not a sealant. This Loctite is here just to fill any small imperfections between the mating point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Here we go, I can almost smell the Italian emissions. This thing is starting to come together now. Next step is to torque up all the crankshaft housing bolts and you have to do this in a certain order to make sure you don't damage the housing. Also, whilst we're there, this drive shaft at the bottom of the engine, which connects to the rear diff and then also the prop shaft which runs to the gearbox at the front of the engine, felt a little rough and there's only two bearings which need replacing and they were about £11 each from Lamborghini. So to remove this drive shaft, we just had to take out two circlips and we could knock the shaft out of the housing. We popped the new bearings in the housing and we used the old bearings to knock them into place. Of course, with some assembly lube. I imagine if we didn't do this, there would be a lot of drivetrain noise when driving this car. And the only noise I want to be hearing from this car is that V12 exhaust. Okay, we're moving forward, which is what we wanted. We've got one complete bottom end of the engine all built up and a nice smooth spinning drive shaft. But guess what? we've found even more things. <laughs> right here is the oil pump for the engine. The oil pump is probably one of the most vital parts of it. If this fails, the whole engine fails. So we cannot risk anything on this. The chap who rebuilt the engine also rebuilt the oil pump. And uh, well, to spin the gears, you need these wood roof keys on there. So these actually remove there. So there's two recesses there where this thing would go in place. Now in that one, was that one and in this one well there was one that didn't fit he's just put that in there and we think he's probably lost the proper woodruff key and we've just found out where this one has came from which doesn't fill us with much confidence <laughs> Sort of a key. Don't worry, don't worry. I've got one over here. Here you go, mate. Just use this one. Oh, perfect. It's a bit, it's a bit small, isn't it? Nah, don't worry. It's, it's only an oil pump. <laughs> That's exactly what we thought has possibly happened here. The woodruff key in the crankshaft is missing and we finally found it <laughs> and it was inside the oil pump. So we don't know how well this is put together. We think there's possibly a circuit that should be where this bearing is and we're just not going to trust it really. We, we can't. So we think it's best in this situation just to play it safe and order a brand new one. Being that these are a common problem to fail on the Mercial Argo anyway, 
We don't want that failing on us, being that we've rebuilt the full engine. It would help if we had an exploded diagram of the oil pump, but they just don't come about. And for peace of mind, it's going to cost me £2,314.45p plus VAT. But it's not a risk I'm willing to take, so I'm going to buy a new oil pump. But moving back to the car, I'm desperate to find out whether the chap on Facebook was right about that hole in the transmission tunnel. Right. We're going to find out whether this has got a hole. I mean, anything is possible. Regardless of the outcome, we need to stay positive. There's no point getting down about anything rebuilding this car because it's only going to produce negative outcomes. What are we, what are we saying? Hole or no hole? Do you know with the way this car's looking, mm -hmm. I'd say they've definitely got a hole. And that's what I've learnt with a lot of the builds I've done before. There's no way I thought when I was doing the Aston Martin dashboard it was going to go back in. But I stayed positive, worked through it and somehow managed to do it. And I'm hoping we get the same outcome with this car. And now we're about to find out mm, possibly the worst. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out, the guy on Facebook, he, he was right. Take a look at this. It just gets better. <laughs> look, there's literally, you can see where they've cut out. Oh, look, there's even holes here. What are they for? Oh my God. So they've literally cut out a square I mean, it, I mean, they've put it back together and they've siliconed it back together. Look at these brackets. Oh my God. So they've cut out a square for what it looks like to get to some kind of gear linkage. I think the gear linkage is on top of the gearbox. Actually, you can see here where the gear linkage runs. You can see like the bulge. So they must run down there and then they've adjusted the gear linkage. But instead of lowering down the gearbox to do it, they've decided to cut a hole. And we can't even blame the guy who built the engine because... This is a different guy. <laughs> Just realised as well, the whole body is like carbon fibre, isn't it? It's a, or like f kind of fiberglass. So that's why you you can't weld it shut. They've literally just chopped a frame out. Is that like structural? Surely that's got to be structural. And I mean, these brackets, they are definitely like Lamborghini. I mean, I can't see it having any sort of negative effect in a, effect in a crash, but... I mean, this whole thing is built as one and you can't just buy a section of the monocoque now, can you? I mean, well well done, guys. <laughs> we're intrigued to find out what they were trying to get at with the gear linkage. We've found it. So, you sit here, you're in the driver's seat, you're in your gated manual mercy logo. Boom, gear one, gear two, gear three. Oh, something's happened and something needs adjusting. This thing needs adjusting, which has got couple of bolts here, I don't know, some kind of gear linkage. So, what do you do, instead of lower the gearbox down to get to it, you cut a hole in the body of the car <laughs> to get to that. <laughs> Thanks guys. Surely that is it now. There's, there's gonna be no more surprises. We've, we've surely covered everything. I can't, uh, it can't get worse from here, surely. I'm back again to pick up some more parts. <laughs> you all right? We've got an email to do. Yeah, we'll do. Wicked, catch in a bit. We have a lot more parts here, but one thing that we don't have is the oil pump because it was really expensive and it's not something that people order every day. So we'll get onto what's in this box later and the rest of the engine build, but for now, we've got some unfinished business with the interior. Yesterday, I took the Mercia Lago out for its first clean in seven years. And it's looking a little bit better now, but there's still a long way to go, especially with the interior. There's a lot of green in there and it stinks. Let's do it. It might not come as a surprise to you that we're gonna be getting rid of a lot of the green in this interior and hopefully rid of a lot of dirt and the smell. The more I work on this car, the more I realise it's almost like a glorified kit car. Everything comes apart so easily. And underneath, well, there's pretty much nothing. 
but that doesn't change the fact that this is my dream car and always has been and I cannot wait for the day we turn the key on it. Now remember, we still don't have a working instrument cluster. The place that bought it off told us that someone jumped the battery the wrong way around, which caused the instrument cluster just not to work afterwards. When we took it apart, we found that there was loads of resistors which had burnt out. We got the resistors changed, but still no luck. No! There must be some, there needs to be something else which needs to be tested on this board, I think. But then I found something. Right, we've just found something. And if this is it, then, well, let me explain, okay. Right, I'm just about to take this lower part of the dash off. We'll get onto the, the big hole cut in the transmission tunnel in a minute. But I just took this off and found another fuse box in here. And on the back, it's got a diagram. And would you look at that? It's got the instrument cluster there, fuse number 15. If that is blown, you need and to, it actually works. You need to check it. I know, check it now, I know, go on, go on, do it. It's even got a little puller in there. It? Which one is it? That's the horn at the bottom. It doesn't look like it's ever been touched. Oh my God, do you know if this is it, I'm gonna be absolutely buzzing because then <laughs> it, I, I feel like it could... Oh, it would blow it, blown. Well. it would. It would have blown it, would have it, blown it? it yeah, please surely. Please be blown, please be blown, please be blown. To look brand new. It's not blown. The story continues with the instrument cluster, but now my attention is drawn to this. So here we can see the complete hole that was cut to access the gear linkage on the gearbox. And it looks as if they went to cut a hole down here to start with and then maybe bottled it and then instead did one there. <laughs> and a lot of you guys mentioned in the last video that Hoovies from Hoovies Garage did the same thing to his Mercia Largo to access the gear linkage to avoid taking the whole engine and transmission out to get to it. Whether that makes it okay or not, I'll let you guys decide that. For now, I've got the rest of the interior to strip out and I'm gonna be taking out pretty much everything apart from the black leather parts. This has also given me a chance to give everything a bit of a clean and a wipe down. Fresh as well with that leather cleaning, isn't it? Yeah. That is a hell of a lot of green leather. Well, stuff that was green leather, that is absolutely disgusting. And just check out the interior. There's really not much to it with these Marshall Argos. There's, there's not even that much wiring under it. Normally you'd see a lot of sound deadening underneath carpets, and well, there's absolutely none. It's there's nothing to this car. It really is difficult to work out why these Lamborghinis are so expensive, especially when you see things like this. Check out this indicator here. If I put a bit of wrap over this, you can see almost as clear as day, the Ford logo on there. Now you're not gonna believe this. If I wanted to buy one of those indicators from Lamborghini, it would cost me 181 pound and 28 P each. Those indicators are actually off a Mark 1 Ford Focus and on eBay they are £6.90 for a pair. So there is so many different ways we can save money when rebuilding this thing. Unfortunately, that's not the case for the engine. There's so many vital components we need to keep this running in top tip shape just like your body. Which is why I've been drinking Waifu, today's sponsor of the video. So this is the bottom of the engine and the next thing to go on the bottom is the sump. But in between the sump and the crankcase is a gasket, but check this out. Lamborghini for the sump gasket won 130 pound and 13 pence. And that's just for a paper gasket. Now a healthy alternative to that, gasket paper for 14 pound. 99p, we could get a full roll of gasket paper. And out of that gasket paper, we have created 130 pounds worth of sump gasket. 14 pound 99 for a nice healthy alternative to 130 pounds worth of sump gasket. That's amazing. As good as the self-made gasket may be, we can't install it just yet. But I'll explain why after we've done a bit more to the engine. First job is to flip it the right way up. Then we can apply some assembly paste to these parts which house the gears for some of the timing chain. Now my dad isn't here today, so it looks like I'm on my own. So I'm hoping that this goes right. Luckily the three gears that we've got on here at the minute are not timed. 
So it doesn't matter where the chain sits on these, it's not going to affect the timing of the engine. The two gears on top are held in by a little plate and then a circlip. And then there's all the chain guides to go on. In the manual, there's actually no torque figures for any of these. It literally just says fit them. So that's exactly what I'm doing. Now this is the part that keeps the chain tight, as Lamborghini call it, a chain tightener. This thing is hydraulic and it works with the oil pressure. And this piston pushes out against the chain guide, keeping this chain nice and tight so it doesn't rattle when the car's running. And as it mentions in the manual, I've just got to fit it about here. So it's all looking good so far without my dad. Next up is the upper chain guides, which are gonna guide the chains on the head of the engine. And then once they're in, there's another chain on the bottom, which should go to the oil pump which we'll get onto. And now you can see me putting on the chain for the left side of the head, and then of course the right side of the head. These ones are timed, so we need to be careful we put these on right. And now I'm about to give you some bad news, because, well, this is literally it. We can't go any further than this, thanks to the part that's over there on the bench. So this is the oil pump, and the person who tried to rebuild the engine also tried to rebuild the oil pump, and it went about as equally as well, if that makes sense. So when we stripped this thing apart because it was stiff, there was a key in there, and there was actually one missing out of there. He put a smaller one in, and that didn't fill us with much confidence with the rest of the build that he's done. The thing is, when I spoke to Lamborghini, they don't have, or they won't give us, an exploded diagram of an oil pump so we know what parts go where. They just sell it as a complete unit. There's part of it just gone. I had to buy it, I'm not risking it, because if we do risk it and the oil pump goes, it's one of the most vital parts of the engine. A lot of you said I could get one of these, key, one of these keys made, and that is a possibility, but as I said, we're not sure if everything else is okay. So brace yourselves. A new oil pump cost me £2,493.75p plus that, and it gets worse. It's not going to be here until the 13th of December 2022. Now on a normal engine, you might be able to assemble the rest of it without an oil pump, but on the Mercialago one, you need the oil pump to carry on from this point, and let me explain why. So if I wanted to put the cylinder heads on top of the crankcase in here and here, first off, I need a head gasket, and the head gasket sits here, all good. But there's one thing missing, and that's this casing right here, and the head gasket and the head actually sit on this casing, and I'll demonstrate that now. Now the casing is fitted, you can see the head gasket is sitting on top of the casing, but, as a coincidence to that, we can no longer get to the oil pump. It's completely blocked off, which means in order for us to fit the oil pump, this casing can't be on, which in turn means we can't fit the heads because the casing needs to come off to fit the new oil pump. And once the oil pump's on, like this, we can then put the casing on and then rest the two cylinder heads on top of the casing. Hopefully, that explains it. But that's not going to stop me to continue work on the body of the car. And I kind of wish I'd have just stopped there. Now I'm removing both front arch linings so I can access the front bumper. Once I've got these off, I can open the bonnet to get to the rest of the bolts for the bumper and then remove it away from the car. And we'll get back onto this later. For now, my attention is drawn to the headlights. In one of them, a spider is trapped and both of the lenses look really dull and inside where it's supposed to be black seems to be sun dyed white. So we're gonna sort this. As I've done with so many cars, we're gonna split the headlight lens to access the center of the headlight. Once we've got it open, we can polish the headlight lens and paint the inside of the headlights. I use the same technique as every time before I've done this job, loads of heat and then break the seal. Only thing is, we didn't realize the Mercialago headlights have glass lenses. Well, at least we can paint it now. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a positive, you can get the spider out now. Let's see how much the lens is. Oh no, what if you can't buy a lens? Complete unit for 23. Liam's just finding how much a headlight's got. <laughs> 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 is it bad? Is it bad? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> oh <laughs> my god! <laughs> no way! Is it, it, let me see. Is it, it bad? Let me see. Let me see. I'll let Chris see the reaction. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna be happy. Let's put that way. Right? Okay, let me see. Let Forget me. the engine. You've made a big Let's mistake. See. Let's see. Oh! <laughs> Ten thousand pounds. <laughs> and we was just 10, attacking it. Ten thousand pounds. We was just attacking it with a screwdriver. <laughs> it's ten grand for a whole headlight assembler. Hopefully, we don't have to buy a full headlight assembler, and we can just get the lens. But if we can't, we're ten grand down. <laughs> This is actually a glass lens, and that's why it's cracked, because there's no flex in it at all. Are these the same as an LP640? Yes, they are the same as an LP640. I just found your pair of lenses for £300 on eBay. Serious there? Oh, I'm not sorry. £300? £299. And that's why Liam got an Audi S3. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Liam, we've saved the day. We can just smash these off. Wow, okay. Let's just double check. <laughs> Let's double check and then we'll be back. Sometimes it's better to just leave the car as it is. I mean, that wasn't even damaged. I was trying to improve it. I made it worse and it's cost me more money. It's just what happens. It's going to happen. We're playing with fire effectively with the Mercia Largo, but this is a savior for 300 pounds for new lenses. Yeah. It means we could be a little bit rough with the other one now. And can I just say, if we watched a YouTube video on how to do it first, because we would have known they were glass, and not yeah. to stab them with screwdrivers. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but we just do it with confidence, you know, like... I know, yeah, we've done um, so many times. I've done yeah. Lupo headlights. They don't, they don't even feel like glass either. No. They literally feel like Who would have thought there's glass? Who would have thought? After everything on this car is fibreglass, who would have fibre... Who would have glass? I knew want to do weight saving. And right, so... Lenses. I'm buying that. £300. After all of that, I didn't even get a chance to tell you what I've taken off. The front bumper, but we'll get to it after this disaster. Back again for <laughs> the weekly shop. <laughs> I really am becoming a regular here, but seeing all the Lamborghinis in the showroom only gives me more motivation to get my Mercialago back on the road. After all, this car is my dream car. I've always wanted one, and I was always told never to give up on your dreams. Now we've already learnt so much about the Mercia Largo and it's like we've only just got started on it. Unfortunately, in the last video we learnt when trying to split the headlight lenses that they use glass instead of plastic. And the best part about that is you can't buy the glass lens separately. You need to buy a full headlight for over £10,000 from Lamborghini. And that's the same reason why you see an absolutely immaculate Mercia Largo but it still has the foggy lenses in it because nobody dares split them. But I have a solution for these headlight lenses and it only costs £300. But I've been offered £1,800 for this headlight lens if we can get it off without breaking it. So I'm going to be giving Chris it, and if you can get it off, 400 quid is yours. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> we'll check back with Chris throughout the video, but for now, I need to get the Mercia Largo in the ramp because we've got more work to do on the bumpers. In the last video, I removed the front bumper. And in this video, I'm going to remove the rear bumper. After I removed the rear wheels, it revealed a two-shock system on the suspension. And it looks like Ibac actually make the springs for this. And more than likely, it's going to be Bill Stein who make the shock absorbers. Both of these companies are local to me, so it's looking good for when we come to rebuild the suspension up. But as I started removing the grills of the rear bumper, I found something. So here's another worry that... I was a bit worried about. <laughs> when I saw this wire when I was getting this car, I thought it was going to be for this reason. And now I think it is. So there's a wire here, um, which we thought at first it might have been going to like a rear camera for when they're on the track days. But as we suspected, this wire looks like it goes into the radiator fan and then it grounds off. There it goes, it grounds off down there. This is definitely not Lamborghini, which, well, this is a worry because, one, either because they've wired the fan on and they got a switch in the car so they could keep the car cool because it's probably on all day for the track days, which is a, which is a possibility, or two, you know how the ECU, well, you know how the battery was jumped the wrong way round and it's fried the clocks? it possibly could have fried part of the ECU, which tells 
the fan went to come on like a temperature sensor so they now have to have a permanent switch in the car to keep the fan on nice is there another wire going to that one there's another fan i can't see what's going on with the wire. well we'll find well, out whether this one, this one goes to a plug that one goes to an actual plug yeah okay so for some reason this one's been rewired it could have had an accident it could have had an accident Just ripped the wire wires and they could have refixed it or the ECU's fried and they've done this so they can actually have the fan switch in the car, which I don't even know where the switch is. I've not seen a switch. And the problem just gets even more strange. On the fan on the right hand side of the engine, it's plugged in as usual. So this one, I suppose, works. But the one on the left hand side, turns out it doesn't go to a switch and the positive wire is just wired straight to a live, meaning the fan would be constantly on. But whilst I try and figure that out, let's see how Chris is getting on with the live. I've just got the first glimpse oh. of the underside of the glass, but it's taking a fair bit of bending, so I am on thin ice. Oh. So Chris is making progress, and I'm making progress in taking the rear bumper off. But I spoke too soon because Chris has some bad news. It's, it's not good news. I've got a little, little bit of cracking going on there. Although I gave Chris this headlight at the beginning of the video, he's actually been doing this for three days. How are we doing? Day two in the Big Brother house. <laughs> he's been trying everything. He's watched YouTube videos, used brake cleaner to break down the sealant, but this glass lens is providing maximum protection for the headlight. I've been scraping it for three days now. Yeah. I've broken it in two places. Mm. We've got one brake here and one brake here. Yeah. And well, let me show you quick. Let me show you. I'm here. This is what we're this is what we're aiming for. Yeah, this is what we want. Just without all these shards of glass everywhere. <laughs> yeah. We want to try and keep this in one piece. Hopefully. So. But we have to say, like, I just showed we could see how much like silicon is used, and it's not only used on like the inside; it's also used on the outside and everywhere. So there's a lot that is fully loose. Yeah, that is lifting. There is no. I can there see is that, no Chris. attachment there. I can see that, Chris. And then all of this here. Yes, Chris. That's the same, Matt. I can. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that, Chris. Okay, yeah. and then it's definitely not. I can see that part you that broke bit as well. <laughs> it's definitely I can see that bit, Chris. <laughs> I can see that bit that you broke, Chris. Even if I get it off in one piece, it's not been worth my selling. Yeah, he has actually been doing this for three days. Um, so, okay, now we're gonna send it. This is the make or break moment. We probably should have just done this to begin with, and then the back of the headlight wouldn't have been broken. Here we go. <laughs> we tried absolutely everything. But the more we did, the more we seemed to just break the main part of the headlight, which only left us with one option. And even that was proving difficult. Let's see if it works this time. Until we realized the back of the glass may be the weak point. That seems to be the, the weak point. That is. We're celebrating a £10,700 <laughs> loss. Oh my God. I'll never get that time back. We had no choice. And it looks like I've got a lot of cleaning up to do now. And after I've cleaned that up, we're going to take a look at the gearbox, which we wasn't going to take apart until we saw this video that we posted on the Mark II channel. First thing we're going to check is the release bearing for the clutch. We actually want to avoid replacing this because from Lamborghini, it's £2,800 plus VAT. The release bearing is in charge of pushing the diaphragm spring on the clutch cover, which in turn releases the clutch. And the release bearing is being pushed out by a hydraulic pedal. The problem is when the release bearing fails, it tends to leak fluid from the seals, which then pushes clutch fluid over the clutch plate, making the clutch slip. So what we're gonna do to test it's not leaking and the seals are all good is attach the hydraulic line, which would usually go to the clutch pedal. We're gonna attach it to a pump, which has some clutch fluid in it and pressurize the system. And then we should be able to see whether any seals leak. Nothing, it's sound. And it's good news. Although on a normal car, whilst you've got the gearbox out, you probably would replace the release bearing. For £3,000, I'm making sure I get the maximum life out of mine. But now it's on to stripping the gearbox. And the bad news is, it looks like this thing's been apart before. Once we've got the gearbox cover off, we can see all the gears and the synchros. And the first thing we're going to do is drain all the oil out to see if we can see any signs of metal shards. 
but so far so good the oil's looking pretty clean i don't have much experiences with gearbox in fact i don't have any so for me to try and explain to you so for me to try and explain to you how this works i'd more than likely get it wrong but the only way to check to see if anything's actually damaged is just visually we can see if any of the teeth on the gears are sheared away or any of the synchros are looking rough and after a long inspection it seems all to be good that's until we notice something putting it back together so it seems in every video we find something new with the Mercer Largo and it's no different in this video this gearbox did not come out of this car there's an e-gear and a manual version of the Mercer Largo and this gearbox was an e-gear from what we assume anyway this hole here is well we can't find any sensor that goes into that can't understand why it's there turns out that hole is for a transmission speed sensor for the e-gear transmission and this is a manual gearbox that we've got on the screen now and it has no hole at all where that one is so whether they've changed the gearbox from an e-gear and then put it into a manual and then they're blocking over this hole or I have absolutely no idea. Some of you are probably going to say, well, maybe it was an e-gear car and they converted it to manual, but all 2002 Mercer Largos were manual. So there's, not, there's no chance of that. So more than likely what's happened is they've replaced the manual gearbox was probably gone or broken, as you've seen from this video. And maybe they could only get an e-gear box to replace it with. It just fills us with confidence. <laughs> Demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> well at least my dad finds the funny side of things but even though it may have been an e-gear box and there's a few extra holes in it we can't see any reason why it wouldn't work as a manual box as well because the e-gear is effectively just an automated manual box it gets better it gets better <laughs> Just check out these two holes here, which are not meant to be at the top of the gearbox, and they're actually drilled out, and I can tell you exactly why they're drilled out. Because someone got a little brave, we think, with these two holes here. That looks like they line up to the holes on top of the gearbox, but luckily, they haven't gone through the gearbox, so close call there, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're back to the headlight situation. Finally, about an episode later, we have got what I originally went to take the lenses off for. Two exposed headlights, and it's not even the black that's causing that milkiness. It was the actual glass, like sort of fogging up. It was almost like burnt itself. So it's a good job we've taken that off, and we're going to have some nicely fresh, restored headlights. And the reason why we had to break the glass off is because we ended up, well, Chris ended up, Whoa. At, yeah, Chris it's ended up 400, 400 quid. <laughs> For what? Breaking a headlight? I spent three days on it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just show which one? That bit was me. This bit, that was yeah, you. Yeah, that bit was me, but that's just a bit weird. So, but I think this is redeemable. We can glue it that's back on. Be that's going to be able to glue back on. One thing that we are going to do before, well, I think I'm going to do, let me know. Well, I'm, I've committed to doing it now. These silver bits in here, I'm thinking of painting on black and that way it's going to give it a more evil look. And plus, I don't think anybody has ever done this on a Mercer Largo. There's probably a reason why, but let's find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's because they don't split the lights. They can't split the lights, but I'm going to do this and it's going to be the only one with black little circles in. Yeah? Hey, we might as well make it our own whilst we're here and do something unique to it. But I think this could look pretty cool. I'd also like to remind you guys who are watching this who are not subscribed to hit that subscribe button below because it is completely free and it helps you keep up to date with the Mercer Largo build. For now, I've added some etch primer and a bit of satin black paint. And right now, I feel like I've made the right decision here. The headlights are starting to look mean as anything. I bet you're wondering why we had to take the engine apart again. So as you know, we're still waiting for an oil pump for this car. The £3,000 oil pump, which won't be here until the 12th of December. But we noticed something which made us take apart this engine. So if you look underneath the engine, or this is the top side of the engine, you can see all the cylinders here. 
The thing is, one of these cylinder sleeves is £499 plus VAT. And of course, there's 12 cylinders, so there's 12 sleeves. And originally we thought this one is, well, we thought we might be able to get away with it, but if you just look inside, you can see a few scratches and scores along the sleeve. And if there's scratches or scores in a cylinder, then that could leave gaps for oil to get through into the combustion chamber, which is no good. Now I admit, we probably should have changed this whilst we had the engine stripped apart the last time, but we didn't think it was too bad, but the more we looked at it, we thought, we better do it, but for £499, it was pretty painful. So a new cylinder sleeve is in the engine, but that's not the issue we found. These things are called thrust washers, and there's four of them on this engine. They're like half moon shaped, and they sit around here, two at the top and two at the bottom, and these stop the crank from moving left to right when the clutch is applied. The thing is, the thrust washers aren't supposed to spin. They're supposed to sit in place right here, and the crank goes around in it. But the thrust washers that are here are spinning around with the engine. And we didn't spot this the first time around because we never moved them out of place. But it's a good job we sussed it this time. Check this out, you can see we can just spin the thrust washers round and round. So what normally stops these thrust washers from spinning round in the engine is that they usually have a little tab on the top of them. Just like the picture here. The thing is, if you look closely at this, there was a tab on this and it's been grinded off it is really rough on top of this thrust washer so why on earth would they do this we have the answer so the thing is there's only one thrust washer with the tab on it so they only need one because that one won't spin round because that one is in a recess which would be in the top of the crankcase just down there so let's say the person who built this engine before put the crank in and then all the pistons on then afterwards realize, oh no, I forgot to put the thrust washers in. But he wouldn't be able to put the thrust washer in, which has the tab on the top, without taking the crank back out, because there's no way you'd be able to slide it in the recess and get it round because it has that tab on it. That's unless, of course, you grind the tab off and then you can slide it around the recess, it's, it's, it's just pure genius. <laughs> so the reason we went to Lamborghini this morning was to pick up the thrust washers with the tab on them that they're supposed to have. So this is what one is supposed to look like. That's the other one. And the funny thing about this is that the one with the tab on it was only 22 pound 66 P each. But if we needed this one without the tab on it, it would have been 181 pound and 63p each. But if you're making some serious money moves like the guy who rebuilt this engine before, then we know that you could have just bought the one with the tab on it and gr ground it off. It honestly doesn't shock me anymore. Neither me or my dad have ever rebuilt a Lamborghini engine ever before. But this sort of stuff applies to any engine. But now you can see how the thrust washer sits in its little recess. And in fact, you have to actually put it on the crank and then slide the That's crank it, in. When the top casing goes on, it, they won't spin. So, genius. Just gets better and better. <laughs> <laughs> Look at them. In my opinion, I think that small difference with those little rings from silver to black have made such a difference. It's just way more Batman like now. It's like a Marcelago, but with the mascara. And what's in this box right here should be the saviour to our problems. £399 for some plastic lenses from Poland. Shout out to Poland. All I've got to do to seal these on is get the windscreen sealer out, put a nice bead around the edge, and then I can slide the new plastic lenses on. And in my opinion, they should have been plastic from the start. There have been some Merchelago owners which have told me the plastic lenses melt from the heat of the headlight bulbs. But the way I see it, if we replace the headlight bulbs to LED, there won't be anywhere near as much heat as there would be with the standard bulbs. I mean, you only have to look as far as the Gallardo to see that that has plastic lenses as well. I think these plastic headlight lenses have made an improvement. How good do they look for around 300 quid? They're super shiny. And the fitment is actually really nice. You're not going to be able to see any of the side. The wings cover that up. With the black centers now, it's looking absolutely evil and Batman spec like. I think that's a 10 out of 10 job. Well, 
High Cross have agreed to let me bring my Merchant Argo down here to High Cross in Leicester. So all of you guys who have been watching the channel, well most of you guys can come and see it for yourself and see the state that it's actually in. Christmas is coming, the snowflakes will be falling, it's the most wonderful time of year. Now of course the Merchant Argo didn't drive here, there's still no engine in there and there's also no interior in there, but we'll get onto that later in the video. It was just so nice to meet a lot of you that watch the channel and it also gave me a chance to give back to you guys as well. After all, I owe it to all of you while my life has completely changed. Congratulations mate! <laughs> this is a rock paper scissors for the Xbox. This is the one, make it a clean match guys. Right. Let's do it. One, two, three, go. Oh! 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 <laughs> Bless you. How do you feel? You oh, won an Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> the day was truly unreal. I can't believe how many of you watched the channel. And I'll never be able to thank all of you enough. Oh, oh, it's oh, one. An Xbox. <laughs> now a lot of you have seen the Mercer logo in the flesh. It's time to get back to work. What? a day that was. And as you guys noticed, the newly restored headlights, but this time with plastic lenses, not glass. I actually think they look better than the original glass lens, not to mention the amount of weight we've saved and the price difference. £10,700 Lamborghini want for a replacement headlight, but we got these for 300 quid. It actually works out we could replace those plastic lenses each year for 35 years and it would only cover the cost of one Mercer Largo headlight. So they're definitely worth the cost. I hope. I don't think that these cars are ever going to go down in price. They don't make V12 manuals anymore. They don't make Lamborghini Mercer Largos. And this is my dream car. Hence the reason why we're going to be doing some upgrades. It's going to be a no expense spared sort of build. Well, I say that, but you'll see what we've got in a minute. But this is the pre-LP model. So this is before they did the facelift on the Lamborghini Merchant Largo. The pre-LP model looked like this, and the LP model looked like this. I'm also nearly 100% confident that this was not done by Lamborghini. <laughs> There's many differences between the pre-LP model and the LP model, but one of them is the front bumper. This is the pre-LP front bumper, and it's just, it's just pretty flat, but this is the LP front bumper. The thing is, the Lamborghini Mercer Largo, being the Mercer Largo it is, it don't like to do things the usual way. Normally on a car, behind the bumper, you would have a crash bar, but on the Mercer Largo, there's absolutely nothing here, apart from this plastic bit, which is, well, part of the storage. Instead, Lamborghini mounted the crash bar to the actual bumper, which is made out of a sort of Kevlar material, which not only makes it super heavy, it also makes it expensive as well. So expensive, in fact, a second-hand bumper would cost you £6,250. And this is just all fiberglass, it almost looks aftermarket. Which is why I didn't feel so bad when I got an LP640 bumper for only £475 off eBay, so actually, I could make a bit of money out of this. Now quite obviously, this is not a genuine bumper for £475, but I think it looks as good, if not better. And because it's made out of fiberglass, we're not actually compromising on the material that it's made out of, because the standard one is made out of the same material. Let's just hope it fits right. But I noticed straight away that I was gonna have a little trouble with this under tray. But that's nothing a Dremel couldn't sort. I had to make a few cuts to the under tray so now I could push the bumper all the way in. Then the side of the bumper actually slides into these weird bolt sections that are mounted to the frame instead of bolting to the wing. And once I got that sorted, I could remove the wrap which remained on the second hand bumper and it was just about done. The bumper is on after hours of work. Check it out. Actually, this part fits better than stock. So here's the line for the bonnet. Actually, does look all right. And then, let's check the line here, check the line here. For an aftermarket bumper, it's not so bad, actually. Um, the only thing we did struggle with is these grill bits. These are genuine grills from Lamborghini. And they're like 400 pound for a pair of grills, but shout out to the guy that I bought it off 
eBay because he included the grills with them. But because this is an aftermarket bumper, it's uh, like not quite the right size for the grills. But we managed to make it work. That is not all. There's also a rear bumper. Now I admit, it does look a little weird at the moment. They always do when the bumper's a different colour. But you guys are just going to have to bear with me because we are a long way from getting this car painted. Now the difference between the pre-LP rear bumper and the LP rear bumper is definitely worth a switch. This is of course the pre-LP rear bumper and then it has two exhaust tips which kind of ride up here when the engine's in. But the LP rear bumper, which only cost me £750, has a huge exhaust tip, which definitely passes the fist test. And again, we should actually be able to make some money out of this because the stock rear bumper is worth £6,000 second hand. So let's get the LP bumper on. The rear bumper doesn't fit much differently to the front bumper. I've got to take both the grills out each side and then there's four bolts in the center of the bumper which hold it to the steel frame of the car, which is looking a little worse for wear. So we're definitely going to sand this all down and paint it before we put the engine back in. Again, the Mercia Largo at the back doesn't have a crash bar. There's just some rubber stops which attach to the rear bumper, which is really strange for a fiberglass or carbon fiber car. This wasn't always going to go always this wasn't always gonna go to plan. Aftermarket bumpers sometimes fit good like the front, sometimes not so good like the back. So this is how it lines up at the back. That looks absolutely bang on with this grill here. But the issue is the bumper is way off this side. It's forward, it's tilted. But then if we move it into the correct position on the side, about there, it then throws this bit off here so what it looks like I'm gonna to have to line it up with this side I think and then this piece here is gonna to have to be chopped all the way along the edge um, repositioned and then fiber gassed back into place which definitely sounds like a body shop job because I'll probably ruin it I spent the next good part of an hour trying to line this bumper up to get it as good as I could and this was the result It's not, it's not as far off as I first thought. I think it looks close. I think it looks all right. Yeah, it's just a small gap. Everything on the sides all right? Yeah, the sides, they all line up okay. I think there's a lot of stress on it. I think maybe it needs a bit of heat because I feel like this bump is under a lot of stress, but actually it's not, it's not actually as far off as what I thought it was going to be. So it might not need like loads of adjustment. You could just put like, if you're going to do a bit of body work, just put a bit of fiberglass. Yeah, fiberglass on that bit. But check that out. It's not perfect, but I'm hoping the body shop can make it perfect. There's some weird holes in the side of the bumper, which I assume is for the American model. And also I'm missing the grills at the back. You know what? I am buzzing with that. The LP640 rear bumper. Yes, there are a few grills missing, but we can get to that. And now an LP640 front bumper as well. This is going to look so good. That's if we can complete this engine build and finally get it on the road. Update on the engine since the last video. We put it all back together. A new cylinder sleeve has gone in. The new thrust washers have gone in. Still waiting for the new oil pump to be delivered. And that's looking like the 12th of December. But now let's move back to the interior. And if you remember how green and horrible looking it was, then you'll know why in the last video I removed it and sent it to auto trim in Leicester. Holding on, I'm holding on. Table dirty from the weed that they roll it on. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Clothes dirty on the floor, but I throw them on. How insanely good do these look? What a transformation. How are these the same seats and the same interior? It's auto trim. You've smashed it. I dropped the full interior off to auto trim in Leicester 
and it wasn't that long before they were calling me and saying it's ready we've got black alcantara centers in the seat green stitching black leather on the outside of the seat we've even had the logo put in the headrest and i've kept all the green stitching just to give it a little bit of i didn't want to lose the green completely because more than likely we're going to have the original color painted on the outside but this is next level and the craziest thing is auto trim managed to find out what that horrible smell was on the interior and all of the interior was actually water damaged so everything that has foam in it like the armrest here and the bottom of the seats even the backing of the seat was soaked in water and obviously over time that's going to stink so they've actually replaced all the foam which is give it like a new life but why on earth was it soaked in water? It's literally beyond me because it's not even like this is a convertible and it got left out in the rain, but any suggestions, let me know in the comment section. For now, let's get this interior in. Putting this interior back in is definitely not as easy as it looks. Everything had to go back in in the same order it came out. I found myself putting about five trims in place, then having to take them back out again to put more trims in which should have gone in first. I definitely should have took some photos or remembered a little bit better how this thing came out. Then you have parts like this, where Lamborghini had just cut out a bit of leather which looks rough as anything and then almost glued it to the side of the transmission tunnel. To me it looks more like an afterthought but there's not much we can do to improve it so instead I'm going to replace the green bit of leather with the black bit of leather using the same technique as Lamborghini used when they built the car. Loads of adhesives stuck to the back of it and push it down onto the transmission tunnel. Weird, but I guess that's the Italian way of doing things. And then it's back on with even more trims. Now, as I mentioned, although this is a little upgrade, I still wanted to keep it as OEM looking as possible. And that's why we've not done anything too far out of the ordinary with this interior. It is literally the standard interior, but retrimmed. Nearly all in now, but the question is, what are we going to be doing with the hole that was cut in the transmission tunnel? Because I don't really want to leave it like that because it looks a mess. But at the same time, this could do us a few favours. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave this in. And when we put the engine and gearbox in, if we do actually need to access the linkage, we can use the hole that they've cut out. And once we've got everything set up, then we can then refiber glass over this and hopefully make it look like nothing's happened. But for now, it could come in our favor. And I'm nearly on the home straight now, fitting back in the seat belts and the center console. And once I've done that, it's about time to put the seats in. And you could see from the smile on my face how much of a difference they make. I'm absolutely over the moon with this interior. I need to show it to you guys, but I'm just manifesting the moment I get to start this. The seatbelt is on this side, which is so strange, but oh, it's so good. <laughs> Out of 10? Oh, like 10 million out of 10. It actually looks like a Lamborghini now and not like a moulding one. Don't it feel really cramped in here? No, I, I'm quite comfy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, oh my God. Like, my ass doesn't it. really fit in the bottom. My ass is like overlaying the... You're gonna have to lay like, off the Greggs. <laughs> yeah. This is actually perfect. I think I have got a bit of overlap, but it's not, <laughs> it's not that bad. It, this leather looks a bit wet now. Yeah, I think Alcantara. Yeah. I think keep it the same, but do Alcantara on that. But look how close the pedals are. And we've still got the Lamborghini Wait. flap. Flap! It, oh, so I'm missing little bits like this, this. Um, I'm missing little bits like that which we can get. This is actually broken, so we're oh gonna dear. have to get a replacement ashtray. But wait, this one is actually, it is off a, an Audi. There's an Audi badge. So that is definitely come from some sort of Audi. So it's not only Lamborghini. So we should be able to get that from maybe an R8 or probably a Ford Polo. <laughs> <laughs> the interior is mint, but now I've got to push the Merchel Largo out of this unit into the other unit because the oil pump is about there and we're that much closer to getting it in the car. So plan B was 
to rebuild it and that looks like what we're going to have to do being that the wait for a new one is ridiculous but we think we have all the parts here to do it providing that the chap who rebuilt this before put them all back together we know we're missing some circlips which hold in the bearings which we can get i'm sure we can do that but other than that it doesn't actually look damaged in here seems okay so and it's fairly mechanical there's nothing really electrical in here and it's i think we can do this on this shaft you can see two cutout holes where two keys are supposed to sit in and in this one a really small one was put in there which quite clearly doesn't fit but we managed to find some of the correct size online for just two pound so at least we've got some peace of mind now this section here is the release valve and when the oil pressure gets too high it releases it through here it has a piston in a spring and then this cap on top holding it all down with a circlip as well See, it's odd. <laughs> oh, look. Yes, we're in. Release valve is in. All we've got to do now is put all these cogs, which if we seal it up correctly, should give us some nice oil pressure to the rest of the engine. This oil pump is built in stages. Two gears go in, then we think we should run some sealant around the edge of it. And then the outer casing goes on with the bearing in. Nobody provides an exploded diagram of the Lamborghini oil pump, so we can never be 100% certain that we're getting this exactly right. But that's a risk I'm going to have to take. The next stage is two more gears, and you can see that one of them slots over the new key that we bought for £2. We're then going to run some more sealant on the other half of the casing and connect that to the remaining part of the oil pump. And then we're on to the final part now. The other £2 key goes on the shaft, and then both gears join it inside the housing with some sealant around the edges and finally the end cap with the bearing in and we can knock that all in place and tighten up the nuts ba -ba. we are there one circlip in there and one circlip in there this oil pump is deemed ready for the engine hopefully it doesn't fail because if it does the engine is written off it's gone let's do it right quick test as well it's all together now with the circlips on you spin it here's the test there you go. Ready? Ooh. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Got some else you can put in there. <laughs> like a Dyson. I can almost hear the Italian V12 singing already. With the oil pump built up, we've then got to attach the oil strainer to it. The oil strainer job is to pick up the oil from the bottom of the sump and send it through the oil pump and guiding it round the rest of the engine. All these parts are so vital. It's time for our homemade gasket to sit on the bottom of the crank casing and then the sump on the bottom of the engine to seal it all up. And that is pretty much all for the bottom half of the engine. So we can spin it over and begin to finish off the rest of it. Oil pump is on finally after so long of waiting. Now we just gotta put the sprocket on the top, put the chain on the bottom, and then we can finally put the heads on with the chain and uh, go from there. But it's looking good so far. Now the oil pump is chain driven. So a sprocket sits on the end of it and a separate chain will run from that sprocket to another sprocket on the crank. Whilst we was doing this, we had a power cut at the unit, so we had to do the rest in the dark, but that didn't stop us. Now the chain's attached to the crank and also the oil pump at the bottom. Last thing to go on is this plastic chain guide, which stops the chain flapping around when the car's running. And that's just about it. And this is about ready now for both cylinder heads and the cover which goes over the top. But before we do that, there's something I'm dying to find out. And that is the instrument cluster here. We've been having so many issues with this, trying to get it to work. And just now, it might work. Fingers crossed. When I bought the car, I was told that the instrument cluster doesn't work due to somebody jump-starting the Lamborghini with the battery connections the wrong way round, causing it to short out. When we investigated this in a previous video, we found that there was a few blown resistors on the back of the circuit board. We got them replaced, but still, it didn't work. No! 
It's now been checked over by a company that builds circuit boards for aeroplanes. They've changed a few things on the board and we're hoping this time it's going to work. The instrument cluster is now in. I've just got to put the jumper pack to the battery terminals which are in front of the rear wheel and we can give it a test. This is potentially saving at least £2,000 if this works. At least. Okay. Oh, right. Turn it on. Any lights on in the car? Yes, we have sign of power. We have sign of power. Okay. You're nervous. You can't even put the key in. He's shaking. <laughs> I just want it to work. I just don't think it is though. Is that you that key? There's nothing, is there? Well, <laughs> it's not working. Why does it not work? Do you know what it is? Why is it? It's broken. Chris could be right, they could be broken. And as the instrument cluster is still not working, we still have no idea what mileage this car's on. Well, that was unsuccessful, but I think I have something which might lighten the mood. It's only something little, but everything counts. After I retrimmed the whole interior, there was one thing that was broken, and that was this ashtray here. It's it's broken off the top, all the clips are broke. This bit's just a bit tatty. There's just, it's just not so great. Now Lamborghini sell the ashtray in two separate parts. The ashtray and the cover. The ashtray number 18 here would actually cost you 300 and one pound and 75p from Lamborghini. That's, that's just this part here. But it doesn't end there, it doesn't end there. If you want the ashtray cover as well, Bear with me, number 17, the ashtray cover, £211.28p. And on top of that, if you want a carbon fibre cover, just, just the cover in carbon fibre is going to set you back £2,658.64p. So in my hand right now, which is broken, is around £500 worth of parts. But if we look underneath the ashtray, we can not only see an Audi logo in the top there, we can also see an Audi part number. And that part number matches up to an Audi A6 2008 rear passenger side ashtray. So I bought one for £30 off eBay. And here it is right here, a working Audi A6 rear passenger ashtray, which looks exactly the same well it's identical to the lamborghini one but what am i going to do about the top well i'm just going to do what lamborghini do and stick it over the top of the audi one that is literally what they've done so when i pry off this lamborghini ashtray cover of this part here i suspect i should see an audi a6 ashtray and what do you know <laughs> it's exactly the same do you know what I'm, I'm not even I'm not even shocked anymore at this type of stuff. It is exactly it is it's exactly the same, like the same colour. And it, who who did this? I'm definitely going to be getting a letter from Lamborghini soon. I can imagine. So now I can fit the Audi A6 ashtray into the Lamborghini and then apply a bit of glue to the Lamborghini ashtray cover and stick it onto the Audi A6 ashtray as a Lamborghini do. And there we go, one working ashtray. And now I'm back onto the soul of the Mercia Largo, the V12 engine. Finally, we can put the chain cover back on now, now the oil pump is on. We're applying some Loctite around the casing and then we can slide it over the chains. We're going to knock this in place and torque up all the nuts and bolts so it sits flush against the rest of the engine. Now both head gaskets can rest on this casing and on the cylinder heads. We couldn't have put the cylinder heads on before doing that casing because the head gaskets sit on top of the heads and the casing. But with both head gaskets in place, we can lift the left hand side cylinder head onto the block of the engine. Okay, we're progressing. One cylinder head is on, but it's not tightened up. And that's really how we found it. Remember, there was loose head bolts on both of the cylinder heads, and we kind of figured out why. We think that the chap, the hero that built this engine before, 
he couldn't tighten the cylinder head bolts because you can just see them right underneath there. You can't get a regular socket on the top because, well, this is all in the way. The valves are in the way. We tried a crow foot spanner as well, trying to get in there, but the valves were just hitting the side. So he probably didn't have the right tool to do it. And the right tool to do it looks like this. You would not believe how much Lamborghini want for that. £400 plus that and that is the exact same head tightening wrench the exact same part number it's absolutely ridiculous but thanks to scott ratarossa who is an absolute expert on ferraris he said that that wrench looks slightly similar to one that he's used on ferraris and then sent me the part number and where to get the ferrari one from and at this moment in time ferrari is actually a lot cheaper than Lamborghini at £65, which is still pretty expensive, but it is a lot cheaper than £400. Fits the 288 GTO, the 308 GTB, the Testarossa, but it's not listed for a Mercia Lago. We're hoping it works because we've bought one here and this should didn't you try it before you did the video? <laughs> we had that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh my God, it's sensational. 65 pound. I'm sorry, Lamborghini, but Ferrari has came through trumps on this one. 108 newton meters. Each head bolt has got to be tight into, which is pretty tight. And it even says in the manual to add Loctite to them. They didn't want these head bolts coming up. And once we've tightened them, we can now put the camshafts in. So there is a special tool to remove this cam variator thing. Only issue is we don't have it and it's probably a lot of money from Lamborghini. So we're going to see if we can get the cam on with the variator on by angling it down and probably having to take these studs out, but let's see. There's no way of us getting to the bottom of the chain now, so we have to improvise and almost wedge the chain up so we can get the camshaft sitting nicely on the chain. But luckily for us, we just had enough room by taking a few of the studs out the top of the engine. Once the camshafts are in, I can put the studs back in and then start popping on the cam caps, which are all stamped with the number on, so you cannot get these wrong. Although the previous chap somehow managed to get them wrong. And once that side's done, we can flip it over and do the right side <laughs> cylinder head. <laughs> the machine. <laughs> it felt like a pedal to the shin. Are you holding it? Yeah, I've got it. Here we go. Look at the V12. It's almost looking like a complete engine now. The zip ties are not holding on the cylinder heads. Let me explain <laughs> what they're doing. So to time this engine up, You've got to find top dead center, which means when the piston is right at the top on cylinder one, which is this cylinder right here. So to find top dead center, we've got a micrometer set up, which is zip tied on. It is magnetic, but we've got an aluminum head. So obviously it's not going to stick to that. And what this does here, we've got a little bit of steel, which is going on the piston. That's resting on top of the piston. When we turn the engine over, that is gonna lift up and then it's gonna give us a measurement on the screen there. Now there is gonna be a bit of float when it is at top dead center, meaning when we turn this, there's gonna be a point at the piston number one is gonna still sit pretty much flat on. So we've gotta get it exact. And the way we're gonna do this is using this thing right here. Now at first this sounded complicated, but when it's explained, it's not actually too bad. So top dead center is when the piston is right at the top of the cylinder here. But there is a point where the crankshaft is spinning, but the piston stays at top dead center. You can see that here. So we need to find the exact top dead center. So to do that, we're using this angle gauge here, and we're gonna turn the engine over first clockwise. And as soon as the micrometer gives us the highest reading, which in this case is 1190, we're gonna go round and put a mark on the angle gauge. After that, we're gonna turn the engine anti-clockwise. And as soon as we get that same reading of 1190, we're gonna put another mark on the angle gauge. And the distance in between those two marks is exactly top dead center. Hopefully that makes sense. That's just the first step. We now have exact top dead center of cylinder number one. 
Now we've just got to adjust these cams both sides on the left hand, left hand head and the right hand head to make sure that these notches match up perfectly on these cam caps here. And the way we do that is loosen off um, this section here which is a cam variator which is going to allow us to loosen it and then move the cam small amount of degrees and then tighten it back up but still keeping the chain in the same place. You can see here the timing is slightly off, but slightly can make a huge difference on a V12 engine. We don't want to move any part of the chain on the engine now because we know we're at top dead center. So we're just loosening off the cam variators and then we can spin the cam round and get that notch exactly in place and in line with the camshaft, just like this. Then we can add some Loctite on the cam variator bolts and tighten them all back up. My dad was in charge of the right hand side and I did the left hand side. We've done it. It's timed. We've double, we've triple and we've quadruple checked it because every time we've turned it over, it seemed to have knocked it out a tiny little degree. Only on my dad's side though. My side was pretty good. So. <laughs> hey. One turning over. V12 Mercia Largo. So the next step is rocker covers and I'll just place these on because we need gaskets and everything before we even head there. This one looks like it goes on that side actually. I've painted this one. Oh my God, it actually looks like an engine now. And then you've got all ancillaries on the top. And then on top of that, we have the inlet manifold. Now, if you remember when we picked up the car and the engine, it only came with one throttle body. This engine needs four. And if you guys have been watching the second channel, you would have known what happened to that one throttle body we had. And now I've just noticed this cap has came off and look at the state of the inside. Oh my days. It looks as if that throttle body is long gone. It's definitely not gonna work. So I ended up buying four secondhand ones. Brand new, one of those throttle bodies is going to cost you £1,655.56p. I looked on eBay and found some second-hand ones which were just under £1,000. So I saved a little bit, but not so much. But I'm going to be sending these back because the broken one that we have, when this cap fell off, I found this part number on the inside of it here. I googled that. It came back as a Volvo. V70 petrol throttle body. And if you look at that, you can even see the sticker that's on and Lamborghini have just stuck their sticker over the top where that would have gone. 160 pounds, nowhere near a thousand pounds or 1600 pound that Lamborghini are charged. So if that Volvo throttle body actually works, we're gonna save ourselves thousands. So we can only keep our fingers crossed for that. Lamborghini actually agreed to our little deal and what's in this box could save me thousands. But for now, we've got an engine to deal with. Now that we timed up the engine in the last video, the computers of the car need to know that the engine's timed up so they know when to inject fuel and when to ignite it. And the way it does that is for a cam position sensor and this pointer thing is what communicates with the cam position sensors which are sat here. According to the Mercial Argo repair manual, the pointer on the end of the cam needs to be pointing to that cam sensor when piston number one is 30 degrees before top dead center. So we're turning over the engine now to get it bang on 30 degrees before, then I can adjust that pointer into place and slide on the cam position sensor and see if it lines up. And it was, so that means we can tighten it all down. Everything is all timed up, ready to go. All we need to do now is literally start bolting the whole thing together and then we can figure out whether what we've done is actually right. We are actually sealing up the engine now. On go the rocker covers, both left hand and right hand side, along with the gaskets and the gaskets for the cam sensors as well. And what I have in my hand now are some knock sensors. They bolt to the lower block of the engine and then send a signal to the ECU if any of the cylinders are knocking. So I've got to make sure I get these in the right place. 
Then I've got the oil filter and the oil filter house to bolt onto it. Yes, I'm going to need a new oil filter, but we'll get to that. And with that all on, we can finally take the engine off the engine stand and hang it with the engine hoist. Now we can access the main seal of the engine and replace that. And somewhere amongst the boxes of bits, I found a starter motor that we can bolt to the engine as well. Now, when we bought the car, it didn't come with a flywheel, but I managed to get a reconditioned flywheel and Kevlar clutch all balanced up from a company called Reeves Knights. I think I'm pronouncing that right. £2,000 for the clutch flywheel and it's an uprated one as well. And it came with all the bolts, so absolute legend. This should go on like this. <laughs> So this flywheel is actually brand new second hand. It's been resurfaced so it should be as good as new. There's some special plates which go on before the bolts and then I've got to torque the bolts up in the procedure that it says in the manual. And once the bolts are torqued up, you're actually meant to knock over the plate which sits behind the bolts which kind of clamps the bolt down and stops it from coming loose. But I can't imagine how well that works. And there it is. And there's one final thing we're missing. We've got a new bearing from the bearing shop. My dad went to the bearing shop, five pound for a new bearing. Although from Lamborghini, it was 15 pounds. So we saved a tenner at least. Oh, that, one fresh new bearing and the circlip installed. Oh, it's like going to the jewelers. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 pounds <laughs> worth of clutch. Isn't it? It's good for 10 mile. <laughs> this has all been balanced, so we are making sure now that the pressure plate lines up to the flywheel like that. So then we're not going to get any wobbles. Now you're actually supposed to use a special clutch alignment tool to make sure that the clutch sits perfectly in the center of the flywheel. But as we didn't have one, we managed to make one with an extension and a socket, as I'm sure a lot of you guys who have changed clutches before at home do the same thing. Clutch and pressure plate is on, lined up, we think, and excitingly, the next step, <laughs> the next step is we're gonna take the manual gearbox off the stand, which actually we found out in a previous episode was an automatic gearbox, which is converted to a manual because it has an extra hole here, which we're gonna have to fill up with something. And we're gonna bolt it to it, and we will have like a complete engine and gearbox, which is, Pretty exciting. Yeah, I filled it up. <laughs> <laughs> Another monumental moment now. The gearbox being bolted to the engine of the car. Yeah. Now that we've slid it into place, yeah. all we've got to do is tighten up all the bell housing bolts. And there was one thing I was dying to find out. One thing that we don't know now this is all together is whether the starter motor even works if anything on this car looks like we've got to take the engine out to change so we want to be 100 percent sure that starter motor works so we've got a jumper pack and a load of other goodies which we're going to put onto the starter motor and then we're going to ground it out over here this is a little switch one of these is going to go on the positive <laughs> negative the switch. Turn this on. <laughs> Is it? It's in neutral. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to try and drive. Okay, now if this should turn the whole engine over. <laughs> <laughs> You're not got an air on it. No. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. That's right. Good. That's good. Hey. <laughs> It's okay, we've got assembly lube in it, so the starter motor does work, if you can listen. <laughs> Too much rock. <laughs> At least the starter motor works though, and the engine does turn over. There's no valve sitting pistons though, is there? So, no. we're good. And that worked. Science. 
Things are looking good and we're making some really good progress already. Now it's time to start bolting on all the ancillaries of the car like the water pump and the thermostat housing which I'm doing now and then both the engine mounts left hand and right hand side of the car. And I'd say we're doing pretty well for people that have never built a Lamborghini engine before. This huge clump of metal here is the power steering pump and the aircon compressor as well. Yes, a 2002 Lamborghini does have aircon. And then one final tensioner which bolts on here. Now let me tell you about this deal that we made with Lamborghini at the start of the video. Ever since I picked up the car, the instrument cluster hasn't worked. And apparently that's because the previous owners managed to jump the car the wrong way. Now a brand new instrument cluster from Lamborghini would cost me over £3,400 including tax. So I really wanted to avoid buying one. Also you may remember we ordered a brand new oil pump from Lamborghini because we wasn't confident in the way that the old one had been rebuilt. But after ordering it, the wait got longer and longer and in the end we ended up rebuilding the one that we had. So I had a deal proposal with Lamborghini to cancel my oil pump order and transfer the money that I used to pay for that onto a new instrument cluster. Now normally they wouldn't accept this because it's a special order part, but on this occasion they did. And inside this box, finally, we have a brand new instrument cluster. After all the hassle we've had with the old one. But unfortunately... It's not as simple as that. As soon as I got back, I unboxed this instrument cluster to find that on the back, the plug, the connector in here is completely different to the plug and connector that is on my instrument cluster. Now I've double and triple checked the wiring behind my dashboard to see if anybody has messed with the plugs or changed the connector to a different one, but it all looks legit. These connectors at the bottom here look almost too good to be well anything else but lamborghini and this plug is definitely all original and lamborghini were 100 percent positive that they've sent me the right cluster they matched it off my vin number so what the hell was going on well i then found out this if you check these clocks out they read in miles per hour and my old clocks actually read in kilometers per hour. It turns out that all 2002 Lamborghini Murcielagos were only made with clocks that read in kilometers per hour. And then all the models after 2002 came with a completely different wiring harness behind the whole dashboard. And the instrument cluster with the plug that I need are discontinued. So if you had a 2002 Lamborghini Murcielago and you wanted your instrument cluster to read in miles per hour, not kilometers per hour, you'd have to buy this. This wiring harness here, which converts it from that plug into the blue plug that is on the back of all the instrument clusters from now on. And let me show you how much they want for that instrument cluster. £1,666.40 plus VAT. So if I want this instrument cluster to work, I'm in well over, what, like £6,000. So I still don't know what to do. We've got to get the old ones working. The engine and the gearbox is absolutely huge. And all of this has got to go in as is really because it's so difficult to work around even though it's a huge engine bay when it's in i'm sure this is going to be like completely tight and compact and we've got to get the exhaust manifold on before we put the engine in because the side of the engine wall there is going to be so difficult to slide anything on once that engine is in and the exhaust manifold well one of them is over here let's say well, this one's gonna go the other side, but between the exhaust manifold and the block of the engine, there are 12 of these gaskets, one for each cylinder, and we only have one. I've just called Lamborghini. They want 333 pounds for 12 of these gaskets, and they're just little metal materials. They can get them tomorrow. We wanna to put the engine in today. So the only solution we have is we're gonna send Fabian to an exhaust place to get a bit of sheet metal, which we should be able to make these exhaust gaskets from. Easy. Go Fabian. <laughs> Whilst we wait for Fabian to collect and deliver the goods, we've got plenty more we can carry on with. 
One of them being the rear diff. This attaches directly to the engine. And we're pretty sure that we should bolt this on before we put it in the car. And after that, to drive all the ancillaries, we're going to need an ancillary belt. Lamborghini want 90 pounds and 8 pence plus VAT for an auxiliary belt. And you can already guess, we found one for a lot cheaper on eBay. 13 pound 49p. We just got to hope it works. And the belt fits snug. Come on. And quite positively, it did. It was pretty easy to cross-reference the auxiliary belts. We just needed to find out the length of the original belt and how many ribs it had in it. And once we put the alternator on and tighten the tensioner up, the belt was on and the engine was just about ready. Right, now everything is all on and we've got some decision to make. My dad reckons that it would probably go in the engine a lot better without the inlet manifold on, but I think it's gonna be easier to get it on now. Well, we'll see. I think let's put the inlet manifold on and then I think we're just about ready to go bar the exhaust manifold gaskets. And this was the inlet manifold. This is what's came off and quite clearly before this engine was taken apart, you can obviously see it wasn't so healthy. I mean, this side of the inlet looks like an oil sump and there's a lot of oil stains in there and there definitely shouldn't be any oil inside an inlet manifold. So this car would have been smoking like hell. <laughs> Either way, we're gonna clean it up. I'll put these on top and then we've got these to deal with. I'm gonna clean the inlet manifold up with a bit of degreaser and hopefully get rid of most of that oil staining, which definitely shouldn't be in there. Once I've done that, there's some more gaskets to go on and then the rest of the components before I can put on both the covers of each bank of the inlet manifold. The next thing to go in on the inlet manifold are the injectors. We've got all the old ones here well, they're Bosch ones and they're like 30 to 40 pound an injector, which really isn't too bad. But when there's 12 of them, it's pretty bad. Instead, I sent these off to Artec to have them cleaned out, new seals put on them and all the pattern tested. They've got a pretty cool machine inside Artec, which tests the injectors. You can actually see the spray pattern here. And they told me that before they were pretty bad. So this engine wouldn't have been the healthiest. And what they do, they put new baskets on there, clean everything all out, put new seals on them, and then retest them to make sure they are in tip-top shape. And there they are, as good as new. Much better than buying 12 new injectors at £40 each. Now I'm attaching them to the fuel rail, which they just push into place, and then they're held on with a little sliding clip. Then I'm gonna push them into the inlet manifold. This is the same for both sides. And to add even more to that, there's some more weird vacuum lines which sit on the inlet manifold both sides, which open another sort of butterfly flap inside the inlet manifold. Maybe one of you guys in the comments could tell me what exactly this part does, but I wasn't too sure. Okay, looking good. The next thing to go on are the throttle bodies. Each side, which open and close to let the air in the engine. And if you remember in the last video, I told you they were the same throttle bodies that are used on a Volvo. This is a Mercialago throttle body, and this is a Volvo throttle body. They are literally exactly the same. But unfortunately, there is a few issues which are gonna stop us from sending these Lamborghini ones back and using the Volvo ones. And it's something to do with the coding on the car. Even though the car's a 2002 Mercialago, it still requires throttle bodies to be coded to the car if they're different. And obviously Volvo ones are gonna be different. They've got a different amount of wires going into the plug. So maybe we could have got the Volvo ones working if we knew what we were doing, but the issue is <laughs> we don't. And I've already spent the money now. I've committed to it. These throttle bodies are going on. And I definitely think we've cheated Lamborghini out of enough money so far. It's just annoying we couldn't save that little bit extra on these throttle bodies. But now we have just hit monumental moment number two. The engine, the gearbox, the rear diff and the inlet manifold are all bolted together for the first time in seven years. 
And to complement that, we're now adding the wiring loom which connects to all the injectors and everything around the inlet manifold to make life a little bit easier when we put the engine into the car. The engine block, the inlet manifold and the throttle bodies and part of the wiring loom is all connected now, looking absolutely massive. The next thing to go on is the exhaust manifold and Fabian has delivered the exhaust gasket material which we've got sheets of these metal i think it was about 40 quid and we've gone through about four already and we're cutting out the template well my dad's cutting out the template for the exhaust manifolds here's some that is done earlier questionable but <laughs> there we go perfect this sensor here is actually for a manifold pressure sensor. So that plugs in there and then this hose off it, the manifold bolts onto that, like there. And then there's a line which connects into the exhaust manifold here, which we don't have. And from the looks of it, it looks like it's gonna be a brake line. And actually looking at the diagram for this, it does look like just a copper line. And I've got some copper line laying around which I've used for some brakes before. So I'm now gonna have a go at making my own exhaust manifold pressure wire for a Lamborghini Murcielago. The tool I'm using now sort of spurs the brake line out as it would do on a normal brake line. And you can see that here. And that should screw into the exhaust manifolds. I'm pretty sure the idea of these sensors is to detect the pressure between the manifold and the catalytic converters. If the cats were blocked, then there'd be more pressure, which would bring up a fault. And sure enough, it seems to be doing the job, but I guess we won't find out if it actually works properly until we get the engine running. And I'm so glad we're putting the exhaust manifold on now and not when it's in the car because it was even difficult and such a tedious long job to do whilst it was out the car. You can only get half a turn on the spanner at a time. Boring, annoying, boring. Bored, bored, bored. After I'd finally tightened up all the bolts for the manifold, I can then trim down my new manifold pressure line which I've made. I'm not sure that's the proper way to do it, but it worked. After that, it just slides in the silicon hose which connects to the sensor and we're just about ready to go. And looking back on it now, Lamborghini would have charged £50 for the right hand side pipe and £188.20 for the left hand pipe. So I've made quite a saving there, that's if it works. One thing I want to do before we put the engine in is drain the rear diff oil, as I imagine it's not been changed in such a long time, and fill it up with some fresh 75W90. There's two plugs on the rear diff, one being a drain plug and one being the fill plug. And all you do to fill it is just keep putting the 75W90 in until it starts coming back out the fill plug. And it's exactly the same for the gearbox. Apart from the gearbox takes a lot more oil than the rear diff. This is it. The moment we've been waiting for since picking up this engine and rebuilding it. Putting it in the car, it's gonna be one small lift for man and one giant leap for mankind. <laughs> Welcome to monumental moment number three. The V12 Mercialago engine is about to be one with the car again after seven years of being apart. Rebuilt by Armstrong and Son with no experience with Lamborghini engines before. I really hope that this is gonna work. Because of the size of the engine and the gearbox, we have to put this in a really strange way. <laughs> We're lifting it up with the two post ramp and then pulling the car towards the engine. After that, the gearbox has to slide down the transmission tunnel which means that we have to angle the engine at such a strange angle. And then together, we're gonna slowly guide it into place to sit on the two lower engine mounts. So 
so close to getting the engine mounts in. <laughs> so close. We just need a spacer on top of them. I think that's what Lamborghini do. Then we can get the bolt through. Yes! Yes! <laughs> oh my god, it's in. <laughs> The engine is in the Lamborghini Murcielago. Come on. I do not think I can contain my excitement for when we hear the V12 roar of this engine. But there's one big problem, even if we do get everything connected up and go to start it. We're gonna have no idea whether we have oil pressure or even any other faults because we've got no instrument cluster. This is a brand new instrument cluster that I bought from Lamborghini, which was over £3,400. I had to buy one because somebody destroyed the last instrument cluster by jumping the car with the battery terminals the wrong way round. Now, we've tried absolutely everything with this, and it's been to so many specialists, and they still cannot get this thing to work. The problem we have now is that even the new instrument cluster from Lamborghini doesn't work. The connections of the back are completely different. And to get them to work, you have to buy an additional loom, which costs another £1,666. And the thing is, now that we have these new clocks from Lamborghini, they've said that everything that you order from Lamborghini is a special order part. I cannot send these back now. So the only option is to try and get these working. But instead of paying that money, I think I've found a solution. This could be our solution. So this has been cut off a Lamborghini 2002 Merchel Argo. And this is the original loom though. This isn't the loom that we need from Lamborghini. This is one that is off a 2003 car. But there is an issue. Now there's only six wires coming off this, but there is seven wires going into the plug. Now the wires do match up and we know which ones are power and which ones are earth, but obviously we're a wire short. We literally don't have a choice here. So we're gonna have to just risk it. And the thing is we're kind of risking blowing up the new clocks. So <laughs> the, this, might work or it might not but we're willing to give it a try let's let's see how we get on in 2003 lamborghini switched all the instrument cluster plugs to this blue one and you'll find them on a lot of german cars now but on 2002 models they're the same as this one which are discontinued now we've checked the wires and we know which one have got power which one's earth and then there's a few more which we think are signal wires and this is the point of no return. We're snipping the original wires. The good thing is that on the new loom, they use the same color wires. So we're just gonna match them up, yellow to yellow, black to black, and so on. The problem is, we're gonna have one wire left over on the original loom. So we can only hope it's not important. Now with the new plug wired in, we push the Mercer Largo forward took the rear wheel off and added a battery pack to the power cables. Battery is connected. This could be goodbye to 4,000 pounds worth of dashboard. Here we go. If we'd wired this up wrong, it could mean shorting out another instrument cluster. Here we go. But we have no choice. Nothing at the minute. Ooh. Oh, 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 I've got a mileage, but it's flashed and gone off. That's working. Oh, wait, 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 look, 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 look that's working, that's working, that's working. <laughs> oh, they come on and then they go straight back off. Yeah, they come on and then it goes straight back off. That's weird. We progress, but... I don't know if we broke these. I think we'll, cha we'll change the green wire now to the other green wire. Oh, what, switch those two yeah. wires? Yeah, because yeah, you see what, yeah, because they're both power, weren't they? Yeah. So the wire that we had left over was also a power wire. 
So our plan now was to switch one of the other power wires with that spare one to see if it had any other effect. And whilst my dad was doing that, I checked the fuse for the instrument cluster just to make sure it hadn't blown. And it all looked good, so we continued. Another thing we did as well was connect up both wiring looms to the engine just to see if it would have any other effect to it. Yeah. Now both the looms are plugged in. Let's see if it wants to work. It doesn't make sense how there's power coming on and then it's immediately it cuts it off. There's got to be some kind of like safety. We were stumped. Why was the new dashboard not working? But then we could have found something. Whilst we checked the fuses in the footwell, we noticed one of them was broke. And it turns out the fuse which was broke was for the GFA control module, which is the computer which controls all the body ECU. So if that was broke, could it potentially not be sending a signal to the dashboard? We replaced that fuse to find out. And after we did, we started getting more power yeah. to yeah. different cables. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so could it be that the control module, which is that, has blown a fuse? Okay, so we're plugging this back in now, after, we found there was a fuse blown for the GFA module. We're going to try it. Yeah, we've got we've powered up on the back, haven't we? Yeah, I think so, yeah. All right, go on. Yeah! Yes! yes, it worked! Yes! Oh my god! Yes! A lock a, a GF, some GFA control module. Oh my god! Yes! Come on! <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe that works! <laughs> wow! Do you know what? I feel like we should wire the old dash back in and see if it works because of that fuse because uh, everyone's going to want to know. Okay, these clocks, are, these are the original clocks now with the fuse back in. If this lights up, then I'm, I'm going to be annoyed. Nah, dead. 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 Completely dead. Okay. Okay, that's okay. Burning, isn't it? Can you smell it? Oh yeah, it stinks. Yeah, unplug that. So good news, finally for the instrument cluster. And I've managed to save myself over 1600 pounds. Although we did spend over three grand, but at least we got the new ones working. Look at that, it's an incredible sight. And there it is, one set of instrument cluster working and zero miles. So it must be stored in the actual clocks. Um, it's just completely reset, but this is marking the resurrection, the new life of the Lamborghini Murcielago. Zero miles. And this is, it's a fresh start for it. <laughs> Time to get the rest of the engine loom and everything else back in. Let's do it. All was looking so positive. And now me and my dad are just working together on connecting all the coolant, the vacuum, and the electrical connections up in the engine bay. Okay, this looks absolute carnage at the minute. And let's just go in here. And I know a lot of you want us to clean the engine bay up. The main concern is just to see whether the engine works right now. And then afterwards, we can worry about cleaning this whole thing up and make it look sparkly new. But there's no good having a sparkly new engine if it doesn't work. And this thing is mental. There's two wiring looms on this. Uh, one goes to here, which is marked with a yellow tab. And then on the other side, it's marked with a white tab. And the white seems to go on the right hand side and the yellow stuff seems to go on the left hand side. We've got coolant lines, AC lines, and then loads of sensors and connectors. And we're just about, we think, connected it all up. The fuel lines are on as well at the back, but the engine is still only in with one bolt. <laughs> Now, instead of connecting all the transmission and the drive shafts up, we decided to only connect up the necessities to get this car started, which were the oil lines to the sump, the return and the feed pipe, the fuel lines, 
and then of course add in the oil to the engine because if there's an issue with the engine we'd then have to disconnect it all again to pull it back out so we're playing it safe this doesn't count as the first turn of the key this is we're just testing it for the person who does the first turn of the key i think we just need to see if it actually cranks and it's probably a good idea if I disconnect the fuel relays because otherwise it would clean the bores out and that's no good it would just absolutely flood the engine with fuel because there's no spark plugs in there so oh i think they're actually still unplugged let me check one's unplugged yeah they're both unplugged okay chris do you want to do it well if it breaks it ain't my fault but i will do it just for you go on on this thing on that crazy key looks like a cassette tape there you go Mew -mew. okay okay i'm actually scared uh, every time i touch something it breaks <laughs> Okay, I think that was the throttle bodies opening and stuff. Okay. Just give it one turn, just to see if it actually cranks. It did crank. It did crank. It did crank. Okay, go again. I like it, I like it, it's cranking. Now, I think we should probably compression test each cylinder. Make sure each cylinder's got compression. And then I think, we better find someone who's gonna start this thing. Out comes the compression test though, which does what it says on the tin. Instead of screwing in a spark plug, you'll screw in this compression tester. And when we turn over the engine, the compression tester gauge will show how much pressure each cylinder is getting. And if some are low, then it shows that we have a problem. So we're hoping for equal compression on each cylinder. I drew a diagram on the blackboard to get ready to note down each pressure on each cylinder. And then we turned over the engine to measure cylinder number six compression first. 100 PSI. Now, that might seem like low compression for it, but what we're looking for at the minute is just consistency in, pressure, in compression. We've not run the engine. So um, this, as long as it's the same compression in each cylinder, we know it's right. That's all we're looking for. We then moved on to cylinder we five before having an issue. Yeah, same. Test one. Yeah, about nine, nine bar. So. Yeah, so that, is, that is about one twenty-five. Is it? Oh no! What? Is it just squirt? There's oil coming out of the head. Oh no! Oh yeah! Jesus! Head. Yeah! Oh no! Oh no! No! It's a good time for it to happen now. Yeah, rather than starting it, yeah. Driving it, yeah. Yeah. No, it ain't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather it happen before I start it than when I'm driving it. That's not good. No, that's not good. <laughs> we thought it was all going to end now, but it's these. That's where it's coming out of. Is it coming out of that? Yeah. Oh, is it meant to be a seal there then? Oh. Yeah. yeah, there is. We never put one in. Oh my god, look, it's there. We never put one in. Wow. Well, this is to all the people that said you can't rebuild a Lamborghini engine with um, no experience. Turns out, you can't. <laughs> yeah. So it looks like a stupid mistake has now cost us having to take the engine back out. All because of an O-ring that we can see here on the parts diagram. The only good we can take from this is that the rest of the engine seemed oil tight and it looks like the oil pump was doing its job because it was pumping oil to the top of the engine, which is of course where it was leaking out. Now we've got to drain all the oil back out the engine, ready so we can pull it back out from the car once more. Hello. Um, I need to order two O-rings and there's oil absolutely flying out the, um, <laughs> the cylinder head because we've missed an O-ring out. <laughs> Build a Lamborghini, they said. How much are they? Two, £8.17. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Get them. I'll have six. <laughs> £8.17 worth of mistake, which has cost us a whole lot of labour work. Now we're disconnecting everything from the engine. We've just connected back up and we're gonna spin the car back round so we can connect the two post ramp back onto the engine so we can lift it out from the car once more. It was all good for about a day. Hey! 
and in record timing, we've got it out. But now, we need to strip it all back apart again so we can access where that O-ring was. And it might not be as easy as that. Right, we're almost there, but this could be the difference between taking the inlet off and both of the heads off or not. All this casing here is sort of sits underneath two head gaskets here and here. And if we can get this casing off and then back on again after we've put the seal in, it's all good. The problem is if we can't, then we've got to either loosen the head bolts or remove the head so we can get this casing off but we've got to be able to take it out without damaging the head gasket which is here so then we can put the two seals in here and here so we're trying to remove the studs out of this now so that's going to be able to so we then we can actually slide it down a bit but oh, i suppose we've got oh, i suppose yeah we might have a bit of play there but let's see if we can actually get this off we actually ended up using slide hammers from a pdr kit you go on your side it seemed to be working. Yeah, that PDR kit's coming under. Look at A dent puller. <laughs> A dent puller got it off. And on here, that is where the seal is meant to go, the little O-ring. And there's no recess for it or anything, is there? No, no there's no recess for any O-ring. So how, how are you even meant to centralise it? You can't centralise it, can you? Well, if it was easy, I guess everyone will be doing it. And these things happen to the best of us. We're not all perfect. But if we just spent a little bit more time actually reading the manual, I'm sure we wouldn't have missed off two stupid O-rings. But apart from the obvious, the engine seemed oil tight. The oil pump must work because it's pushing oil to the top of the engine and the engine turned over with the turn of the key. So here's the thing. This is gonna get super sketchy. This is the casing which actually goes over the chains. Um, it goes there. And then what you're supposed to do then is put the cylinder heads on each side, which tighten up onto the casing. Which is what we did the first time. The problem is we missed two oil seals out, the top of the head, which caused oil to leak out of the head. So what we're trying to do now is cheat away into putting this back in without having to take the cylinder heads off. You can see the space in the head gasket here where the o-ring should have gone and here on the right hand side as well but looking back to part seven of the build where we lifted the heads onto the engine you can see we clearly missed them out now we've been told by multiple people that this is not possible to put on without taking the heads off which has made us want to be able to do it more let's see how this goes <laughs> The plan is to run some RTV sealing along the top of the heads. This can be used in high temperatures. And also, it's going to help the new O-rings, which were only £8 each from Lamborghini, stick to the top of the heads whilst we hopefully slide in the casing. This sealer says that it's good for martial Argos. Once the O-rings are in place, we're then running the Loctite around the engine block as it states in the manual. We've then got a few O-rings to put in the casing as we've done before. And the next challenge was to try and slide it on without damaging the head gaskets or moving the O-rings. And this thing has to slide on. Because of the pressure of each head, they're trying to push the casing down. So we need to almost push the heads up and then knock it on. This is so sketchy, but this is why we've got this massive bar. Lift it up on the side. No. Yeah. On the car. <laughs> well, hopefully the seals are in place. We got the casing on and all we had to do now is put all the studs back in place along with the nuts as well. Because we had the casing off, we bought another new seal from Lamborghini, which was £47. And that goes just over the crankshaft here. My dad then knocked that into place and we was looking good. But we had to test this thing worked. We started to lift up the engine and then bolt on the water pump. 
Right, it is all on and together. The only thing we haven't got on now is all the auxiliary stuff, like your water pump, your uh, alternator and everything like that. But if we put all that on, then have to take it back off again, it's gonna be annoying. And we can actually test whether the engine is oil tight outside the car, which is what we probably should have done before. And that's what we're about to do now and see if everything's sealed up. Let's do it. So the Mercer Largo engine has a dry sump. It doesn't store all the oil for the engine in the bottom of the sump. It is actually stored in an oil tank on the side of the car. But there's a way for us to cycle oil through the engine without having to connect it up to the car. Down here is the sump and we've connected a hose going round here and back into the sump. And there's around three and a half liters, we believe that cycles through the engine at a time. So we're gonna fill the engine up with three and a half liters of oil and then turn it over. First step, fill the engine up with three and a half liters of oil. Now, because we're doing it outside the car, we won't know whether we've got actual oil pressure because we're not connected up to anything. But if there's no oil leaks, then we know we're sort of on the right track. And now we're gonna connect the battery pack up to the starter motor to turn over the engine. Now this is super sketchy, but it makes much more sense in trying it out the car here than it does putting it back in to find out it doesn't work. So on goes the battery pack to the starter motor, then it's fingers crossed from here. Oh, there we are. Go, keep cranking. And things were looking good. It's looking good. It seems I spoke too soon. Oh, there's oil coming out. No! Oil's coming out. Really? Yeah, that's coming out here. No! One side's all right. This side's absolutely peeing out. Although it looked like we'd sealed one side of the engine up, oil was still leaking out of the right-hand side. So we had no choice but to go again for the second time. Right. Plan is, we're going to put a little bit thicker O-ring in there and hopefully it'll seal it better. But because it's thicker, it's going to be more difficult to get in. We think it might have just displaced on this one because the gasket is just dropping off the head a tiny bit, whereas that side it sits flush. We'll give it another go, we'll check back when we've got it all back together and we'll turn it over again. After we did it this time, we waited 24 hours for the sealant to cure. Okay, here we go, please work this time. This technically counts as round three, and again, it's starting to look okay. Looks like it. Oh, we ain't put the oil filter on. <laughs> <laughs> but this time, we missed out the oil filter. It's on. Here we go. Come on, please. Oh, no, it's the left side now. No way. Oh. It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Third time, look here. So here's the thing. Here's, okay. What we learned is that uh, we should probably take the heads off. And I'm here to help you with that. Yeah, you know? Yeah, I think uh, it's a good job we got Freddie because we've had enough. <laughs> we've, had, we've had enough. It was looking like the inevitable was bound to happen. We were going to have to take the heads off the engine. But that was until I had a message from Sonny at BHP. So this is um, Shimsteel. He's get your row rings in, and you can see how thin that is. And just make sure it's got no sharp edges. And what you do is you compress the O-ring with the Shimsteel, and then gently slide the cover on. And what you should do is if you rubber grease it, it should allow it to all slide in. And once you've got the cover in place, you just slide the Shimsteel out. We're using this bit. We're gonna push the seal up with that and then we're gonna slide it all in and it's all gonna work. Come on. If we don't get it right this time, it's going in the bin. 
it's going in the bin. So we're connecting it back up. Dad's on it with the battery. Oil tub there. We're gonna crank it. Is it? Is this sketchy? This is legit. Oh, this is loose. <laughs> this is loose. <laughs> Come on. Oil's picking up. Come on, Come on Kevin. It's bumping. It's making a weird noise. We're looking good to me. Yeah? yeah? Good. 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 It's ready to go in, come on. I don't know how confident I am, but I think it's good. Let's get the ancillaries on. Get this in the car. It's time to start it. <laughs> it seems it actually worked, but I really wasn't too confident. But thanks Sonny at BHP, that was a real help. That's if it works. So we're just putting on all the ancillaries, which you guys have seen before, but we've got to the part where we're tensioning the belt and Freddie said that it, you're supposed to do it by Hertz. Yeah, so, so Hertz is uh, just a frequency and uh, you're essentially supposed to um, like pluck this like a guitar string and uh, I have a sound analyzer. I don't know if this is gonna work. Like, this sounds like rubbish, but look, it's, it's facts. On the manual, it says the belt resonance frequency reaches 150 hertz plus or minus five hertz. So, okay. 100, was it 155? 155 hertz. So we want that specific tune on that belt, please. Okay. So that looks like 86. It's too low. We need more so. tight. We need more of a ding. Yeah. So we're going tighter to get a higher hertz because it needs to be tuned to perfection. More. It's a bit tight. more. It's so tight. That's insanely tight. 150. 150. There we go. I'm gonna yeah, call it that. Yeah, we good. call it that. Like that yeah. Can yeah. you play the song? Yeah. <laughs> and then we lock it all in place. Next up was the spark plugs. All 12 of them. And Freddie was down to do the honors. And we're so close to bringing this engine back to life. Spark plugs in. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna be sensible this time because last time we did make a mistake but we wouldn't have realized we made a mistake until we started putting everything together. Over in this box is an insane titanium exhaust. Look, we're not gonna show you that just yet until we get it on the car. But the only part of it we need are these bits here, which are gonna go. These are gonna go there, but it's a good job we're gonna put these on now because we'll be struggling to get to it whilst it's in the car. A massive thanks to Carbonize UK for this exhaust, and you guys will be seeing the full thing when we finally get the engine running. But for now, it's just the pipes which connect to the manifold. Exhaust on, let's get it in for the second time. Now this was gonna be a team effort and it is super sketchy. We're lifting the V12 up in the two post ramp and then we have to push the Mercialago towards the engine and at the same time try and tilt it into place. Which is why Liam is standing on top of the gearbox now. And it wasn't long before we finally got it in place. Oh, we're supposed yeah. to celebrate. Uh, three, two, one. Yeah! Yay! Woo! We did it. One. One, two. <laughs> two minutes past one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll carry on in the morning. <laughs> okay. Sweet like a cactus, fruit on a summer's day. The next morning, the vibes were high. Today was the day we finally get to start the Mercial Argo engine for the first time in seven years. Come on! <laughs> we were gonna do the bare minimum to get this thing started, which meant connecting up the lines to the starter motor, the oil lines to the sump, and the fuel lines to the fuel rail. Along with that, there's a bunch of electrical connections that will need to be connected in order to start the car. Last time I filled the oil up on this, I put all the oil through the engine there, which was wrong. 
It takes 11 litres, but according to the manual, you're only supposed to pour three litres of oil inside the engine and then the other eight in the tank there. So that's the correct way of doing it. So we're going to do that. In goes eight litres of oil into the separate oil tank. And then three litres of oil into the actual engine. So I noticed the DDE guys as well wanted to crank over the engine to make sure they had oil pressure before they started, which is exactly what I'm going to do. To do so, there is two fuel uh, relays here, which you can unplug at the back. Uh, that's going to stop the engine fueling, so it's just going to crank over and hopefully we see on the dashboard that we have some sign of oil pressure. Thanks DDE guys for showing us that. Let's see if we've got any oil pressure. Now we wasn't quite sure how much oil pressure we should have just when the engine's cranking. Yeah, here we go. But any is better than none. We've not got six bar, but we've got some bar. I, I, think, I think we're good. Like, look, you wanna see it? No. I was just looking to see if it leaked any oil out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did, did not le nothing's leaking. No. Have you looked underneath the car? No. <laughs> one step closer now to add some fresh fuel in it and get one of you guys to start it remember someone who bought the save the manual hoodie or t-shirt will be coming down to turn the key for the first time and hannah found us a winner hello, hello is that lee it is, yeah. yeah you are it's matt armstrong calling hello. you're right a bit of a random one and we're hoping you can we're wondering whether you're able to pop, pop down and do the first turn of the key of the Mercer Largo. <laughs> you're joking. No. <laughs> do you think it's possible? Congratulations, Lee. You bought a Saber Manual t-shirt. It is coming down to do the first turn of the Lamborghini Mercer Largo key. Let's hope it starts for him and for us. Lee mentioned that he was actually able to travel down after he finished work in the evening, which left us with around three hours to actually make sure this thing was going to start when he turned the key. First thing we checked was a spark, and from the looks of it, it seems we had a spark at the spark plugs. I then checked the fuel, which seemed to be pumping, but when we turned over the car, it didn't even attempt to fire. So we've got no spark. No, we have got a spark, but at the wrong time, maybe. Or no fuel, the injectors are going in. There's a possibility we could have flooded the engine, so we took out a spark plug to check. Oh yeah, that sparked, and it nearly went. Why did it nearly go then? I think it would flooded a bit. I think, yeah, when we tried to get the, when we've wound the fuel round. So the fuel, flooded it a bit. Yeah, should we take all the plugs out and turn it? Yeah. Ah, so when I was turning it to get the oil pressure, now I the disconnected fuel the attached. fuel. Just as a precaution, we took all the spark plugs out and cleaned all the old fuel off them, just in case we did flood the cylinders. Let's get them on and get ready for Lee. We've got half an hour, so hopefully get this thing ready for Lee to start and do the first, well, basically the first start, really. After cleaning the spark plugs, checking the fuel, we put everything back together. Apart from this time, we took the rear wheel off so we could put the battery pack directly to the battery for extra power. Ooh. What do you think? It's got to go in there. It's trying, isn't it? It's got to go. Should we just leave it for Lee? Should we leave it for Lee now? You think that'll go if it keeps I going? I think it'll go. The only thing the throttle bodies ain't working. The only thing you're putting your foot on the throttle, it's not doing anything. I don't think they'll work like that. I think it's got to run and then to be able to get so that you can open the throttle. Okay. We're waiting for Lee now. He'll be here in 10 minutes. So this is it. Months of work. And we're about to find out whether we did this thing right. Because if we didn't, We'd find out now. So this is Lee and Fred, Jeff, yeah. and Sarah, and they've come to do the first turn of the key of the Mercer Lago. I hope it, I hope it starts. <laughs> I hope it starts. So, right, we're just going to go straight at it. Do you want to? It's going to be loud, I think, because we just the exhaust is just coming straight out. 
keep it running if it if it runs. We're not sure if the throttle bodies are gonna work or not, but just if it if it runs, just yeah, let it run and then we'll shout you if you to turn it off. <laughs> Brother. So you have to press the immobiliser first. Yep. And then turn the thing. I don't know whether you're gonna have to give it any throttle or what, but here we go. Let me get in first. Yeah, <laughs> get in. Do you think it's gonna start? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> and then press the button on the immobiliser. Okay. <laughs> okay, we've got something. Keep it cranked. Go on. Yeah, it's too slow. All right, we'll wait for the charge. We'll wait for the charge. It's going. It's nearly there. It's it's <laughs> sparking. It was it's shooting flames out. <laughs> oh no, that's a good thing. <laughs> I think we're gonna do it. This go. If not, we've got to take all the plugs out again, and it's flooded it. <laughs> okay, keep it cranked. We might have to immobilise it again. Press the immobiliser button. Let's do it. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> it started. It started at least. <laughs> well, thanks, Lee. <laughs> did it just come off and switch itself off then, did it? Did it just... As it was as it was dying down, Yeah. I pressed the accelerate again, and it was just dying down, and I, right, it, it just died. Just yeah. okay. Lee didn't want to be responsible for blowing up the car, yeah. so the next attempt was done by me. Well, that's as far as that started. Then. That's, uh, have we got to rebuild it again? <laughs> I'm probably going to end up doing one thing, then having to undo that to do another thing. The one thing that I want to get done is get this car running to temperature. So to run it to temperature, we need coolant. And to put coolant in, we need all the coolant lines in. So I think that's where I'm going to start. And then we'll move on from there. Well, actually, what I'm going to start by doing is removing the rear bumper. And you'll find out why later. But it does make it easier to access some other parts, like the bracket to hold the rear diff to the subframe. There's one long bolt which goes through the diff and the bush, and then two brackets either side which secure it to the frame. But then we ran into a problem only Mercer Largos would have. Here's the issue, okay? Lamborghini make these things. Instead of making things which fit the car, they just make a generic bracket and then add shims so i tighten this up with no shims my dad's doing the front and now you can see that this bracket is so far away from the actual holes it needs to be in because the diff has pulled the engine backwards so i need to put some shims in the back so <laughs> you could get this yeah let's shim the whole car <laughs> so now i've got to loosen off the brackets that i've just tightened up just enough so my dad can get the bolts in for the gearbox bracket and then when it's at the right height Add in the shims which are actually from Lamborghini. Surely this is only a Lamborghini thing, but I don't know, maybe Ferraris are the same as well. But there is one thing that we've left disconnected. One thing that is missing is the transmission tube which connects from the gearbox here to the front diff there, which makes it 
four wheel drive. But apparently these drive better, rear wheel drive, less strain on the clutch, they're lighter weight of course, and you can get rid of the front diff and all the drive shafts as well. So I'm gonna order a kit for that, but for now, I think we can just drive it, well, hopefully, without that transmission tube in. And to make it drive, all I've got to do is connect up the rear drive shafts, both sides to the rear diff. And when we get the rear wheel drive conversion kit, I can remove the front diff as well. And with that done, it's now time to work out where all the coolant lines go and everything else that goes in the engine bay. Remember, we never took this car apart. And because we didn't take it apart, it makes it a lot harder to put it back together. But now the coolant lines are all connected from the engine to the radiators. And my dad and Freddie are starting to fill up the cooling system with coolant, of course. I think all the fluids are now in the engine. Power steering fluid. We also have just filled the coolant. Hopefully now it runs to temperature. And fingers crossed, no coolant is going in the combustion chamber. Because if there is, then there's going to be a hell of a lot of smoke. Ready? Yeah. First time! Oh, and it idles good. It's good! It's idling good! But wait, that smoke you see there is unburnt fuel, which could mean many things. One possibility is that the timing is out, meaning the inlet or exhaust valves are opening at a completely wrong time. Another possibility could be faulty oxygen sensors. These get a reading of the O2 coming out of the engine, the reading goes to the ECU, and then the ECU can tell the fuel injectors how much fuel to inject or not inject. But there could be a fault with any one of these components. And it seems that's the case because it started running lumpy. It's just having a rev off at the minute. It's just doing its own thing. And then shortly started misfiring. I think that side's missing. Whoa! Turn it off. Turn it off. So right banks. No, not, now it's now it's doing it on both. I think uh, these need to get it relearned. Yeah. Um, for sure. And uh, I would put it on a diagnostic because um, there's something something's going on with. Sometimes the, the fuel it likes it. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't like it. Why are we on fire? <laughs> now, in order to know what's going on, the Lamborghini needs a tool called LDAS, a special diagnostic tool, which of course I don't have. I only have my Autel, which plugs into the OBD port, so we're just going to try that to see if we can get any basic readings. And we did. An issue with the throttle position sensor, but the one we want to look at is cylinder 2, fuel injection short to ground. And after looking, it seems we have an issue with the wiring to the fuel injectors. It looks like after the years of being on track, the wiring's got really hot and fragile. So my dad went in to repair all the frayed wires and the ones that were broken on the loom lead into the fuel injectors. And we tried again. But still, it was running lumpy as anything. And the same fault codes as before. This then led us to think that it could potentially be a faulty fuel injector. So we went to check. If, if it's the injector, why didn't they pick it up? Yeah. And that's true. In part eight of the build, we sent the fuel injectors off to Artec to be tested, have new baskets and seals put in them. And all of them were running fine. So it seemed weird that it would be a faulty fuel injector. But the best way for us to check that is to switch fuel injector number two over with fuel injector number one and then see if the fault code follows it. So that's what we're doing now. We also slotted a small camera underneath just to see if all the injectors were seated right as well. And they were. So let's try it for the third time. Cylinder two again. Cylinder two again? Yeah, so it's wiring or you put the same injector back in. <laughs> still no luck. And the fault was still with cylinder two. But we can't be 100% sure that the Autel is giving us the correct reading as it's not the proper Lamborghini tool. But then we had another idea. So on this engine, they have two engine ECUs, one at the front here, one at the back. And they control each bank. One controls one bank on one side, one controls the other, and you will see, 
Thank you, Kevin. You will see there is a white tag and a yellow tag. And in the engine, you can see things with, I think that's a white tag. And th no, that was a yellow tag. And then things with a white tag here. And if they're on wrong, the whole engine will be miscommunicating. So I think, should I just switch them around? Cylinder two won't be cylinder two now. If they're oh yeah, because it could be cylinder 10. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm going to switch these round and see if that's the issue. Okay, so what I've done here now, I've moved the yellow tags to this ECU and then the white tags to the back ECU. I can't see it working, but... It might. And then fired up and sounded a lot better than before. Let it run. It almost sounded like it was learning. And the idle got better as time went on. It seems to be running a bit better. I unplugged one of the throttle bodies to see if it was actually working. It started to rev up, so it's like the other ones were compromising for the unplugged throttle body, which is good news. It means it was communicating with everything. It sounded, it sounded good now. It started to idle good, so it was time to rev it. <laughs> I think we'd finally cracked it. The Mercer Largo was running perfectly. But there's still so much more to do. But it just feels amazing that we actually managed to do it against all odds. But it's time to crack on with some more. My whole love for Mercer Largos has literally came from the sound of them. They sound like a Formula One car. <laughs> But when Lamborghini use this as their standard exhaust system, it literally kills the sound. This is so heavy and it, it's, it kills it. But we have a solution for that. Well, I hope we have a solution for that. It might be too loud, I don't know. But it looks mental. That's so heavy. Ugh. Drop it, drop it. That is insanely heavy. Inside here, is the rest of the titanium exhaust which I got from Carbonize UK and these guys oh! I'm not gonna show you that bit yet these guys have killed it wait until you see this center section of the exhaust which we're gonna show you in a minute first off we need to get these bits on so it's out with the old and in with the new God only knows what this old back box has been through the bottom half is on to an extent it's all loose because we don't really know how to line it up without the bumper on yet but there is a top half to this and also there's valves which work on a vacuum which open it and close it right now they are closed which will technically make the exhaust quieter because it's going to push air up through here to the silencers which are over here wait till you see these yes look at that MA logo in the middle, two silences. I'm not sure how much of a job that's gonna do, but that is absolutely mental. And Chris, I will take that from you. Do the honors. Oh, oh look at it. Do that again, I'll do that again. Go. Oh, wasn't as good that time. Go. We both then lined it up to the rest of the exhaust. And of course, because it was titanium, cleaned off any dirt and then stood back and admired. That looks absolutely unreal i well and truly am living my dream right now i can't believe it one last thing left to do is to connect up the vacuum lines to open and close the valves they both connect to each other and then use a t-piece which we need to guide through the car somehow but we'll save that for later and then they go into this box which is connected to power and then with a the button we can open and close the valves there it goes they open very slowly don't they Ready? Yeah. 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 Okay, that's review it. That's closed. That's a ten. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving it a five. Out of five. Thank you. <laughs> right. You ready, Chris? I was born ready. 
This is going to be so loud. Do you know what, actually? Are you actually pulling it? Yeah, I'm scared. Oh, you're. <laughs> yeah, immobilise. Okay. Ready? Yeah. for that oh my god that That's is sick. so screwy <laughs> <laughs> that was nuts but the reason why i took the bumper off in the first place was to fix the wiring for the fan if you remember in a previous video we found out that the track experience company had hardwired the fan to be on constantly obviously to keep it cool during the track days i didn't want it to be on all the time so i've had to get two new connectors and then wire them in to the wiring loop and with that done it's now time to start putting all the body panels back on the car starting with the rear bumper all of the panels on this are carbon fiber or a form of fiber gas but that doesn't mean they're light. Everything is still pretty heavy and fits in weird and wonderful ways. Just look at the rear quarter. Look how much it flexes. But that's why I love Merchelagos. There's an issue. Um, so this exhaust uh, is for an LP model. Thought it'd be exactly the same. But looks like these are the exhaust tips. And I'll put the bumper on to line them up. When I put them on, they are a little bit too short so we could be setting fire to the actual bumper uh, <laughs> i think they're meant to be out here but they're like all the way down there so yeah i'll put them on now because i really want to drive the car but yeah flames is not a good idea when it's uh, there i think they need to be literally i think here is probably the best bet but it's okay we could get these lengthened and uh jobs are good in but oh well it's what it is let's carry on with all that on, I could then put on the rear panel, which houses the number plate lights. But I'm pretty sure I'm missing a few parts out of this, but we'll get to that in a later video. And then the hardware for the bat wings on the back, which open up for extra cooling into the radiators. On goes the centre brake light, and then the carbon air boxes, which sit on the side of the engine here. It's starting to look complete now. I've got to connect the hoses from the throttle bodies to the carbon air boxes, which we don't have air filters for as of yet. But again, we've got time to get that in a later video. I just wanted to get this car driving out of the unit for now. Then last but not least, me and my dad put on the boot lid. We are now just got to the final thing to get this thing moving after it's had a new clutch is bleed the clutch. Dad's looking for the handle, it is literally here. So, we need to add clutch fluid, which should be under here, I think. There it is. Yeah, how <laughs> do you feel that? I'm through this hole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's the reservoir. That was definitely an afterthought, wasn't it? <laughs> They've definitely put that in for, oh, how are we going to top up the fluid? And then they've just got a hole saw and just hole sawed through the car, aren't they? <laughs> so all the brakes and everything, all the fluid is going to have to be changed. I'm planning on changing the brakes and doing the suspension, but for now, we just want to get this thing driving. So you watching it go? keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. So the idea is to get all the air out of the clutch the hydraulic line which pushes the clutch over oh we still haven't put the handbrake on but we don't need that to drive it okay so there's a bleed up there's a bleed nipple all the way at the top 
really hard to see, but there's a bleed nipple at the top. We're going to crack that. I'm going to pump the pedal. Fluid's going to go down this till all the air comes out and we should be able to get a clutch. Fingers crossed. Come on, young man. Right, I've pressed it down. Yeah. Yeah. I continue to push yeah. the clutch down whilst my dad opens the bleed yeah. nipple, lets the air out, then locks it, and then I can lift the clutch back up until all the air's out. Oh! Yeah! Get it down. Feels good. There's one final piece to go on right here, and it's the most important piece of the car. The gate for the gated manual. And of course the gear knob. Now that I had a clutch pedal, we should be able to move it. I was getting so excited to drive the Mercial Argo for the first time, just the final pieces to go. Yes! Oh! We lowered the car down, right put the ignition on. But after starting it, we realized we had another problem. It seems like the clutch wasn't engaging enough for me to put it in any gear. What about if it's not going to go first? Maybe we bled it wrong. No. Right, second. Oh, nearly lost. <laughs> How about second? <laughs> I've got no clutch. No. No clutch. Well, it seems we have an issue with the clutch. Um, and we pump it. <laughs> See if we get anything. No. Flipping clutch! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so close to being driven. Will she start up first time? No. Why do I feel like this is a regular look for Merchant Lago owners? <laughs> the clutch is actually engaging it a little bit, I can tell, because we're on a hill now, and I'm in fourth gear and it's locked. But if I press the clutch down, start moving. So it is engaging a little bit. Let's investigate further. On a manual car, we have a flywheel, a clutch plate, and a clutch cover. The flywheel spins with the engine. And when the clutch is clamped to the flywheel by the clutch cover, that will also be spinning with the engine, which sends drive to the transmission. But to change gear, we need to be able to release the clutch from the flywheel. And this is done by a release bearing. When you push the clutch pedal, the release bearing should push against the springs, which then should release the clutch from spinning against the flywheel, allowing you to put the car into gear. Now the clutch pedal is connected to the release bearing with a hydraulic line, which has fluid in it. If there's any air in that hydraulic line, it might not be releasing the clutch enough for me to put it in gear. Underneath the bonnet is the reservoir here, which also does the brakes, but this line, which is just there, um, that is your clutch line. So if the fluid isn't higher than that clutch line then we could get air into it and when i'm pushing the throttle i'm just when i'm pushing the clutch it could just be pushing air down the line which will give us a spongy pedal and not engage the clutch so i'm gonna fill this up a little bit more just to make sure and then we're gonna go again there's a little cutout in the top of the Mercial Largo, which allows me to fill the reservoir up with some DOT4 fluid. Then we're going to be using this device here to help me bleed the system a second time. It screws onto the reservoir, then inside the bottle we're going to add some more DOT4 fluid. And once we've got a bit of fluid in there, the other line of the bottle takes pressure off the air in the tyre. So now there's air pressure from the air in the tyre going directly into the bottle, which is pushing DOT4 fluid into the brake and clutch reservoir, giving us full pressure. So now I'm going to raise it up and hopefully, if we crack off the bleed nipple, it will get as much air out of the system as possible. Now there's full pressure in the system, when I crack the bleed nipple up here on top of the gearbox, it should push any air that's in the system out of it. And I'm just cracking that bleed nipple now. 
There was a few little air bubbles, but now it is only fluid, which is exactly what we needed. So I can tighten the bleed nipple back up and go and test the clutch. Right, round two. Here we go. Come on. Moment of truth. Yeah! I've got gear. I'm in first gear. I'm in first gear, come on! Let's see if we can go reverse. No! I still can't get reverse. Get first gear. It is really stiff. Verdicts could be we're not getting enough clutch, so hopefully there is a adjustment on the pedal to bring the pedal higher up. Um, I'll have a look. You can see at the top of the pedal, it does have a little bit of play in it, but there is an adjustment that you can make. I've just got to loosen off the lock nut and then wind out the pedal, which will take that little bit of play out of it. And hopefully now the release bearing will push the springs enough so it can disengage the clutch, but we'll find out. So there is literally now no play in the clutch. And if I can't get a clutch now, we either need to bleed it again, or there could be an issue with the clutch. Come on. This is the time. Okay. We're running. Moosey go in. <laughs> first gear, first gear. First gear. Oh my god, it could actually work. Third gear. I think it's done it. Reverse, reverse. Reverse. Yes! Again, again. Yeah! The clutch adjustment might have just done it. Reverse. Let's see if we get a reverse one more. Yes! I think we, I think it's working! Come on! We finally cracked it. We've got gears. But there is one more problem with the gear stick. So it doesn't quite go into the bottom gears very well in the gate. And it sits nicely in the gate in the top gears, but not in the bottom. Now this explains the reason why the previous owners cut a hole in the center console so they could access the gear linkage and they could move the gear linkage forward and backwards so then you could get this absolutely perfect. But I think there's another way which is Probably going to be easier than stripping apart his centre console again and getting to that hole. It all makes sense now. This is the reason why we found that hole which was cut out the body of the car by the previous owners. It was to access this gear linkage here to adjust it so you could get the lever sitting perfectly central in the gated zone. But we think there's another way. There's four bolts which are underneath the lever. We're going to loosen them off along with some of the other mounting parts underneath. Then I'm gonna get inside. I'll go sit in the car now, try and get the gear stick in line, and then we'll lock it back in place. This might work, or it might not, but it's worth a try. That's where it needs to be, there. I held the gear stick in place whilst my dad tightened up the bolts underneath. And that is perfectly in and we didn't even need to cut a hole in the center console. <laughs> Remember how we found the Ford logo on these indicators and later found out they were off a Mark I Ford Focus. Well, check out this. The only thing Lamborghini about this is, <laughs> well, that badge. For a new AC display, it's gonna cost you from Lamborghini £1,513. So I really hope this one's going to work when I turn the car on. But to be honest, I wouldn't be too bothered if it decided not to work. Check this out. The Rover 45 uses the exact same air conditioning unit. It is exactly the same as the Lamborghini. And if I wanted to buy the AC unit out of a Rover, it would only cost me €24.20. But wait. It gets better than that. This is the interior of a Pagani Zonda. Millions of pounds worth of car. And look what climate control they're using as well. The exact same one they use in the Mercia Largo and <laughs> the Rover 45. 
Maybe there was one big discount parts bin for these AC displays at the time. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, we're moving in the right direction now. Another thing that we need, which was quite expensive. The handbrake, which is actually on the right hand side. They do everything backwards in these Mercer Largos. The, the seat belt is on your left hand side and then the handbrake is on your right hand side. This car didn't come with a handbrake. I had to buy one second hand. And here it is. This thing was 1,000 pounds. And I dread to think what other cars this handbrake was used on. But unfortunately, I couldn't cross-reference any part numbers on this. So maybe it is Lamborghini only. The cable is held in with this little knob and a split pin. And then the handbrake slots down the right-hand side of the driver's seat. There's a little spade connector, which is for the handbrake light on the dashboard, which tells you when the handbrake's on or off. And then it's just a simple case of bolting it all in. And of course, to put all the lever over the top of it as well. And this lever works in a weird way. Way. But before I show you that, we've got to connect all the cables up. There is a separate caliper for the handbrake and the cable slides into it and is held in with a little C-clip. We've still got a lot of work to do on the suspension and all the suspension arms, but for now, that's the least of our worries. We want to get this thing moving. Now you can see the root of this handbrake cable. It goes from the caliper, through the diff mounting brackets, goes alongside the engine and then connects up underneath. And I think this is why the handbrake was expensive. Actually, no, the handbrake was expensive because it's Lamborghini. But you pull it up like that, uh, and then it goes all floppy, even though that should be... Solid. Yeah, that's solid. And then to get it off, you have to, I think, pull it up, press the button down, and then down. Yeah. Yeah. Working handbrake. I think it's ready to drive. I've never wanted a car to start up and drive so much in my life. This whole journey has been incredible. We won't be able to drive the car far though as the tires are really old and there's still a lot more to do to get it roadworthy. But to rebuild my dream car from the state it was in with my dad means so much. And even if it only manages to roll out my unit, that's a huge achievement. Hard work really does beat talent. Look, I don't want to talk. How you try and press the kid and read it, you was soft. Pedal to the metal, you ain't catching me in park I just need to stop, I don't wanna speak Talking all that good, so I just hit you with the please Running up the score like Tyreek, I'm going deep Watch me how I'm saucing, I be spreading it with ease First time driving any Mercer Largo And it's my one that I've rebuilt with my dad This is... This is special. Be even perplexed, cause I don't really see nobody close to me. Hopefully, I wish I could open it up, but we can only drive it through the car park. So it's first gear, maybe second gear. Yes! <laughs> Gifted with a vision and precision. I'm just trying to make it high key. Might be breaking free like I was on in some Nikes. Uh, tough, tough, tough. This is not making beats and spitting crack versus pretty likely. Yeah. Oh, it says I got off tank now. Some kids, but pretty now got these arrows peeping at your boobs. How you try and press the kid and really you was soft. All you know is capping, homie, you don't know the law. Pedal to the metal, you ain't catching me in park. I just hit the stop. I don't want to sit with ease. You gonna see the peace. You gonna see the. We've got a few faults and a few things which I don't know. It's Italian, but. The airbag lights on. I don't know why the airbag lights on. We've got we're gaining fuel. <laughs> We've got more fuel. Uh, oil pressure's looking good. Oil temps looking good. And we've now done three miles since we've uh, had the engine running. But another thing, it keeps thinking that the driver's door is open when it's closed. The good thing, we get all gears. But as we was driving back we struck a problem. We're getting an oil light coming on, which is not good. Um, only comes on sometimes. 
if I rev it, you can see the oil pressure. So, oh, look, the oil light. As soon as I come down on the revs, as soon as it sits here, oil light goes on. Oil light comes on. Like, there's no oil pressure at low RPM. Definitely doesn't seem good. It's definitely something not good. I don't know how long that lasted, but it was good whilst it lasted, but we could be low on oil, so let's just give that a check first. I think I think it might just be low. It didn't look like it was leaking or anything. I don't think it, I don't think it was smoking either. It just smoked a bit when I pulled off the one time, yeah. I don't think there's any oil coming out, but we've got low we well an oil light keep flashing on and off, which either could be oil pressure's low. The oil pump that we rebuilt is well, <laughs> we don't know whether that's good or not, but that was, it could just be low oil, so we're just gonna check the the oil now and then if that works go out again oh my god this is red hot ah, should be warm enough now to check them off there's loads in it let me see if it'll start again will it start after driving it will it have charged the battery <laughs> the answer is no <laughs> i don't know i wonder if the the oil switch is okay just the, the actual switch on the, oh, right. like, because yeah, that yeah. could be at fault, couldn't it? It looks like I've still got a little bit more to solve. The battery's not charging, and I'm hoping this oil issue isn't going to be something drastically bad, but touch wood. So last time, we actually got the engine running and driving, but we had an issue with oil pressure. There's a whole lot of the oil light. As soon as I come down on the revs, oil light comes on. Like, there's no oil pressure at low... RPM, but we think we've solved the issue. First time, first time. <laughs> there she goes. After speaking to a Lamborghini specialist, we're told our issue could be to do with the oil grade. Although Lamborghini recommend a 5W40 for this engine, that actually could be too thin. So what we're doing now is draining all the 5W40 out and we're going to replace it with a thicker grade of oil. The oil cooler is right behind this wheel so it only gets cooling when the Mercia Largo is rolling and because we left it outside for a while not rolling, it wasn't really cooling the oil so the oil gets really hot, really thin and that causes a low oil pressure. So we think the thicker oil should solve this. Not only does the oil need changing, the oil filter does as well. And this filter is only available to get from Lamborghini Direct. And the oil we have got from eBay. Miller's oil, and this time we're gonna use 10W50 as opposed to 5W40 that they tell you should be used for this, but we think maybe a thicker oil could work. Stop, let me explain this in more simple terms. I hope I get it right. So these are the two oils in question. This part of the oil is when the engine is cold and this part of the oil is when the engine is hot. When the engine is cold, 5W is gonna travel through faster than 10W because this oil is thinner. And when the engine is hot, 40 is gonna travel through faster than 50 because the oil is thinner. Thinner oil is lower oil pressure, Thicker oil is going to cause more oil pressure. Could go wrong, could go right, but we'll see. Now I've got to put eight and a half litres of oil in the oil canister and three and a half litres of oil in the actual engine. Remember, this engine has a dry sump. Oil's in. We're only going to find out whether that works probably towards the end of the video when we start it. Actually, the next time we run it, run it it's probably going to be at Gumball. So hopefully it works. Next step is, of course, this car used to be four-wheel drive. The front diff is up here with uh, the drive, cap drive shafts connected to the two front wheels and the gearbox is in the center there and driver seat's there, passenger seat's there, gear shift is in the middle. The thing which connects the gearbox to the front diff is like a tube with a prop shaft in the middle. But we want to make this two-wheel drive because it's going to be more leery, it's going to be lighter, there's less strain on the clutch. But to do that, we can't just leave this thing hanging because the engine and the gearbox actually rest on this steel bar here. So, we've got a solution. 
But first, we've got to remove the drive shafts out of the front diff. That's because this diff is no longer needed. Then there's two bolts mounting it to the car. And turns out there's nuts on the other end of it. So I'm sending my dad up in the air so he can get the other end of the bolt to make sure it doesn't spin when I'm loosening it from the bottom. And then finally, the diff can be removed. Look at all the weight that we're saving here. Then we've got to remove the drive shafts from the actual wheel hub, which is just held in with one bolt. More weight saving. Left side and the right side is out. Then instead of a prop shaft, we have this bit of aluminium here, which bolts to the gearbox. But we still need something to support the weight of the engine in the gearbox, which is what this mount does here. This bolts to the chassis of the car each side and then has a bushing in the center. A bolt will go through that bushing into the new aluminium piece which will take the weight of the engine and the gearbox to stop it from sitting on that steel frame. That mount is now in, but because there's no drive shafts now, there's nothing supporting the actual wheel bearings in there. So we need something to hold the wheel bearings. That's why they send these titanium stub axles, which then go in the back. We can tighten the wheel bearings up onto that and that should be job done. These things are gonna replicate a drive shaft but without the weight of a drive shaft. When we tighten the bolt there, the wheel bearing is supported from the back. And that is the rear wheel drive conversion complete. Right, now that we've removed all that weight, it's gonna make the car sit higher. There's a solution for that as well. We've just gotta fit it. Coilovers, ones which sit extra low, which also have the nose lift bit on the bottom. So if you notice, uh, these are the standard suspension. They do adjust, they can go lower, but these are absolutely soaked because the fluid from the nose lift, which makes the car lift up, is actually leaking from there. Apparently it's quite a common issue, but the problem is with the nose lift fluid, it's also the power steering fluid. So with that leaking, you also start losing power steering. So going on the gumball with that leaking is probably not a good idea. So we have these, which were a small fortune. In fact, my first deposit on the house was the same amount as these coilovers, but I hope they're worth it. You can see here how wet the standard suspension has got from the fluid that's been leaking out of it. As for the rear suspension, it's a little different. They have two shock absorbers on there. And you can see the stock springs are made by IBAC. And I can almost put money on it that the shocks are made by Bilstein. There isn't much that's actually Lamborghini on this car. How much smaller the new suspension is, which is going to let it sit lower, it's lighter. I just hope that it's going to ride better. But we're about to find that out because now both shock absorbers and springs are installed on the back. I've got a new high pressure hose which fits into the front nose lift because these take a lot of pressure to raise the front. So I wasn't taking any risks with the old one. And that is the new suspension installed. Okay, suspension is on, front and rear. It's definitely looking like it's gonna be a lot lower, but we won't find out just yet because the next thing that we need to change are these terrible brakes. We've done a bit of research and apparently we can upgrade the rear brakes by just increasing the size of the disc. And that's why we've bought this bigger disc on the back here. It's the same size as the front disc. This caliper is the braking caliper. This caliper is the handbrake caliper. We're trying to go from a 335 millimeter disc to a 355 millimeter disc. As long as there's clearance, we're good. Handbrake. Uh, yeah, that was non-existent. So do the new brake discs work with the old calipers? <laughs> no. They don't work. It seems there wasn't enough clearance for them. So whilst we're waiting to solve the issue with the rear brakes, we've got a solution for the front brakes. Well, we think we've got a solution. There's no bolt in this brake. What? There's no bolt holding this brake on. Well, the, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not surprised at this point. Yeah. <laughs> this is why we do our pre-inspections for Gumball because there's there's one bolt holding this brake on. 
And after this, it just starts getting worse. Everything starts to go wrong. Now we're taking the standard discs off and trying to fit some bigger brake discs, which we have a conversion kit for. These are the brake discs of the LP640, the later model Merchelago, and we need bigger calipers for them to work. So to make the new calipers work, we need a bracket. And what this is gonna do is these are gonna go in the stock holes because the new caliper has a wider mounting point. This bracket bolts into the standard wheel hub and then the new caliper will bolt onto that bracket. Everything's going well so far, but on goes the new caliper. This is an eight piston caliper. The same calipers that I use on Lamborghini Gallardos, Audi RS3s and Audi R8s. I put in brand new brake pads in it and then I realized there's a problem. The brake pad is only like here and the rest of the disc is free and the, the rest of the pad is, you can see it's not even on the disc. It's this caliper needs to go further on or the disc needs to be bigger. When we spoke to the guy who made the conversion kit, he seems to think that my early model Merchelago won't work with the kit, which now leaves us with no brakes for Gumball. Hello, you all right? I don't, this is going to be such a long shot. Um, have you got any brake pads in stock for my Merchelago? We now have no choice but to call Lamborghini and try and get some stock discs and pads in time for Gumball. You can't get them tomorrow, can you? No, not now, because he's going to have to cut off, cut off his one o'clock. Right. I, I to. Okay. Um, okay, no worries. So, it looks like nobody... We're going to have to resort back to standard brakes and discs, but we can't put... There's no way we can put these back on, because they're just terrible. And the brake pads... Look at the brake pads. They're, they're just so thin. So, we've tried to upgrade stuff. Every time we try and upgrade stuff, normally it goes wrong. So now, somehow we need to find some brake pads for Mercial Argo. Check back in a minute. Right, so my dad is actually going to a breaker's yard now to see if we can just get some second hand brake pads and discs for this Mercial Argo. It's our only other option. Gumball is tomorrow and the car still looks like this. Exhaust tips. We have some, we've just got to fit them. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do now. Please do not tell me that this is gonna go wrong as well. It's just exhaust tips. Let's do it. Oh. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Oh, I know what I'm doing. We also think that this battery is no good. So, we have another new one which we got off eBay for a decent price. For some reason they put it in the arch. Here we go. And the good news, we found some brakes. These are, are all stock Mercialago brakes, a bit, they're second hand and at least they've got brake pads. So um, we've got at least something to go on now. So we now have second hand brake discs and pads on the rear and the same on the front but it's better than what we had these are ford focus mark one indicators we don't like the amber we've gone for clear ones off of ford focus and this was i'm sure it was a couple of quid the things on the screen now let's change these over clear lenses decent with the brakes sorted we started the car to see if we had any oil pressure issues the oil pressure looked fine but it looks like we had an oil leak. We put a bit of talcum powder around the engine to see if we could identify where it was coming from. And the news did not get better. It looks like those O-rings probably didn't hold up. They were hold up for a bit and now it looks like they're leaking again. Um, I don't know what we're gonna have to do. The trailer comes in about. The trailer comes in 15 minutes to pick the car up. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets worse. It seems we also have a coolant leak as well. But we literally have no time. We've got to take the car as it is. How long have we got left, Tony? We ain't. We ain't. <laughs> <laughs> the trailer is already turned up and we've still got a fair bit to do. Of course, the badge was important. 
Excuse me, sir. Do you know why I called you? What? Is my car on fire? A number plate equally as important. I let Hannah get this one right. Now we need the wheels. Now these wheels aren't the ones I originally ordered from Wheelmania. I've got some from Vossen, which you'll probably see later on in the video. I've had to buy these because if we were fitting those bigger brakes, they wouldn't have fit over the brakes. But now that we don't have the brakes, we could have used the stock wheels, but instead we've got these wheels. But these wheels are temporary. Let's put them on. Hopefully they work. <laughs> and I have to say a special thanks for Wheelmania for sorting the tires out for these wheels, even though they are only temporary ones. And they will be for sale after I've got the Vossens on the car. But the car is just about ready for the road. We went over to DTB Motorsport to get the aircon gassed. And then we needed one more thing. Aircon is gassed. Next stop, fuel. We drove it here. It was very, very questionable. The tracking's out. The brakes aren't fantastic. And I can see why we got told to upgrade them. It makes a weird hooing noise, it's, it's doesn't haunted. it? It's haunted. It's like, Yeah, it goes woo <laughs> when you drive it for some reason. I don't know why. Other than that, it's great. So yeah. let's fill this up, get it on the trailer. See you guys in Edinburgh. Did you put a new battery in this? Brand new battery. Wow. Garage with a jumper pack, we broke down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else? No, just a jumper pack. So it looks like we have a charging issue, or maybe just a bad connection somewhere, but we have no time to fix this. The car is going on the trailer now and being sent up to Edinburgh, where the starting grid is for the gumball. car arrived in Edinburgh. There she is. <laughs> we were keen to look at how much fluid had leaked out of it and when we got underneath it only looked like coolant was on the floor. Yeah it is coolant, it is coolant. The oil leak's not solved but the water leak we may be able to solve it with K-Seal and if this works this is the best promotion for K-Seal ever. Shake bottle vigorously for 30 seconds, add to radiator or overflow tank Leak will stop within a few minutes after engine reaches optimal temperature. We'll give Guaranteed. it a go. Yeah, yeah, we'll give it a go. <laughs> oh my day. Oh, no way. That's gone. <laughs> is that the top? Now, this really isn't advisable to do, especially on a Lamborghini engine. But desperate needs cause for desperate measures. We think the coolant is just seeping out the water pump yeah, housing. Did you put all of it in? Yeah. All of that? It's and we're hoping this K-Seal will yeah. just seal up the gap so we can start this gumball rally. And we just got to get it to temperature now. Coolant's up to temperature. One fan's on, the other one hasn't come on. The other, I don't know what's happening with that one. But, no water leak so far. If that fixes the water leak, K-Seal, shout out, well done K-Seal, if that works. As the trekking was so far out, I decided to adjust it to the best I could to get both the front wheels facing forward. It's no Manti alignment, but it's a lot better than it was before. So just to put it into perspective for you guys, these are the types of cars that are coming. Absolutely immaculate, almost brand new Lamborghinis. And oh, oh my God, there's so many different cars. Our Mercy Largo is gonna stand out like it's sort of, there's a Chiron. <laughs> and for some reason, people wanted to have photos with me. And even photos with my dad. Maybe he's the true superstar. Here it is. The fully stickered up. Where should I go? In? Ten times better now. Moving a fiction, swerving in a Malibu spaceship. All of the plans postponed. Closing a matrix, screaming, I made it, but I'm praying. Call it, check. Ooh. It's only a small little drop. What a car. This is it. 
to the start line if it makes it. So there's one thing that we're missing. I'd say to complete it, but there's still a lot of things to do to complete it. But there's one thing special that we wanted to get done, and we're gonna do it on the starting grid. Come on. It feels like you're going sideways because you're sitting sideways. Like I feel like the car's tracking's off, but I think it's not I think it's actually in a straight line now, but it feels like you're driving sideways because the seat is sideways. <laughs> I kinda of feels the same to me to be fair. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. You keep revving it like that and you ain't going to go anywhere. Hey, Mark, for one more time, Matt. It's reliable. It's 100. <laughs> In true Gumball fashion, not that we've ever been on Gumball, we're doing a pit change, a pit stop. Wheel Mania, courtesy, they are changing out the stock LP640 alloys for new Vossa ones. Lee's here, but in a completely different environment. So, <laughs> it's going to be, there's no pressure because there's only a couple of people watching. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got the tour specs? <laughs> The alloys only arrived today and Wheel Mania thought it would be a cool idea to come up to Edinburgh to change them on the start line. This is rock and roll, I That's like this a lot. So thanks so much guys for this. The Mercia logo is at least going to have some sort of style now. What wheels has he gone for, George? Um, he's gone for a set of Boston Fully Forged wheels, which are just unbelievable. It's the nicest wheel I've ever seen. There is staggered fitment, 19 inch on the front and 20 inch on the back. Yeah. My third gumball and I've never seen anybody change wheels on the grid. <laughs> there was a lot of pressure to get this fitment right. But of course, Wheel Mania came through as they always do. And even though the car doesn't have any paint on it, I still think it's going to look incredible. What's that the number? What's the number? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> so guys, if you ever need any wheels for your car, WhatsApp Wheel Mania with the link in the description. The wheels are on and the car is as ready as it could be really, so uh, let's attempt the gumball. The new wheels look absolutely stunning. And the car certainly looks one of a kind now. And oh, has it got a story to tell. And the first time I'm gonna properly drive it is on my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the star line. This is car number one, ready to go. Uh, the Mercer log goes all the way at the back. See if we can do it today. Let's do it. This is going to be a trip to remember. The atmosphere was unreal here. I just hope the car holds out. Right now, the car has got 19 miles on the clock. This is going to be a great indication of how far we're going to make it. How far do you think the Mercy is going to make it? It's probably already broken right now. If it makes it to the start arch, I'll be impressed. I've got high hopes for the Mercy. Really? You're I a believer? I, I, I have confidence in Matt's engineering skills. Why? How far do you think the Mercy Largo will get? I'm hoping all the way. I'm hoping it's going to have a flawless <laughs> journey. Optimism. Just rebuilt the engine in a shed in Leicester and we've made it to the start line. Here's the fun! <laughs> be careful not to get too excited too early because now we've got a big drive from Edinburgh down to London. We started off with three quarters of a tank, we've now got a full one so good news is we're making fuel. <laughs> the car's getting a little hot because only one fan's working so we've got the, the inside of the car absolutely cooking to um, try and cool it down. It is so hot in here but we're not risking turning the fans off. <laughs> by putting the fans on, by putting the fans on, we're taking the heat out of the engine, hopefully. It is so hot in here, it's ridiculous. 
There's two fans at the back of the Mercia Largo, and for some reason, only one seems to be working. But as long as we keep moving, we should be able to keep the engine cool enough. I'm in mean, sixth gear. First time ever. I've used all the gears now. Yeah. Come on, man. Sir. I wanted to make sure there's still a Mercy engine in here. I don't know how this thing's still running. <laughs> no. I thought maybe you swapped it out. I filled up 60 litres at Gumbo and, and now I'm... Where's the fuel gone? You're never gonna be able to afford a paint job if you keep driving it. You have to park it for three months, save up. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Not only did it need a fair bit of fuel, it also needed an oil top up. But I don't think there's anything to worry about just yet. How reliable is the Mercia Largo? Predictions? Got faith. I think it's good this time. It's charged up, it's ready to go. Reckon? Sort of like me. we definitely have a charging issue with the battery. It would not start, which left us with one option. That's it, keep pushing, keep pushing. Oh, nice, keep nice and smooth. Keep going, faster, faster. Go, 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 go. Some small minor hiccups already for the Mercer Largo, but there's still a long way to go. But as we was pulling into the lunch stop, the cooling issue was getting worse. The cooling temperature is at 120 degrees. I can tell how hot we are. And we've got the fans constantly on. We really did not have enough time to prepare for all of this. But we just hope the Mercer Largo will hang in there. Oh my God. We got into the lunch stop to check things over. And the good news is that both leaks seem to have stopped. Maybe the heat helped it. But we let it cool down whilst we got some food before getting back on the road. <laughs> For God's sake! Yeah. Quick stop. Let's see if we can make it to London. We've got to try and catch everyone. Regardless of all the problems that it has, this is still my ultimate dream car. And it's everything I ever imagined it to be. So we've done another 100 miles since filling up. And if you check the fuel gauge, it's still full. Riddled with strange problems, it just makes it that much more enjoyable to drive. And we're still a long way from getting it perfect. Wow. We somehow made it into London without the car overheating and I was just taking everything in. What a car the Mercer Largo is. Can you believe the Mercer Largo has pretty much made it to London? This is basically a childhood dream, so we're just living we're taking it in at the minute through London, doors up in a green Mercer Largo from a track experience place which was left for dead. Like, what are the, what are the odds? What are the odds? We're so close I and mean, we've got Shmi's car in front. <laughs> nearly there, we're nearly there Mercer Largo, come on. As we pulled into the destination, it was absolutely carnage. People were all over the street waiting to see the gumball cars. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> Over here and everyone wants to remember you can't really, we're on the red. <laughs> never seen anything like that. That is ridiculous. It, we are so hot in here, everyone's asking you to rev the car and the car's overheating. We're near the destination now to stop. If this Mercer Largo makes it, it's a trooper. It is a full trooper. How? Nearly there, come on. You should feel the heat of that. Oh my god. 
the Mercia Largo made it to London further than I ever thought it would make it. But the next morning, things went downhill fast. And then it died the next day. It looks like coolant was flying out of somewhere on the engine. Is that it? Right at the bottom. Yeah. Me and my dad desperately tried to find the leak. Probably want to rev it. It's coming from the top. It's literally, it's dripping out from the top. It could be a ho It could be this hose under here. Maybe that was the coolant leak the whole time. We just had a little leak, and it's just decided to give up today. We made it all the way here, um, and the next day we failed. So, well, at least we made it here. This looks like it could be the end of my first ever gumball experience and we only made it as far as London. But I think the Mercer Largo has done well to make it that far, being that we've just rebuilt the engine and most of the car weeks before. And now we find ourselves on the side of the road in London with an issue we need to solve so we can carry on our journey. Is still off? The good news is, it doesn't look like oil, but the bad news, it looks like coolant. No, it's coming from the top. It's literally, it's dripping out from the top. It could be a ho it could be this hose under here. On the engine where the water pump connects to the thermostat housing, there is a small silicon hose. Now I'm hoping that this has popped off because if it's split open, then we have an issue. The hose has just came off, we hit, we think, we hope. When it got so hot last night, it would have expanded the hose because it's rubber. The clip stayed the same. Then it's kind of pulled the hose off. We're hoping now I've got it on and it might work. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We were in luck. It was just a case of a popped off hose. We topped up the cooling, but due to all the other issues that we picked up on the Mercer Largo, we didn't think it was the greatest idea to leave the country. So we headed back to my workshop to fix this thing once and for all. Look at all the weird stuff that this car is doing. A light will come on. I, th I think the battery, it's just, I think it's just not charging. I think the car is not charging the battery at all. Look, and then the light comes on. It's doing some really weird stuff right now. And I think that's what's causing a lot of the issues. And this would make sense because we fitted a new battery in the last video, but as soon as we was on the gumball rally, we weren't able to start the car. Did you put a new battery in this? Brand new battery. Wow. So there's got to be a charging issue somewhere in the car. First thing, I'm gonna check whether we're getting any charge off the alternator. From the alternator, we should be getting around 14 volts. Getting 13 volts. So there's got to be a dodgy connection somewhere. Next up, I was going to test what faults the battery was getting. And as you all know by now, the battery is behind the wheel arch lining. Anything else? 12. 25. So we're getting 12 volts to the battery. So we're losing charge somewhere. How come you, it would stay running if your alternator is dodgy? Because normally because it's, it's still charging. It's still charging it, but not, not enough. Like it's only, it's only, it's keeping it at 12 volts and it should be at 13. The issue, this was finger tight. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Who put this on? 
Okay, so the the cable on the alternator, not blaming anyone, but I did put this on. It's finger t it's finger tight. So I tighten the bolt to hold the alternator cable on better, but it still seems we have a charging issue. The battery is now charging at 12.7 volts. So it's a little higher, but not the high 13s that we need for the battery to charge properly. After looking at all the connections, my dad hit the jackpot. This is the kill switch. This is the kill switch which sits there and that goes straight to the body, does it? That goes to the body and that goes to the earth. That looks very dirty. Clean, clean ones going on the body. The if the connections are dirty, I'm pretty sure we're gonna have a bad earth causing the charging issues. Reckon we fixed it. One problem. There we go, reckon it'll stop off. I don't think it's got the power in it to stop it up. That was well better. That was well good, wasn't it? Yay! 13.2. Yes! Next fix. Now, another issue we had on the gumball is that the car was overheating. We're literally overheating and everyone wants to rent, but you can't. We're, we're on the red. And that was because only one fan was working, which was this right-hand side one. And when we got back, me and Chris switched over the relays and now the left-hand side fan is working. So that would essentially mean the relays are bad. Okay, so I think these relays here with the fans. Now the relay should power off and on the fan. When the fan switch gets a signal saying the fan should be on, it will send a voltage through the coil in the relay, which will then flip the relay so that the 12 volt from the battery goes directly to the fan, turning the fan on. And then when the fan switch thinks the coolant temperature is all good, it will stop sending the voltage through the coil, which will then flip the relay back into the off position. So what we're gonna do now, just to see if the fan works, is jump the power of the relay so it goes directly to the fan. Fan's on. Fan's on. So the right one is on, so that is the dodgy relay. It's broken. It's broken. It's broken. It's broken. Look, nothing. We're sending, it's clicking but it ain't doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we've just found out if a relay clicks, it doesn't mean it's necessarily working. So new relay and we're gonna show you what a good relay looks like. Hey, hey there we go. Let's put this relay in and then we should have a cool Mercer Lago. Now the funny thing about this, the previous owners had just put a power line and a ground going directly to the fan to run it all the time. If they'd only have done a quick bit of research, they would have found it was just the relay. This is going well too well at the minute, I think. But now let's see if the other fan does come on. Oh, that's on. That's on. If only this happened before Gumball. It's great news. Now we've been told by Ed Bolian that the early Mercer Largos come with two keys. One to start the car, which is this one here, which looks like a shed key. And another one to open and lock the doors, which uh, also looks like a shed key. This one does start it. The problem with this one though, it, it doesn't lock the car. So we literally, we can't lock it at the minute, which is not ideal. It does have central locking, but there might be an issue inside the door. And that door is obviously full of filler. So let's strip it apart and see what we can find. Not only do the doors not lock, the car thinks that they're open all the time. So when we drive down the road, we always have a warning for a passenger side door open, and a driver side door open, which means the interior lights stay on all the time. So hopefully we can find something obvious behind the door card of why this issue is being caused. Is there a gaping hole in the door? There's a big, there is a dent. Oh, let's have a look. So this is what the door's supposed to look like. No holes in it. And that's what that one looks like. Yeah, because this is supposed to be a a circle look. <laughs> As you guys know, 
this door is full of primer, which says to me it's got a big dent in it. Oh, is that? So down here, there's a lot of filler. Okay, here we are. Magnet, where the dent is. <laughs> But has this revealed anything obvious about the door locks? It might not lock unless the door's latch is locked. Well, actually, this is looking like it could be an easy fix. A bit of WD-40 and was getting somewhere. So this now works. I think it just needed a bit of lubrication because now the door locks. But does it have central locking? Does it have central yeah, locking? it's got that electrical solenoid in there. This is, that's locked. Okay, so, closing it. Yes! It locked! So what was up with that? <laughs> and again, ready? Opening. Yeah. So what the hell was wrong with that? Okay, ready? Yeah. Can you get in? Let's see if we can unlock it, else we're in trouble. Yes! <laughs> I got two keys. One for the... One for the... <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's best not to question things and just roll with it. The doors now work. And the good thing now, when I close this, these lights should go off when I put the key in the ignition, maybe. Maybe. There we go, they do go off, they do go off. And I can see everything on the dash now with, oh, it says rear bonnet open. There we go. Next issue, before we finally get this on the road and then find out what Lamborghini think of it, this belt is looking pretty dangerous. So the auxiliary belt, which runs around the water pump, the alternator, the power steering pump, and also the aircon pump as well, is literally, it's coming, it's riding off the edge of the pulleys. And we think, we're pretty sure, we've missed the bracket out, which is stabilizing the pulley. The pulley is leaning one side, so it's trying to chuck the belt off. We've found this bracket, which we haven't used, and we think we know where it goes. Let's try and fit it. This is the bracket that we think we need, and it mounts to the side of the engine. And then the bracket mounts to the power steering pump, which then should stabilize it. So we've got to unbolt two bolts on the side of the engine now, and then somehow wedge in this bracket. And you can see from here how much play the power steering pump has. So the tension on the belt is just pulling the power steering pump towards the car, lifting the belt off the pump. So hopefully this bracket sorts it. Okay, we're moving forward. The supporting bracket is on that now. So the belt should sit nice and straight and stay on the actual pulleys. Now, the belt is a little bit ripped and torn and broken. But what I wanna do is just kind of run it before I go and put another belt on, just in case it does start riding off again and I wreck another belt. But I think that should be okay for now. But other than that, apart from that on and off oil leak, I think I might actually get to drive this home. I just realized I completely forgot to check whether the belt stayed on when I started it, but it's okay, we're moving, but we seem to have um, accommodated an airbag light for no reason at all. But now we head to Lamborghini to see what, well, they think of the oil leak, we need to get the tracking done, and well, a lot more. Let's get to Lamborghini. Now you've all seen the videos where I've taken my cars to dealerships before. Porsche, Aston Martin, BMW, and we've actually been allowed in the workshop. But I think Lamborghini is a little bit different. So I highly doubt we're gonna be able to film in here, but I'm gonna do the best we can to capture my experience here and see what they think of my Mercialago. This is going to be very interesting and it's definitely a place where it feels like maybe we shouldn't be and this definitely doesn't look like it should be here. Look at all the nice cars. Okay. Let's go check it in. This is probably the first time the Mercialago has been back to Lamborghini in over 10 years. Hello, James, how are you doing? You're going interesting one today. Sorry about that. It's 
Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jump between four wheel on, isn't it? Straight yeah. forward. So. I'm wondering whether you guys could just raise it a tab on the front. I don't know if that's possible. I've got the tool for the, the kit, but I don't know whether you guys would do that or not. Okay. And if the guys could plug in the diagnostic and just to see why the airbag lights came on, but okay, that would be good. Right. And uh, a list of anything else that's. Anything that's crossed it's so simple. Anything different, I'll ring you and let you know. Yeah, yeah. wicked. Brilliant. The tech then had to take a quick look over the car and write down the mileage for his sheet. Yeah, you'd think so, but I don't think that's a legit one. <laughs> Wicked, oh, legend, fancy. cheers mate. This is a bit different to when we go to the dealers. This is uh, undercover dealer filming. God knows what's gonna happen to the car, but uh, it doesn't seem very impressed. <laughs> we then had a phone call the next day from Lamborghini with some bad news. The computer's gone. I mean, I'm stood next to James, the technician, and he yeah. looks as though he's about to whip me if I ask him how it's going one more time. Okay, it's two days later, and the car's ready to collect. I guess, I guess, like, we all know things go wrong with cars when they work on cars. Things don't go to plan. But I bought the car in on Tuesday and to do the four-wheel alignment, and apparently the machine broke yesterday, and it's also broken today, so it's not been possible to do the four-wheel alignment. And also you've probably heard the conversation that uh, I've asked them to see if they can plug in and diagnose where that airbag fault's coming from. So we're going to find out whether they've seen anything else wrong with the car, but we might have to go get the alignment done at a later date. Let's go see what's happened and uh, yeah, well, we'll find out. Look at it, it fits in perfectly. Mm. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come to collect the half green one, the Merchelago outside. Last week of the quarter, Monday my time machine breaks. <laughs> it takes two days to do one wheel alignment. We we'll finally get it through, plug yours in, and then the cameras go, <laughs> James then went on to tell me all the problems the guys found in the workshop, like the front disc being lipped and scored, the AC compressor leaking, the airbag warning light on, and brake lines which were corroded. Thanks so much for that. No worries, mate. Yeah, see you there was also a few more problems, but let me explain. So some good news and some bad news. Bad news is we're still running on the MA alignment that we did in the Gumball Rally car park. But the good news is we do have no airbag light anymore. Check it out. No airbag light. Cheers Lamborghini, it might have just needed cancelling then and that's obviously what the tech's done. We now have no lights on the dash, so a solid car. But we do have some feedback from a little health check that we got from Lamborghini. And let me show you it. Now the good news, this is quite small. We've got a red section here for front disc lipped and scored and rear disc lipped and scored. Seals on the aircon compressor, so it looks like that's leaking. Airbag warning light on, but as we know, the airbag warning light is off now. So I think if you mess around with the airbags on this car or mess around taking the interior out and putting it back in, you have to have it canceled off else the light will stay on all the time, which is good. That's off now. A few brake pipes are corroded. It says here, clutch sometimes allows gear selection. Driver's door seal. Yeah, we know the seal's a bit iffy on that. Engine oil leak. We know about this and we still are on the fence of whether we're gonna take the engine out or not. And it only seems to do it when it's cold. Handbrake cable is fraying. Again, something that we could fix. It's an old handbrake cable. More hoses corroded and more brake lines corroded. But the rest is all green, which I think is actually not bad if we're thinking about Lamborghini. Like if Lamborghini have checked this over and we've actually got a lot of green ticks and a few things here and there. What would Lamborghini give this car out of 10 then? Solid nine. This is it. It's going to be the first time seeing the Mercedes since we dropped it off about six weeks ago. I haven't seen any photos of it or anything. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know the colour and it should look good. Last time we had the Lamborghini, we repaired the running issues, all the leaks it had, and then stripped the car down, ready for it to be painted. And today's finally the day we get to see it complete.
Here it is after the long wait and they have done. It was well and truly worth it. What a job this is. Look how immaculate the paint is. But now we've got to take it back so we can build this up because we've got a lot of miles to doing it from uh, now onwards. I don't think it had truly settled in how good the Mercial Argo looked with its new paint. And it's got my approval. But what does my dad think? Awesome. <laughs> it's beautiful and I wouldn't want to take it on the road because no. it's that good. Would you have gone for this colour? Yeah, gone for the same colour. Yeah. yeah. OG, innit? What's your thoughts on the paint? I really like it, it's very green. But now it's time to rebuild this car one last time. In goes the headlights and the famous side indicators. This is scary, this is scary. And then me and Chris are putting on the front bumper, which is fitted quite strangely with the bolts being in the middle, not on the sides. Whoa, that looks sick. And first try, we got the panel lines up pretty good. Even Chris was impressed. I'm on. Then it's time for the wing mirror to go on and the left side bat wing and the right side bat wing moving quickly onto the rear lights which slot into the rear quarter and then bolt to them and quickly it's time for the rear bumper which again bolts in the middle but also on the edges and it's slowly coming together now my dad's putting all the seals in for the windows and he's as excited as I am to see it finished. And he's been a huge part of this Mercia Largo build and we've got a big surprise for him later on in the video. My dad put on the side skirt whilst I got road trip ready. And we're now down to the final pieces. The last little bits to go on the car. Two badges and the badges on the front. These are ridiculously expensive. Luckily we had one, but we didn't have the other one. £249.89p for one of these badges, but I, I think there weren't many made because they're only on 2002 models. Luckily, I got a second hand one for £96, but it's still ridiculously expensive. I feel like you could have just made one, so. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's good, it's the little bits. Right on the other side. This is it, a year's worth of work into my dream car, ready for this road trip. Take a look. It looks absolutely unreal. Even in this light, it's just about getting dark. So it only means one thing, this road trip starts now. Come on, Mercia Largo. Now remember, every penny we spend on fuel will be gambled when we get to Monaco. First fill up. First lot of casino money and we're in the UK. 100 pound is what we're going for. Hopefully we can win it back. 100 pound, which is... Matt, we, 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 we barely got half tank. What, from 100 pound? Yeah, look. 224 miles for 100 quid. I can't get over that. That's wild, man. All... Off we go then. I didn't make it far down the country before we had to fill up again. Full tank this time. Come on. Now to get into France, we're getting on the Channel Tunnel. And it's worth mentioning my dad's driving the Aston Martin Vantage that I rebuilt. And Chris is driving his Jaguar F-Type. Welcome to France. France! Bonjour! <laughs> the Mercia Largo is doing great. So far, so good. But of course we needed another fuel stop. Fuel stop number three. Fuel stop number three. And luckily after that fuel stop, we arrive at our first destination. You know, you're at the Nürburgring when it's Porsche Porsche, BMWs anywhere? BMW there, There we go. There's one right behind you as well. Yeah, they're in the right car. <laughs> the Nürburgring, one of the most famous tracks in the world. And anyone can drive it. Where are we? 
Nürburgring. What are we going to be doing? Going fast. <laughs> I'm about to attempt a lap in the Lamborghini Mercia Largo. We've just rebuilt the engine on and had it freshly painted. Probably not one of my best ideas ever. Here we go. Onto the ring. In the Mercia Largo. This section of the track is one of the fastest parts of it. We've really got to push the Mercial Argo. And meanwhile... I go out in the inside! Yes! Go on, Tony! Oh my god! Oh my god! My dad was getting to enjoy his first lap of the Nürburgring in the Aston Martin. It was clear we were both over the moon of how the cars performed. Yes! <laughs> He's alive! <laughs> I'm alive! Thank God! <laughs> but there was one person who wasn't over the moon with how his car performed. Chris is on his second lap with Misha, or first lap with Misha, and he's told us to meet us at this place where we think we tow the cars where something bad's happened. So we've arrived and this car's got the bonnet up. Let's see what has happened. This is not going to be good. Something's gone wrong with the car. If you were to guess what would have gone wrong with that car, what would you guess this be? Brakes, coolant. Coolant. In fact, we were both wrong. Chris's Jag is supercharged, which runs on a belt, and it's pretty obvious to see what's happened to the belt here, which now means it has no power at all. And with it being a Sunday and a special type of belt, and also tonight with us having to get to Munich, it's not looking good for Chris. So this is the option, either this. Either this or a standard one, I'm thinking this one. Not that, those bucket seats can be savage. No, they look all right. No, they're not. It's not a no. fire extinguisher as well, just in case we get hot. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going in there? I might be, yeah. I need, to, I need to find a solution for that. If he does have it there, the only way we'll get it will be late afternoon. The earliest we can fix it will be Tuesday. I've got my ride sorted, so do you know what? can we do a permanent swap? <laughs> we got back on the road and started heading to Munich. And as for Chris, sometimes when life gives you lemons, you gotta make lemonade. <laughs> this is lemonade. <laughs> they got the Clio hire car. One more fuel stop added to the pot, another full tank, and another. 479 kilometers to go. Wow. On the way to Munich, we had a little play on the autobahn, which means no speed limits. Come on, Cleo. Come on. We're absolutely zooming. Look at the lorry go. It's gone. Problem is, when you come off the autobahn, everything feels a lot slower. So here's my first encounter with the police. Well, that's been pulled. This is not good. I don't know what he was doing. 
but it's been pulled. Oh, I was going too fast, straight past the copper. The police pulled me into the service station and I was dreading what was coming next. No. Oh, why is there so many coppers here as well? Hello. Hello. I'm yes. sorry. Uh, one I know, I'm sorry. I, I realised that. I, was, I see, literally went past and then I seen you guys and I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, you got your car at 141. 141? Uh, really? Yeah. Not too fast for a Lamborghini. <laughs> <laughs> Not for this. No, that's why it's so easy to go over the speed limit. 31 kilometers over the speed limit I was doing. But luckily this time, it was an on the spot fine. 90 euros. Not great, but better than having the car taken away. You're taking a words from me. It's like I forget. Didn't make it to Munich without another fill up. Another fill up, which wasn't surprising. And as day turned into night, we stopped off at one of the best places I've ever stayed. Yes, that is me reversing the Mercer Lago into my hotel room. That is well cool. <laughs> we are at the Motor World Museum in Munich. This is the only hotel I know you can park your car in the hotel room. <laughs> Look at this. This was absolutely unreal and a must for all petrol heads. Just saying, like, I find this cool. It says all of the stuff in the minibar is free. And the coolness doesn't stop there. The concierge shown us through into our bedroom right next to the Mercer Lago, walked us through the room, and when you open the door, <laughs> a huge museum. What? Be myself and I bring. We don't see the same no more. An amazing place. But it's time to get some rest because the next day things started to go wrong. Okay, today we've got a four hour, 15 minute drive down into Switzerland through Austria into a place called Furkers Pass, which should be one of the best driving roads in Europe. So far, it's doing really, really well. Like, I don't think many people would attempt this. <laughs> As we got closer, we needed a fuel stop. Racing fuel. And then the first problem of the Mercer Lago occurred. So I pulled over to check the oil, and on the dipstick, there is literally nothing. It is bone dry. So we must have burnt a lot of oil in 2,000 miles but there's not one single bit of oil, so I do not want to risk driving it at the minute. Look how filthy the back is. The best thing is, we brought oil, but it's in my dad's car, and my dad's gone off somewhere, so, yeah, we're stuck at the minute till we get oil. He's arrived! 10W40, remember we put 10W50 in it, which was better, but this is all we've got. Now the Mercer Largo doesn't have a low oil warning light. It would just tell you when the oil pressure is low. So you constantly have to keep an eye on it. Couldn't make it any more difficult to put oil in it. Oh yeah, it's in a well awkward position. <laughs> on top of that, it's pretty difficult to pour the oil into the oil tank right at the front of the engine. If you spill any oil, it could go straight onto the exhaust manifold, which could later cause a fire. We're back in and we're rolling versus back on the road with oil in it. Little wear, uh, pickle, but we're all good. Oh no! But it didn't last long. Right, oh. Set fire to the uh, inlet. Oh my! It set fire to the inlet pipe. Oh no! It set fire to the inlet pipe. Oh, oh, yes. That oil I spilled earlier dropped down onto the manifold, and it didn't take much of driving for it to set a light. Luckily, we managed to get it out in time. We literally said that it was going to go on fire, and. It has, which is not good. What's the plan of action? I need. A, I think I need to like spray it down. Cause it's still gonna be oil in it. Yes, yeah, so it's gonna still burn. Mm. Who, who puts oil? In there? Don't make any sense. Burning the oil off. Oh, so we're gonna run it until we get on fire, and then we'll put the fire out, and then it's fine. 
I like that idea. Better to burn on, set on fire while it's here, we can control it than when he's driving it. I like that idea. <laughs> So I think the oil's burnt off, so we're going to carry on, because there's no other way. Uh, we don't have another spare Clio like Chris. So, we've got to carry on. Big moves. <laughs> <laughs> we continued on into Switzerland with some amazing views. And we then found a place to spray the cars down and give them a quick clean. This should clear away any resting oil on the engine before finally arriving at our hotel for the night. We arrived at Switzerland. And the next morning, we woke up to something spectacular. The hills were alive with the sound of a Virgin Argo B12. Welcome back to a new video. We'll be lowering a Audi A6. Spring pops out, new spring goes in. It's not too difficult. Bad as I thought it was gonna be, but we're just gonna do a quick service, oil change, change the spark plug. We're gonna upgrade the pads on a GCI. Not long until I'll be turning up here in a Lambo or something like that. Not until I'll be turning up here in a Lambo or something like that. <laughs> that was the best road ever in the best car ever. I'm only halfway through the trip. What a car. Would you say that's the best road you've ever driven with the car you drove? Yeah. Really? It's an Aston, isn't it? That tensioner one, this yeah, one. Yeah, I know, yeah, but you, it just spins round and round. What's happened, Tony? Well, we'll have a look, on, well, we'll a look bit, underneath the car. There's a bit there, look. Oh, what? Look under the car. Look under the car. Oh my days. That is not good. That is a lot of oil. So what's the plan? Buy some oil. <laughs> we left the hotel to go and get fuel and some oil if we need it. And then we found exactly where the leak was. The oil was just seeping out these bolts on top of the rocker cover, but to tighten them, you need to get to the other side of it. We can't tighten it either. Yeah, like that's a quite an easy. It's it's an easy fix, which is good. It's just coming out of these top two there. But again, if we spin them bolts, it's just spinning the nut on the other side. So to get to the nut on the other side, you have to take off the rocker cover. But we can't really do that at the minute. But it is an easy fix. But just means we're doing consistently consistent oil changes all the way. More money added to the pot and there was a surprise back at the hotel. Chris's car is back in the mix. But it's doing another break. Oh no. Oh no. Oh well, at least it's cosmetic. Exactly. Chris is back. Everyone's back and Nico has came in his Ferrari. Come on, make some noise, right, make some noise. I haven't heard it yet. It's loud. <laughs> We're 
were all back on the road as a group. And today's plan was to head from Switzerland down to Milan. Thing is, I got a little too excited. You can't have a rear wheel drive Merchel Argo without a little bit of donut in. This was so much fun. But looking back now, it probably wasn't the best idea. Because by doing this, I had my next encounter with the police. And it wasn't a good one. How was I'm feeling home here, you know. <laughs> this is fantastic. Wow. This is the first day of the car being like this. So yeah. it is just like a child coming through. Press police. Oh, please, please, please. Yes, please. Sorry. The police saw the smoke from the highway and decided to come down. The thing is, they'd not seen us do any donuts. But it's pretty hard to deny it when you can see even Nico's tires still smoking here. Then camera and delete all film. They were immediately threatening to take the cars away and trying to get us to own up to doing the donuts. We really messed up here. And this is me now giving my driving license to the police, which they never gave me back. So guys, we need to go to the police station apparently. Uh... It just got worse. I didn't even do anything. You didn't, and I literally did nothing. That, that that is unfair on you, to be fair. Isn't it? But what do you think happens next? I don't know what's the best thing to do in this situation. Mm. We've got to follow on 50 kilometers to a police station. It is not looking good. Ah, oh, instant regret. All three of us followed the police to the police station. Whilst my dad in the Aston Martin stopped off at the next services to wait for us. None of us knew what was going to happen next. We arrived at the station in a place where they looked like they compound cars. And all three of us had our phones taken off us and then taken in for questioning. Matt, Nico and Chris are in the police station. We're holding it down with the cars. So we've looked and they can either take the cars, take the licenses and like, arrest them and then also give you a fine based on your income. Yeah, and arrest them. And arrest them. But I don't, I don't think they'll arrest them for a donut. I don't think so either. And they, they didn't technically see us doing what we were doing. No, they claim they seen smoke on yeah, the tyres. Yeah, and then just came, came over. There was a lot of smoke. Um, they've been about... 20 minutes and they've not come out yet so I'm hoping it's good news <laughs> we'll keep you updated Matt Armstrong has just spent 585 pound and 10 pence at Policia Cantalone oh no he's been given a fine is he walking out with a license though go let's look? go find out yep we got fined then he says, okay, your engine's too loud, so I'm fining you for that. I, I, and I'm, I just weren't arguing with, yeah. the, with that. And then he says, well, you pulled in the wrong way, so that's yeah, fine. So uh, let's put it this way, right? I just got a text message way. from there. If they prove, yeah. if they had proof, they would seize the car. Yeah, they, they were saying, they were saying that, oh, we can get cameras up there if we want to. If you disagree with paying the fine, I was like, I'm paying the fine. Uh, but yeah. it's just weird how we got shafted for the same thing and I didn't do anything. Yeah. Thanks, boys. Well, I'll, I'll, we I'll get, get out yours. Of the police station? <laughs> I'll pay for Chris's because Chris literally didn't do anything. Yeah. You had to pay a fine? Yeah, he got six <laughs> It never felt so good to drive away from a police station. Okay, so we got away with a fine for doing that because the engine is too loud. Um, 
yes, I have got a aftermarket exhaust on, but I think that's not allowed here. Um, and then we also got a fine for no motorway speeding thing, like a toll yeah, a, a, thing, a, 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 which yeah. I didn't realise I was meant to have, so we'll get I that. Didn't know either. And then uh, also a fine for uh, over revving the engine, like over, like not driving it properly. But yeah, we got away lightly, but we know now, no more donuts. Or do them and leave straight away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we could continue on the drive into Milan. Got something for what you. What you got? Funny thing. <laughs> We're gonna do some donuts. <laughs> but we shouldn't joke because the bad luck didn't just end there. Why is it every single day? Every day. Are you he was joking. Oh, you said that joking earlier. He's done a Leo. What happened? Wow. Oh, no. wow. What happened? I've oh just had those things. They cost me 12. Oh, my days. Oh. Every single day. Email and phone number. The insurance of oh, the people that have been in, in contact with right. you. Look at that. We have to get new wheels. It's absolutely That's basically diamond cut. Honestly, you are, you have done something wrong in your life and it's catching up with you. Wow. That is bad. Wow. Not had a good day. Chris has had his car cleaned by the concierge and they've managed to move the Merchel Argo, the Aston and the Ferrari, the widest cars, but on the, the Jag. The easiest car to move. Oh no, what's happened? <laughs> and, and these are fine. What's the Aston looking like? Oh no, they've done the Aston as well. Is that the Aston? Yeah, look. All of, oh my god. Wow. They've done this as well. Yes, yeah. This is fresh. They've done. Wait, there's still paint coming off. All of this, look, this is all fresh. You've done the front? No. That was already there. This one, no. That's, that's massive. massive. Yeah, look. That's brand new. The paint's still clean. That's out. happened after it's been washed because it would have yeah. washed up. Like, no, 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 no way. <laughs> no <laughs> way. He made the video. So no, show, show the video. Show the video. Look at this. No, no, no way. way. I've got loads of videos yeah. on here. That's part of it. I've just pulled it off. It's, it's hanging fresh. Off. It's hanging off. So the concierge has damaged the wheel on the Aston and two wheels on the Jag. My name is Elenu, I'm the director of room, so I've just been made aware of what happened this morning. So that's why as soon as you came down, my colleague called me, I wanted to first introduce myself yeah. and then apologize, of course, for what happened. This one we know, I'm not sure who, is the, who of you is the owner of the Jaguar. That one, yeah. And, and he's very out of luck. <laughs> he was arrested yesterday <laughs> for something Wait, that I did. I <laughs> now we spoke to the lady at the hotel and she said that she would sort it for us through their insurance. But still today, we haven't heard anything back. Well, Chris. I've had enough of it. I'm genuinely, I nearly went home when I went to pick the Jag, that's yours. I nearly went home when I went to pick the Jag up. And that I'm is. just still wishing I did. Both of us got curb wheels, but I feel more sorry for you because it's just not, it's just an endless amount of thing, it isn't is, it? Yeah. And like, that's one of those things, it'll just never get sorted. Yeah, it will, it's going to be an end, yeah, yeah you'll never get an endless it. thing. Maybe the Italians just don't like British cars. But we can't let this keep us down. We're nearly there. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yes, please. This has got to be the last fill up and we have an Italian doing it. Italian car and an Italian man filling up. Hello. <laughs> 204 euros. That's the most expensive one so far. The car's done so well to get to this point though. So, so well. But Monaco is next. Before we gamble the fuel costs and surprise my dad, we've got to get to Monaco. But then I had an issue. Oh, oh my God. You're literally smoking loads. You're smoking. It's literally, it's literally pouring, pouring out. out. Pouring yeah, out. yeah, it was it's pouring out. Pouring oh out. Oh no. Pull off, pull off, pull off, pull off, pull off. Oh my days, there's so much coming out. Oh, look at it. That was pouring out then. You got a triangle here? Yeah. Good yeah. morning, triangle. Good, good work, Hannah. There was loads. Yeah, it might just be this. It's coming out of that. It was not Oh good. no. Oh, what? Is it? Yeah, on. that one's. So on the end of this bolt on the underside yeah. it holds a chain guide on yeah so allen key on the other side there the bolt screws onto the top and that's loose so that's it's leaking oil out the top because it's loose 
But if that comes undone and drops into the engine, it's game over for the uh, for the for the engine. For the, for the engine. Yeah, yeah. But like we can't, I can't tighten it up because we can't tighten it up because we can't get to the under the other underside of it. Right. When the engine is high on revs, the oil seems to be seeping out of that bolt at the top and then leaking down onto the exhaust causing the smoke. But with no other option, we had to carry on. This might be the last time we see the Mercy driving. Oh no, this is not going to be good. Well, it stayed dry from there to there. It's essentially like, if that comes off, it's like running a car. It's like running a car, opening up that cap and dropping a bolt down it and just there see what go. happens. You'd definitely hear it. Oh yeah. Like, rah, 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 rah. If that bolt falls in there, it's big problemo. That's in Italian as well. We carried on with the trip into Monaco. Two and a half hours to Monaco. We're hoping that bolt holds out. It's no fault of the Mercia Largo. That was literally my own fault doing that bolt. I didn't do it tight enough when we put the engine together. I can deal with the oil leak, but I don't know. I, I, I hope that bolt holds out. Two and a half hours. Come on, Mercia Largo. I know you've got it. Come on. Now, luckily for me, on the way into Monaco, there was so much traffic, which was good for my oil leak. But on Nico's Ferrari. Nico, what's happened? Yeah, fantastic. He jinxed it. What? What's happened? Yeah, I have a bit of a problem here. Oh, no. What? First of all, the car didn't want to switch off. <laughs> What's happened? What's happened? It's basically, it's got a million warning lights on the dash. Oh my. So I can't see because you're like, so oh. let me read to you. Blind spot detection, automatic yeah, high beam. It didn't um, want to stop. I don't know what it was. What I else? ACC, PEB, SVB, and ACC, PEBS functionality. This, I think it's battery. I think it's battery related. This one's battery to me. I just started moving, but Nico turned off his Ferrari in the traffic behind us and uh, went to go get back in it and we didn't know because we were a couple of cars in front but apparently his Ferrari didn't start but Matt and Chris are still by his Ferrari I don't know what's happening there so maybe they're filming and we'll clip to it now but I have no idea what's going on there This is like the worst place you could ever break yeah. down Sorry! Excuse me! So it's just... I, do, I do think it's battery yeah. It's strange how the battery would be not charged after all that driving Bye. 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 See if it starts now, yeah. and then if not, we'll jump a packet. No, it's dead. Oh. The guys tried everything and were advised by Ferrari to disconnect the battery, leave it, and then connect it back up again afterwards and try again. They've done a nice quick release, I think, because they knew this was going to happen sometimes. Yeah. So, I'm going to go back on. It's so up, by the way, the battery. Yeah, I just wanted to say, is it? Right, let's hope. Come on. Let's see. It says bonnet's open. Blind spot. No blind spot. Yeah. But that didn't work. And this is half a million pounds worth of Ferrari with only 2,000 miles on the clock. It was clear the battery was flat. So luckily, Chris had a jumper pack to try and jump start it. When I say, when I say go, press start, yeah? yeah. Three, two, one, go. But the celebration was short lived. Even though the Ferrari was running, it had pretty much every light on the dash and no power steering. Meanwhile, we were making our way into Monaco. So, so close now to making it there. Whether we would all meet there, I don't know. We're so close to getting there now and he's done so well, the Mercia Largo. What a trip. Monaco is around the corner. But things weren't looking good back at the Ferrari. If you want to see what a Christmas tree looks like, it looks like that. Oh my days, I have never seen a car do that in my life. Ferrari on the way, the car won't register that it's in gear. And they said, do not do that. If it says it can't register it's in gear, it can cause damage to the gearbox and electronics and all that kind of thing. So we're parking it up, waiting for a Ferrari. The Mercer Largo had made it to Monaco. 
What a car. Shortly followed by my dad in the Aston Martin. Is this it? Is this the guy? Please yes. tell me this is the guy. Uh, it looks like it. It, it looks like it. It's up by a bin, also known Whoa. as a Ferrari. Now let's go. Yes! <laughs> So we've made it to Monaco. All that was left to do now was total up the fuel costs and try to win it back at the famous Monte Carlo Casino. First things first, we've got a fuel cost, which was how much, Hannah? Um, 1,192 pounds and 70. So 1,192 pounds and 70 pence. It's only right that we double it as we always do because of the journey there and the journey back. So 2,200 and something euros now on red or black. I'm kind of swinging towards red, but we're going to make the decision when we're there. But before we go, my dad needs to take a seat. We, I didn't have this planned, but we thought the Mercer Largo has been a massive journey from the start to the finish, not only on the road trip, but also for building it and I wanted to thank you for uh, helping me build the Marshall Argo and do all the engine stuff because I wouldn't have been able to do it before. And funny enough, this has got nothing to do with Nico. He just happened to be here and we've got his approval on this. And Hannah, <laughs> we've got both one for me, one for you. I don't know which one's which. This is a Rolex with the green face for the Marshall Argo. <laughs> One's a 2023 and one's a 2022. And we did get your approval, didn't we, Nico? Absolutely, mate, yeah. absolutely. I'm, I'm like, I, I, I'm actually a wee bit emotional. I'm getting quiet here for once, you know? That is fantastic, mate. That is insane. My, my makeup's running. <laughs> <laughs> so we both now have matching Rolexes. And please do me a favor, wear them well. Yes. You actually fix stuff. <laughs> These watches can resist everything. Really? Right? Honestly, Don't you need to that. wear them. <laughs> the paper. Oh, but you've actually got the newer one. So that's a fun. I've got a 2022, you've got a 2023. That's fine, I'll take the one. I think you used to old stuff anyway. <laughs> we know the old stuff makes it here. I don't know about the brand new stuff anyway. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. oh. Let's go win at the casino. Come on. <laughs> Let's go win. Is that James Bond? <laughs> All cars made it here, apart from Nico's car. He was only on the trip for a couple of days, but it's been an amazing trip. All we need to do now is win. Come on. I've made my decision that I was going to put the whole lot of fuel money on red. If the ball lands on a red number, we double our money. Anything else, we lose. I found the table I'm going to play on, and there it is, over 2,000 euros on red. Let's hope this comes in. The Mercer Largo made the full round trip that we did to Monaco. What a car. But we did have some small issues with it. Everything cosmetically seems okay, apart from it's absolutely filthy, so we will get it clean before the end of the video. And unfortunately, the paint, I think we have a few stone chips here and there and one there. Um, so I think we're gonna get them touched up and I think it we're gonna get some PPF, but we can't PPF it until like four months after the paint. Something along those lines, but the major issue we had was the oil leak. So we had the big oil leak in the main channel video, which you would have seen, it's in the top right hand corner, which is coming from this bolt here, which is loose. Now to get to the other side of it, to tighten it up, we've got to take pretty much all of this off, the fuel rail, everything, and uh, 
it's a fairly big job for a tiny little bowl. I'm still editing the main channel video, so for once in the whole entire of history of the main channel and the second channel, this whole video is going to be passed over to Matt behind the camera and my dad, who are going to go and fix this, hopefully without me and they don't break anything. Hopefully this is the last time we ever have to work on it. Not a chance. Not a chance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it inside and we'll pass this video over to my dad. There's another problem. This car's done a total of 3,000... 3,500 miles now since its new life. And uh, let me show you how long the tyres lasted. 3,500 miles the tyres lasted. <laughs> Is that something to do with donuts by the Swedish police? No, I didn't do any donuts and I never went on track. So we've got some new tyres up there. Um, again, the tyres for these Mercialagos, you can't get them. Like, they're just so hard. I had to buy second-hand ones. That's how hard they are to get. Poor me having to buy second-hand tyres for a Mercialago. So they've got to go on and they're a bit thicker, so I think I'm going to like the look of them. It's going to look more original with that as well. So we've got to change them later. For now, oil leak's got to fix and uh, I'm going home to edit. It's down towards Tony. We've got to take this off first. Tony, how do we get it off? Undo these four bolts here. Two nuts down there, grills off. And then you just wing it. Oh, right, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see where all the oil were. So it's going down here. Down the side of the engine, resting on there, and then when you go around a corner, all that pool falls on there, and that's why we were smoking. He still don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't trust us to leave us. No, I know he don't. Bye, Matt. Bye. We've had an idea. We're going to prank him, and we're going to attach, I think, the horn to something on the car, so when he presses the indicator or something, he presses the horn. A classic Top Gear prank. Let's do it. You've broke it. He's only been gone two minutes. <laughs> Oh, just, I can't oh, believe you broke it already. <laughs> <laughs> now we can see why he didn't trust us. <laughs> He's left two minutes and we broke something and we're going to prank him. <laughs> oh, it's off. Now we've took that off, we yeah. can get to the indicator wires. So rather than focusing on the oil leak, that isn't very important. I need to focus on attaching the horn to the indicators. No to the brake light. Oh, it's the brake light. That's going to be even worse. Every time he breaks, it's going to be as loud as anything. <laughs> Every time you break, that's what he's going to hear. <laughs> Put another horn on the back. Where are we going to get another horn from? I can pinch it off the Ferrari. The Ferrari. Now, this is going to be our horn donor. Perfect. <laughs> Let's get that off of there and onto the Lambo. <laughs> All we need to do is find where the wire is to the brake light, which is what Tony's doing currently. Have you found it, Tony? I found the connector. We've just got to find out which one's the power for the brake. Oh, please tell me it fits down there. There you go, that's it. That's it. He's never going to see that. So you got a nice Rolex, and what Matt got was a horn attached to his brake, <laughs> <laughs> brake light. <laughs> We've got an earth. Now let's see if the horn works. <laughs> yes! <laughs> let's get it attached to the brake. Ready? <laughs> Let's do the job we're actually supposed to be doing. Engine cover is coming off. A few T30 bolts on the top. Engine cover's off. Air pipes off the throttle bodies. What line are you disconnecting now? This line? Yeah. The gas boiler line. What are you doing back there, Tony? I'm doing the fuel lines. Can you smell it? I can. Can anybody on the channel smell it? Um, no. Oh. Yeah, when we've lifted the intake off, we've noticed a slight coolant leak. Oh, is it because the pipe? Oh no, the pipe's got a hole in it, look. Do you see it spraying up? Yeah, it's going everywhere. We've got to get a new hose. No, we won't. Just cut it off. So we've got to take the coils off so we can get the cover off to get to the nut on the other side of that bolt. Well, we didn't do that one bolt up tight enough. That's it. It would have been fine apart from that one bolt. So... Make sure you torque your bolts, which we do with all the bolts. Every bolt we torque. Isn't that right, Tony? That's right. That we always right. talk to them. We're taking off next, Tony. We're taking the cam sensor plate off. This holds the cam sensors in. That tell the computer where the cams are, basically. There you go. Yes, it's off. Carefully take the gasket back off so we can reuse it. The yeah. last nut there you go. the coils. Does that mean now we can take this off? Well, hopefully, yes. It's out. This 
plate slash two bolts that we're taking off now is the whole reason why I've set this whole engine apart. We just need to reseal these two points here as I think it was this one that was leaking and hopefully it won't leak anymore. Time to seal. What we're gonna use oh. to seal it. Oh no. This sealer this. That's an old one. <laughs> Oh yeah, no oil's getting through that. <laughs> <laughs> and here is the sealant on the, the other side. Yeah, on the other side. It's not gonna leak. I, I, I'm confident in that. Are you gonna torque that up this time? Click. Yeah, that's torque. Oh yeah, th that's cool, yeah. Make sure you torque this one. Don't forget to torque this one. I didn't hear a click. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, I heard um, that. Yeah, did you hear it? Yeah. Oh yeah, torqued. <laughs> See it squeaky and all that, look. Oh yeah, no yeah, oil is getting through there. <laughs> beautiful. Not a chance. <laughs> Tony, what are you doing? Don't, no. <laughs> don't film this. <laughs> this is definitely going in. Matt's going to be so happy that you painted that for him. And, and the lid. Oh yeah, and, the, and the, the lid looks really good now. It's half black, half silver. <laughs> Fresh? What do you reckon? Oh, you missed a bit. <laughs> That is professional. Looks better on camera than in real life. <laughs> it's not like girls on Tinder then. <laughs> I rate that a six. Out of six. Well done, Tony. That's <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> is it going back in? Yeah. We're going back in. Fix. Almost. Just putting it back together. Yeah, also, yeah. we've taught them to spec, so there's no chance they're going to get yeah. loose. Taught to spec, yeah. yeah. Well, I can't see any... Uh, Workshop manual around here. <laughs> what are we doing next? We're putting this back together. One of the seals is missing. What, what, why have you lost the seal? It's dropped off in there somewhere. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? Do you know what's actually I've just thought was quite good about this as well? What's, what's good about it? Do you know it? if I spilt it, it's not going to make a sticky mess? Because I keep thinking I was going to dribble it for for just humour, but I was like, oh, I don't want to get cherry water everywhere, but it's actually just water, <laughs> so I can dribble it. <laughs> Give us a dribble then. <laughs> like, it actually tastes like cherry, but mental. There's two gone, lot. See, yeah. the, inter the rubber's on the top, lot. Oh. My dad's lost an O-ring. And I found it. It's on the camera right there. Look, I can see it. How far down's that? I don't know, but I'm going to stay like this, and then we'll get my dad to get the hook. Go. Yes, that's it. Lift it, lift it, lift it, lift it, lift it. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Woo! Everything is going back in the engine bay and built back up, ready, so we can test it on the road. In three, two, one. I can't even click. Can you click? Me? Yeah. No, I can't click. Oh, neither can I. There you go. The oil leak is almost fixed. We took a detour to Wheelmania and we're getting the new tyres fitted onto the rims here. I know, I hope they fit. The, I hope the clearance fits. We're going to have to find out whether the clearance fits. We've got uh, big, <laughs> big, big tyres now. I hope they fit. We're going to have to see. We'll find out. We've still got the old tyres. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't I think, think I'm, no. Close. No. So let's no. try and get George to turn around. <laughs> I like it with a big fat tyre on, but... Was that about five minutes? Uh, no, no, less than that. that. It was one minute. Yeah, yeah, probably one minute in your back. They don't fit. Swap them again. If that's okay. And then back. <laughs> it's a plan. <laughs> You've got bad news apparently, Tony. What's happened? The boot split, which is a common occurrence right. on any vehicle. So we've uh, replaced it. So this is the new one? That's the new one. How bad was the split boot out of 10? Oh, it was pretty split. Really? Yeah, nine. A nine out of 10? Yeah, nearly all the way around. Drive shaft going in. Get this in. So oh. here's the diff and the gearbox, and it's got to go into the <laughs> hub. Right, filming man. You're going to be doing something now. Okay. Instead of holding your phone. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to stop this hub. Getting going so I just got to do that. There. Yeah, and I'll thread the drive shaft in. Drive shaft is <laughs> in. Now it's going into the hub. Is that correct, Tony? Yeah. So you're not just a cameraman. And then we're going in. <laughs> <laughs> the top suspension arm is connecting up to the 
Oh. But have a look at that gap there. See oh, that? nice. <laughs> That's just spaced out with washers. I feel like I'm watching a live episode of Wheeler Dealers here. Is it Wheeler Dealers? What's the one with Mike Brewer on? You can't mention other people in, in my video. This is my video. All right, sorry. <laughs> Right, Mike, bro. I mean, Tony, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not Tony. No? Dennis. Gavin. Dennis. 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 Sorry. Dennis. Sorry, Thank Dennis. You. Securing the drive shaft to the gearbox with these Allen key bolts. <laughs> now you can get the camera off me and come back when it's done. All oh, right, okay, yeah, okay, right. See you later. Go. Finally, the wheels have been fixed after the curbing of the concierge. Still haven't been paid for it yet, though, but wheel mania of... Uh, sorted out doing the, the wheels, so fully refurbed. And we've gone for Michelin's, not Pirelli's, because they were terrible. But good news for the Aston. We're putting the original wheels back on with the original tyres. Oh! Now I'm gonna start it and see if there's any leaks, any fuel leaks, any oil leaks, because there shouldn't be any now. First time. gone on the exhaust when you took the cover you know, off. like when we tipped it that side yeah into the exhaust and it set on fire same as on this side <laughs> <laughs> no oil none at all let me see it oh this is bone dry yeah it's bone dry <laughs> i'm filling it up with evian <laughs> <laughs> the road trip funnel makes an appearance again in goes some oil don't spill it this time <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> what's he done put the same again oh, oh. Better get a fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's test it out. Driving well, but he drove well before, so just gotta get the oil temperature up and then we'll see whether we're in the clear. We just took it out for a test drive <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> We've got a problem. <laughs> now there's no brake lights, that's why the horn won't work, is because the brake lights ain't coming on. Now we've got to try and figure out why the brake light ain't working. We've got to check them fuses now. All of them? <laughs> <laughs> the pranks on us. <laughs> this was a terrible idea. It was. Oh no! Oh, what's wrong? They're all good. So if they're all good, what does that mean? It means it's something else. <laughs> <laughs> it was your idea. It was not. It was your idea. <laughs> it was not. None of the fuses down there are broken. So now Tony's down here. <laughs> okay, switch under the brake pedal. Press them. Oh, it's working! Is it on? Yeah, it's working! It's a switch then. Oh, so that wasn't anything we did. <laughs> so what do we need to do? Get a new brake light switch. <laughs> How much do you think a brake light switch is? I don't know, but it's coming out your way. <laughs> it's not, it's not. <laughs> What's broken? The brake light switch. On the pedal? Yeah. That's broke? Yeah. How the hell does that break? No idea. Do you know, I think, do you know what it is? There always has to be something broke on the car. Right. You can't, you, you've got to have, like, and it's, it, with an Italian, I think with any Lamborghini, there always has to be something broke. We have to compromise. We've got no oil leak, but we've got no brake lights. Yeah, that's, so that's a compromise. I th no, I think, we, I think we need brake lights, but right. as long as when you fix that, we break something else, just on purpose. <laughs> Like, do you know, like, if we just have one side light bulb out, I think it'll be happy or something. <laughs> <laughs> it will never be fixed. And if it does ever get fixed, don't drive it. How, how could it have broken? <laughs> Literally, I'm telling totally, you, how could it have broken? <laughs> how could it have broken? I've got no idea. Matt might know the answer. <laughs> what, what happened? Did you break it? No, no, no. Oh, were you stamping on the brake? No, 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 no. Oh. Take this trim off and under the bonnet. Under there. Why is there a horn there? <laughs> what is that? I don't know why there's a horn. Do with me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's why it's broke. The brake switch. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the brake switch don't sell twelve volts, as I found out when I did this to Chris. <laughs> Should we see how much a brake switch is? <laughs> how, how much did this cost? <laughs> brake light switch manual thirty three forty seven. Oh, that's not too bad. I wonder what else is broke from doing that. <laughs> Thirty-five pound later, money out of Matt's wages, <laughs> and we're it in. <laughs> Are the lights on? 
Have a look. Let me see. Yep, lights are on. Oh. Yep. Oh. Yes. Can we agree not to prank Matt again? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we learned that lesson. <laughs> it seems all good. All that's left to do is clean it back up, put all the engine covers back on, and PPF the car. We brought the Mercialago and myself to a Drive Tribe event where actually Richard Hammond's gonna walk around the car and inspect it for himself. We all know that he's got the smallest car game, which restores pretty old classic cars, but I don't know how he's gonna think about my Mercialago, the one that I've restored in a shed in Leicester. So let's see how it goes. Maybe you like the wheels actually. I think I do. <laughs> They're extraordinary. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's very green. It is quite green, Yeah. but green cars are the way forwards. Okay. So I didn't put you as a Lamborghini man. I feel like you're more of a Porsche guy. Um. <laughs> I, actually, no, I am a Lamborghini man for the sense of humour and fun. I love the flamboyance. Okay, I love the, yeah. It's exactly why I like them. It's because where, where Porsche is, well, I told you before, when we used to do, we'd have a triple test on yeah. the old show. So we'd have a Lamborghini, a Ferrari and a Porsche lined up to test. We'd maybe have them for a week. Yeah. And they'd deliver them. The Ferrari would arrive, and it, it, it never had much in common with the Ferrari you'd actually buy, as far as I could work out. <laughs> well, it seemed like it. Then Lamborghini would turn up, hi, and I'd say, so how many horsepower has it got? How many horsepower has the Ferrari got? <laughs> it's got 500. It has 525. <laughs> <Just me. laughs> Porsche would then say, right, there's your car. Um, what, is that it? Yeah, fine, we'll pick it up in a week. And it'll always be slightly faster, slightly lighter. Yeah. Slightly See, I've got to agree with him on the, on the Porsche side because we, I do love them, but... But the fun and flamboyance, there's a Countach here in there, obviously, of course there is. Yeah. And uh, I was the archetypal, yeah, kid, bedroom wall, post with the Countach, you had to have one. Yeah, yeah. I'm in mean, the rubbish. <laughs> but they're breathtaking. I'm, I'm, I'm glad Lamborghinis exist and your job, if you're lucky enough to own one, is to drive it around and treat all the rest of us to some pantomime. <laughs> There's your pantomime. That's exactly Look. what that's exactly what this does. Um, but if you saw the state that this was in when we first got it, it was absolutely terrible. Like they were, we've done everything: engine rebuild, interiors done. We we did literally everything. Um, and there was a few things that we found as well, which weren't actually from a Lamborghini. And I don't know if you'd notice them as well because we found. A lot of the things when we've been rebuilding the car, we've had to find cheaper ways of rebuilding it, finding different parts because they're so hard to find for a Mercial Argo. Uh, for example, these uh, front side repeaters here are actually off a Ford Focus. I was, was going to see if I could guess. I wouldn't have guessed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Does Lamborghini have a long history of that? And any small volume manufacturer? The thing is, what baffled us is that the indicators from Lamborghini were a fortune, about three hundred pound, but. Yeah. I think these were. Oh wait a minute, they're inset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're actually they're actually inset, but on the Ford Focus Mark One, they're like I think they were like the other way round. But that is so. That is the same part. That is exactly because the same part. Yeah, we bought a one because we changed them from amber to clear. But I just bought Ford Focus Mark One indicators. The moment when you spotted that they would fit. <laughs> How pleased were you? Oh, it was. It, I only noticed it when I was cleaning the car. I was cleaning the car, and there was a Ford logo stamped on the on the indicator, <laughs> and I was like, "No way!" No. So that was that was one thing. How tight is that? Yeah. This is really tight. Yeah, we actually was gonna. We've been around the Nurburgring with it, yes. and. Uh, around the carousel it's really tight the brakes are terrible did you think i wouldn't like this i did yeah yeah this is quite interesting actually because first thing hammond said when he's seen the car is that he loves the wheels i love them they're tactile they're yeah. um they feel made yes they they're not cheap <laughs> they're not cheap no, but they are they are special i love those and, and i think it just makes it stand out a little bit differently oh it puts my it own <laughs> it's a bright green lamborghini you yeah, that's true, that's oh true. yeah because otherwise I wouldn't have noticed it. It's only the wheels that drew my attention, the massive green Lambo as I approached. Another thing we found out, the headlights were really foggy on the inside and we wanted to restore them. <laughs> old Ducatis, yeah. old Lambos, they're just what Everything. they do. Yeah. And uh, so we tried to split them open. Then we realized the lenses were glass and uh, me with a screwdriver and a, and a bit of heat started to break the glass. Oh yeah. dear. It was yeah. only 10,000 pound per headlight from Lamborghini. Holy yeah. Ah, and you had to. No, no, no. Now we have. Exactly now we have three hundred pound plastic oh, nice. lights. Which is a much better idea because when it breaks, 
That's it. I mean, it turns out they're, to be exactly the same. They're from Poland and uh, yeah, they make them for the race cars. So the same as a rear quarter light and a Morris Marine. <laughs> <laughs> it could well be. It could well be. And if it was glass, that could have saved us a lot of money. What have you got on your steering wheel? I, I don't know. So I, somebody's put that there. <laughs> <laughs> steering wheel wearing a head. Yeah, it looks like it's working in a bakery. I don't know why that's on there, to be <laughs> fair. It looks like it's going to serve me a pasty that it's just made and didn't want to get hairy. Now I'm getting rinsed for it. Oh, on my steering wheel. You've got a on your steering wheel, you fool. <laughs> and about the steering wheel, it's actually off a different car as well. And you might notice it, maybe. It's off a Japanese car. Oh, I don't know. No, I don't know. It's actually from an Evo. Oh, a it? Mitsubishi Evo steering wheel. The only thing that's different is the airbag. Well, this is not from a, like a oh. micro or something. I mean, it's just something <laughs> fairly cool. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of cool, it's, I guess. It's going to come from something Japanese. It's something hot and Japanese. Is it a Mercial Argo car that you'd... Drive is it something that like you'd enjoy? Or is it a la another Lamborghini, one of your choice, other choices? It's, it's not on every day, but look at step back and have a look at it. And then we'll look at everybody else is looking at it as well. It's that that is a crowd pleaser. I've always wanted a Mercial Argo. Never thought I'd ever own one, and then um, to get it like cheaper than what the other ones were and to rebuild it. Now I know the inside out of it. I still love it. Matt, my filmer. He now goes, now I know how Lamborghinis are made. I don't really like them. <laughs> this is a terrible car. Yeah. <laughs> now we look at this rebuilt engine. Yes, so the engine isn't the prettiest of uh, engines. And we keep having small issues with it, as you do with uh, Lamborghinis. Um, with anything, I don't know, Italian and complicated? That's come up. Yeah, so the Love. interior was fully green. Green leather, green seats green dashboard it's every almost as though it was bought by a lamborghini buyer yeah he, oh yeah it was any box that said green he ticked it because that was it everything right. so we kind of dumbed down the green a little bit it's nice and went with alcantara the aircon controls this yeah um we found out this was out of a rover 25 <gasps> But it's also used in a Pagani, was it Herrera? Herrera? Huara. 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 That's Huara. it. Exactly yeah. the same. Really? Uh, yeah. And 15 euros off eBay for one of these. But from Lamborghini, it's around three and a half thousand pounds. Some point on Drive Tribe, we've got to do a pull together of all those least glamorous things in most glamorous <laughs> yeah, things. Because we all know about you know, door mirrors and bits and pieces, but things like that. That oh, suddenly God. sounds a little less cool, but I quite like the fun. Yeah, that's it. You don't you don't really find out these things until you're desperate to find them, and you're like, we've got to find somewhere. I'm not spending this much money on an aircon unit or something like that. And we found so many things with it, but crap things in cool cars. That's what we're going to call it. Crap things in cool cars is coming your way soon. And now we have as well. Um, yeah, not on the bloody stuff. <laughs> I don't know why. It's there. But. Also, probably the lowest mileage Lamborghini you'll ever see with only 3,500 miles. Definitely legitimate. No. <laughs> the, the definitely... If you just said legitimate, I'd have thought, yeah. But the slightly pleading look, definitely legitimate. <laughs> really? So we had to replace the clocks because somebody, the previous owner, decided to jump start the car with a battery terminals the wrong way round and uh, it fried the clocks so we had to buy new clocks and that was a whole other ordeal but now we can't get the mileage to go back to how it was so now it's 3,500 legitimate it miles. What should it be? I think around we, the last MOT was 77,000 miles. Holy hell! Yeah. Really? Yeah. So I'd be quite proud of that. It's yeah, amazing. So Any it, supercar. That's, that's cool. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's done some mileage and it's been mainly track mileage. That's where we got it from, like an ex track experience yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. So it's been easy life, been oh, yeah. treasured and looked after. Ruined. <laughs> Let's have a look at this lump. So it comes up very aggressively. <laughs> Oh, wait, I just noticed something there. That's slightly disappointing. This is not very well damped, is it? My, my damping system fell off. There's a rattle on it as well. All Australian engine, so, dunk rattle. I don't know if you've noticed, but these hydraulic uh, things aren't off this car. Are they for lifting the car? They're obviously... <laughs> they, yeah, I don't know where they came from. But in the body shop, They're it. when they cooked it, they, they just they stopped working, so we nicked them off like a Passat oh, yeah. or something. Here's the engine. Yes, I can see that. It's... Um, a V12, as you would know, and every single thing we've done to it, and the nightmare we've had on building it was unreal. It's not the prettiest of things, but I don't think it ever really was. There's not really any cable management anywhere. It's just 
there. Is there anything unusual in the build of it, or is it just fiddly? Um, I mean, so, the throttle bodies, uh, over £1,100 each, which we didn't have, and second hand, they're £1,100. From Lamborghini, we couldn't even get them. They're actually off a of Volvo... Um, V70. V70, that was it. It's entirely glamorous sounding, isn't no, it? No, no. Volvo V70 throttle bodies, uh, we found that. We found a bunch of other crazy stuff with the engine that we've had to do. I'm surprised it actually runs, but it's done really well. Like, it's done really well. It always has a problem, we found out. It, but if you fix all the problems, it doesn't like that. So you have to have it with one problem. Maximum confidence in your work. I'm surprised it runs. Yeah. Says the man <laughs> who built it. Yeah. Starting it was an ordeal, wasn't it? Yeah. So we had a subscriber start the car. And uh, oh, it sounded like a Lamborghini tractor when we started. It was cranking, 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 but eventually it went a lot of smoke and uh, it did eventually go. But an amazing engine. As always, I've got to say, I congratulate you on once again straightening out something that was beyond hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you have the, joy, the joy of doing a car like this, it's a treat for anybody who sees it. Yeah. It's what? It's Sunday morning. It's a nice, clear Sunday morning. You see and hear this howling. Oh, yeah. Or parked by the side of the road in the cloud steam. Um, you still, your day is my, my day as a spectator, as Johnny Punter wandering past, my day has been improved. So it's, you, <laughs> exactly. You know, all these people you've done a favour for. See, their day has been brightened by the presence of this preposterous green thing. Every time I see it, it's brightened. Yeah. I mean, until, it, until it breaks down. But. Yeah, yeah, but you see, that, that's also quite good for all of us. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's bad for you, but again, you're doing you're doing the world a favour by driving around in a pantomime. <laughs> That's it. Well, I'm glad you like it, I because like it. I didn't think you'd be a Lamborghini man at all. Thought I like you. I admire the sense of fun, yeah. fun theatre pantomime, because the, that end of the car world I enjoy as much as the next person. Do you own a supercar? No, no, no. I don't. I, at the last, I had, uh, I had a Lamborghini Garda Spider. Nice. But I was driving it through Ross, where I live, about six months after I'd bought it with the roof down, and I suddenly thought, I feel like a real knob. Yeah. I, li I just could see that was you all the time. Yeah. There's no way you're driving an Lamborghini or anything I like can't, that. I just can't do it. I have, I have, and that's the only sort of mid-engine super-ish that's not really a supercar I've ever had. I, I do get the... Like when I'm driving, and I'm like, why are people looking at me? Like I just want to drive from A to B, Basically but it hopes. <laughs> yes, that's what that it is. is. It. It's not the Lambo. That's I what messed it, it up the whole time. It's the holes in my ears. Oh yeah. <laughs> that... 911. Nobody looks at the great 911. So yeah, just... I can. I can respect. We really want another Porsche. We did yeah. a GT3. It was the best thing yeah. I've ever driven. Like so refined. But we bought it in America and we had to sell it over there. But. If we ever find another one, and then that'll be our next project. This is the moment where it gets embarrassing. It doesn't start, isn't it? <laughs> Are you gonna fire it up? Okay, it we're... I will not. Check it in neutral. Neutral, of course. Manual. We didn't even we didn't even say anything about the manual. Yes, it is a matter. I did notice the gate. First time. Perfect. Perfect. It has a little mind of its own, but I think that's the, the Volvo throttle bodies. Um, you'll notice it has a bit of a rev, then a bit of a hunt, then but... And then it lets go and there's oil on the floor. <laughs> yeah, sounds quite smooth. It sounds like it should. At least we've heard it running now. And there's proof that we actually rebuilt an engine and it runs. Clear, it's not running. That's just a soundtrack and they've got somebody with a vape behind it. <laughs> it's not running. That's just, he's playing that in off the speaker over there. <laughs> But this is what we're talking about with the uh, yeah, it's a bit of a play, isn't it? Has it? A bit of a hunt, Hunting, yeah, until isn't it? it gets warm. Um, I'm gonna put that down I need to more old fuel, age. I need less fuel, I need yeah. more fuel. No, too much fuel. That's it. I feel sick. No, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I won't rev it because it's really cold. <laughs> I don't fancy picking up bearings, but no, no, expensive. I'm glad you like it, Hammond. Right. And uh, oh, it's a pleasure to see you, and as always, good luck with your next project. But well done on this one, it's doing the world a favor. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>